reflections that are celebrating um, the work of our colleague and our mentor. Now this event uh, would not have been possible um, without the generous support of Dean Fritz Steiner um, and Chair Winka Dubeldam, as well as a large number of staff members from IT um, who are with us today uh, from building facilities and of course the architectural archives where we had our little reception last night. I also wanna thank our PhD students Bo and Sharan and Rami, who have helped us um, keep this uh, on track with their uh, magic. Um, we're, and we're very much looking forward to our talk this morning um, with uh, Billy Tsen. I do want to um, just offer a little bit of a really brief sort of reminder of some of the thoughts um, that were shared with us yesterday during our talks. You remember um, Juan Manuel walked us through a, a pretty incredible uh, narrative of the early years of the Essex School and HOMA reminded us of the impact of these teachings on uh, the practice of design. We were um, graced with the participation of Joseph Rickbert, and then we were um, able to begin to think through readings and interpretations from former students, including Ezra Shaheen Aburat, Jin Baik, Catherine Bonnier, Daniel Friedman, and their work interpreted by our respondent, Alberto Perez Gomez. Thereafter, we were able to hear from colleagues and co-authors of David's, John Dixon Hunt, Grace Law, Richard Wesley, Morrison Mostafavi, and Sophia uh, von Ulrich Hussen and Maurizio Pezzo. Um, and of course, our two keynotes uh, from Marion Wise and James Corner. Now we're anxious to share with you today's program. Um, however, before doing so, we have a little gift, uh, which is uh, that there are some who were not able to be with us physically in this space, who have sent us their greetings, um, colleagues and students who wanted to make sure that they could share um, the special event with David. So I will now do the, oh, there we go. David, among the memorable things that I've learned from you or tried to learn from you is a... David, among the memorable things that... I've... David, among the memorable things that I've learned from you or tried to learn from you is a habit of first describing architecture and landscape prior to analyzing or interpreting it. And this requires a kind of close attention to what's in front of you, uh, uh, the visible or occasionally the invisible. Uh, thanks for this and countless other uh, forms of knowledge and support. Greetings, David. This is John Follin, joining you from the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm currently Department Head of Architecture and Professor. I'm sorry that I can't be with you to engage in the dialogue today, 
but wanted to send this brief note of gratitude for all the conversations that we had while I was your student at Penn. From Ernst to ethics, to materials, weathering, and on to single rooms in the Great Plains. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Ron Henderson, Professor and Director of the Landscape Architecture and Urbanism Program at Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, I'm a 1995 graduate of both um, the Master of Architecture and the Master of Landscape Architecture programs um, at Penn. When I decided to go back to graduate school, I wanted the opportunity to learn both disciplines, architecture and landscape architecture. Very few universities at that time would even entertain a discussion of doing something like that. Uh, David Leatherbarrow um, and his colleague, Ann Spurn in the Landscape Architecture Program uh, were open to this discussion and in fact, um, allowed me to enter into the uh, both programs uh, concurrently. Of course, at this time, David was writing about topical theory, uh, topography and other um, uh, theoretical frameworks that translated easily between architecture and landscape architecture. And of course, was writing about cities as well as hosting uh, Professor Glenn Merkett in the landscape architecture program. So the, the fluidity and the simpatico um, between David and Anne uh, established uh, um, kind of framework for someone like me to uh, entertain this, this proposition of two degrees. Um, of course, as we look at Penn and other universities now, um, including my own at Illinois Institute of Technology, where we've just inaugurated a dual MLA MR program, um, this uh, combination of degrees has become uh, more and more common. Um, Dave and Ann were pioneers working with me um, in order to understand the uh, potentials for a career like mine to be as rewarding as it has been. I'm forever grateful. Dear David and colleagues, hello from Tel Aviv. First, I want to, I regret not being able to join you uh, at UPenn for these exciting two days. I wanted to share, David, how much I'm grateful for the years I've spent learning and growing under you at UPenn and for your ongoing mentorship. Uh, these were not always years of characterized by smooth intellectual understanding, but certainly by rich and challenging uh, debate between ideas and approaches. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, David, for what I find is a sort of intellectual resistance or insistence uh, to ground and uh, center our architectural our discussion and understanding within the premises of the architecture and design discipline and profession, and for claiming uh, the expansion of our fields of knowledge uh, relative to our own, to its own challenges, to its own sensibilities, uh, to its own perspectives. Uh, thank you very much, David, for this and for much more. And I wish you all great days uh, of discussions at Penn, hoping to see you soon in person. Thank you. Thank you. Their practice is committed to reflecting the values of nonprofit, cultural, and academic institutions toward an architecture of enduring vision. Some of their notable projects include the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, uh, the Lefrac Center in Prospect Park, the US Embassy in Mexico City, and the Obama Presidential Center in Chicago. Their dedication to this work has been recognized by numerous citations, including the National Medal of Arts from President Obama, the 2019 Premium Imperiale in Architecture, 
and the 2013 AIA Architecture Firm Award. And in parallel with her practice, Billy currently teaches at Yale University as the Charles Grafby Professor in Practice and was recently appointed by President Biden, well, I guess, right in the uh, future, to the US Commission of Fine Arts, serving as the first Asian American and woman to be chair. As both an educator and practitioner, she is deeply committed to making a better world through architecture. We are honored to have Billy with us today. Thank you, Billy. Um, I feel uh, really grateful, Franca, that you asked me. And at the same time, I feel really inadequate <laughs> because of uh, the great erudition that David has always had and has always been so generous with. Um, so the title of uh, my lecture or whatever it's called, Fest Shrift, Love, Love Boat Thing, is The Wandering Eye. Well, this is about you, David. After I sent in the title, I realized that it either made you sound as if you were a philanderer or <laughs> as if you were confused. Obviously, I meant neither. Perhaps a more accurate title would be peripheral vision or out of the corner of your eye. First, a little <clears throat> ophthalmology primer. Our vision happens because we have a combination of two types of receptors, cone cells and rod cells in our retinas. Cone cells detect color and detail and are most dense in the center of your retina and require the most light. Rod cells are more sensitive than cones because they allow us to see in the dark. The rim of your retina contains the largest concentration of cones. Thus, peripheral vision will let you see things that you cannot see when you're looking straight ahead particularly when conditions are dark. So astronomers use a technique called averted vision, which involves not directly looking at the object, but looking a little off to the side while continuing to concentrate on the subject. So what does this mean in relation to David Leatherbarrow? David never looks at architecture straight on. He looks with averted vision at the phenomena that surrounds, shapes, and animates architecture. We don't make buildings to make architecture. We make buildings for people, places where lives are lived, where experience happens, and where time happens. So I've always adored David's references to art, poetry, and fiction. He is telling us that architects, as architects, we are part of a larger world and that we need to pay attention. So his book, Building Time, um, starts with Emily Dickinson. Forever is composed of nows, tis not a different time. And he spends a chapter in his book describing this painting, whoops, going backwards here. this painting um, called The Balcony Room by Adolf Menzel. And he powerfully illuminates the concept of time in architecture. When citing a critic, he speaks about the billowing gentle curtain as an implied and transient moment. That is almost heartbreaking in its evanescence. A puff, a burst of air that brings the presence of the outside to disturb the stillness of the room. That is life animating the inanimate. And witness to this breath are adjacent to this curtain, which you can see blowing in the wind, are the two chairs the carpet and the sofa, and the mirror, which in its reflection suggests a larger human life just out of, out of sight. 
He talks about a patch of paint on the wall that appears lighter and suggests that it is reflected light bouncing off the surface of a window or, or some other surface, noting that it is caught in the painting, but like the burst of wind, it will move and shift and disappear as the day progresses. So since David talks about paintings, I wanted to talk about two of my favorite paintings. Um, the first one is by Vittorio, Vittorio Cap, uh, Carpaccio. Um, and he is uh, a Northern Italian, primarily Venetian painter. This is um, St. Augustine in his study. Here, unlike the balcony work, there is an inhabitant, St. Augustine, sitting at his desk. Carpaccio paints him surrounded by the objects that describe his character. We have the books, we have the astrolabe that show that he's a scholar and a scientist. And there's the little white dog that shows he's a humanist. Unlike Menzel, where the room is a container of time, Carpaccio makes the room a container of life, fully lived, a biography. So St. Augustine sits at his desk, supposedly in the act of writing to St. Jerome. But what has happened? He's not writing, he's staring out the window because what he is seeing is a vision of the death of St. Jerome. With his intense gaze, we are taken to a place outside the study. And here, unlike with Menzel, the energy is flowing from inside to outside. The second, many of you, most of you, I would think know this book, Good Night Moon by Charlotte Wise Brown and the illustrator Clement Hurd. I have always had the secret belief that Hurd was looking at Carpaccio when he drew the bunny's room. Heard actually went to architecture school at Yale, so it's not completely impossible. So in the room, like in St. Augustine's study, are the objects which describe the bunny, the kittens, the mittens, the house, the mouse, the brush, the mush, and the little old lady whispering hush. But in this case, it is time which is entering the room. Time changes the room, the objects, and finally the occupants. Gradually the sun withdraws, the moon rises until finally it is dark and the bunny is asleep. So, I will end uh, this short love letter to David with some images from a project we are working on. Um, in this case, what we're trying to do is capture something ephemeral. So we are in the midst of um, redoing all of the public spaces at Philharmonic Hall. It's now David Geffen Hall, used to be Avery Fisher. And it has always been a, a space that has felt quite uh, cool and corporate. So there's a, a lot of travertine, um, a lot of terrazzo, all of it beige. And um, when we were asked to redo the space, we thought about drama and hidden drama, because when you go into an auditorium, it is in the end, not something that you see, but it's invisible, but it's hugely dramatic as the people as the orchestra starts to play. Which brings me to my favorite building, which is the backside of the Pantheon. So of course the Pantheon has its very powerful front portico, but I've always really admired the backside because it is a kind of hidden side because it is much more about the interior than it is about the exterior. And then the very iconic image of that oculus, which has captured 
I know uh, both our memory and our imaginations and continues to do so as it has for people, not most of them, not architects across the ages. So there is um, a very important um, <clears throat> observation, uh, celebration that happens, um, which is Pentecost. And so it's a little hard to see, but here you see that there are saints and above their heads are small flames. And this is the sort of knowledge that's entering into their um, consciousness, these flames of Pentecost. And so for any of you who have ever been uh, in Rome and managed to squeeze yourself into the Pantheon during Pentecost, the most amazing thing happens. You're standing there, the surface is really long, you're standing and standing and standing, and it's really tiresome. And then all of a sudden, the first petal starts to drop. And what happens is the firemen of Rome stand around outside the oculus and throw in rose petals. And the rose petals come floating down in this most amazing way. They become an incredible um, shower of roses. And as the roses are coming down, they fall to the floor and then people in the end start to walk over them. So there's this amazing smell of roses. So this one was a video that showed the roses falling, but at the moment it's not, but you can imagine it, it's truly spectacular. Oh, here it is. It's a little hard to see in this video, but it's a very, very emotional, very powerful moment. So going back to Lincoln Center, um, we tried to think about this idea of capturing something that's impossible to capture. Um, something, one of those you have to be there experiences. And um, we went back to the rose petals falling. So it's, we are now taking what was, I'm gonna go back a little bit, a very light, very beige uh, view. And all of the walls are going to be clad in a very, very dark blue felt, which has roses and the rose petals are huge. And no, nothing is the same, it's not a repeat. So it's changing the entire time. So there's really several thousand linear feet of rose petals. And you can see it close up. The rose petals are much more dense at the top and then they become lighter and lighter as they get down to the bottom, which also has to do with a very practical reason because um, the more, pe more people are at the top, I mean, more people at the bottom, and so it needs to stand up to greater wear. So it's more of the dark blue, whereas at the top, there are fewer people. And the all of the ceiling and the soffits are being painted this dark blue. So you'll sense the sort of waterfall of rose petals. And um, this is a, a kind of mock-up. Uh, well, it's actually not a mock-up, they're making it. So they roll out um, the felt and then they drop on these small pieces of, um, they're called faucets, and then it's all needled, so it holds the felt together. But, uh, and the rose petals also have um, many smaller sizes, so it goes from very large to really quite small petals. Um, and here we are at a meeting at Lincoln Center, sort of talking about the installation. Um, and then, I just end with this, there's several images I just wanted to show, which also make me think of David's work because they're very much about a, a sort of quiet withholding. This is Trisha Brown and she did an entire dance called If You Could See Me and she never turned around. And it was exceptionally powerful and that she was always, um, she was dancing, but in a certain way she was dancing for herself 
and allowing us to view her. This is a, a photograph that Todd and I own by a young photographer named John Edmonds. And once again, it's a kind of sense of withholding um, that there's something secret inside and that it is uh, not, not evident. And I think what David is always telling us to do is look for the not evident, love the not evident, appreciate the not evident. And this final image is um, from an installation that we did of Noguchi lamps. And here we made a series of fiberglass screens and we saw always the lamps through the screens. So it is about trying to catch the ephemera of the light, not looking at it as an object, but understanding it as something which is glowing, something which you can't capture. So in quite loving terms, and ones that for me connect to a lived experience we have all had. David talks of the short-lived short and uncapturable nature of all natural phenomenon, marked and made present by the fixed nature of objects. He has asked us to take notice. He alerts us to an unseen power. He asks us to live not only in our intellects, but in the now. It is the second, the hour, the day, the forever that is composed of nows. Thank you, David. Um, one tries hard to um, articulate perceptions and understanding. Um, it's a very great treat um, to see that um, some sense was conveyed and gave rise to an even clearer formulation of of, of thoughts about architecture. Um, thank you. The fundamental painting strikes one initially as barren and empty. Um, for many years, I was concerned with the correspondences between the patterns of, of our lives and the architectural uh, premises for those lives. And I, one form of self-criticism or one domain uh, of uh, unease with what I had argued was a sense of over-determination that architecture sometimes allows itself, abbreviating if not curtailing what I think is its primary responsibility to give, uh, give one the sense of, of possibilities and of freedom. It's not that I have a preference for emptiness. Uh, it's been over aestheticized, but I do think there is uh, some importance to architecture's capacity to allow things that were unscripted or unforeseen or not yet imagined. And if one could then uh, reduce the articulation and specification to um, preparations for possible and uh, unforeseen enactments, then perhaps that's the limit of the task. So it's, it's true what Billy has explained so beautifully that there is a sense of temporality uh, conveyed by the painting, but maybe the mirror, the chairs, the sofa, partial though they are, uninhabited though it is, 
perhaps there's an indication of dwelling freedom that it could be taken up in this way and who knows what other way. And that was um, my attempt to um, not always name and specify and articulate, but rather um, it's not uh, in praise of minimalism, rather the um, modest and yet powerful serviceability of places such that um, uh, they can be remade through practices that are um, always uh, renewed and by that means contemporary. To index um, the marginal or um, out of the corner of one's eye, it's a sense of what hasn't yet been seen. And, and I think, um, well, Billy said it much clearer than I'm able to, but there is this sense of um, a field of architectural work that means don't do anything. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a practical and intellectual restraint that I think is a measure of one's um, care for the freedom of inhabitation. So that's a little apology for Fomenzo. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I love, we have to do something here, hit it. Ah. Uh, actually, I really love that painting very much. And I, I do think that the, um, one can make great containers and also be doing interesting architecture. So I, do, mm -hmm. so I agree, We're, I'm not talking about empty places, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about the appreciation for those other things that architecture doesn't contribute, that life actually contributes, that the weather contributes, that, mm -hmm. all, you know, that the, the light contributes, that um, I think as, you know, as architects, we unfortunately believe we are so, we can control everything um, and we don't and we can't and we shouldn't. And part of the amazing things that happen in spaces and buildings is when something else enters, which is something you never actually imagined was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And what I like about your writing is, and it's not that you don't confront the topic, but you are always going back to the topic, but from the edges. Mm -hmm. And for me, that makes it a very, very rich um, reading. It's, I have to admit that I'm, I'm a fiction reader and I love stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so your stories take me to a place where I can look at your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so, and not everybody does stories and thoughts. And so the combination of your stories and your thoughts are a very beautiful pathway um, mm -hmm. that leads me deeper into what yeah. you do and what you write. Yeah, I think with good works of art, uh, your buildings um, or paintings by Carpaccio, um, one way to cope with the surplus um, unending uh, richness is to see it equivalent to another work, not, not to explain things, you know, to put an end to it. This is what Carpaccio had in mind. Well, maybe, maybe there's more and maybe that extra um, that doesn't yet have a name still makes sense when seen in an equivalent uh, work, a building or um, piece of music or poem. So for me, um, my uh, work is in architecture. And for many years, I, um, I guess I was basically critical of appropriations, uh, big boys in the other disciplines, philosophy, art history, whatever. Um, maybe they would help little architecture along its way. Uh, I, I gave up on that dream. I think it's dreamt out. On the other hand, the more I 
concentrated on problems and possibilities in works like those of William Shen, it seemed to me that I couldn't, I didn't want to say the final words about it. And therefore the turn to writers, poets especially, but novelists and, and especially painters, maybe uh, there's an evocation of sense in that analogous work, which increases understanding and deepens um, or allows the resonances to have their effect without curtailing uh, the sense. And then it would be something like a family uh, of um, articulations, different modalities of expression that uh, cooperatively um, illuminate some aspect of, 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 of our lives. And that to me has been a method. Um, and I'm not making no apology for a concern for parallel arts. It's just the reverse. I actually think I like to travel, but I also like to come home. And you go to the painting and return, go to the poem and return. It's not that one wants to be a historian of paintings or a critic of poetry. Rather, it's just a, a, an excursion into something um, that for a while, it takes a distance to the built work, but then um, allows it to be seen afresh. Absolutely, yeah. No, I, I, I love the idea of the, of the little excursion and then you come home. It's, that's, uh, yeah. that's something I'll remember, I'll take <laughs> away from this. Yeah. Um, it's also that I think um, it's a way of training one's eyes um, and, and uh, perhaps also one's, one's voice, um, that there are craftsmen in, in the visual and craftspersons in the visual and in the auditory that uh, we can converse with, um, and that we're not inarticulate. And they would then see from, from this domain of work, architecture in its concrete specificity um, uh, that we could reciprocate uh, and contribute something to the understanding of poets. Uh, I think uh, the more one reads, um, I don't know whether it's Haney or Anne Carson in Canada, and now uh, I've just been sort of dedicated to Amanda Gordon's work. There is some sense that they've been sensing streets and gardens and spatial configurations and I, I think that's good. I think that interplay and cooperativity that doesn't disavow difference, but uh, perhaps even strengthens it um, is something that one benefits. So um, I too think that architecture tells stories, but in its own way, um, that fiction and construction are kind of cognate words and that making and making up are not unrelated um, maybe that, that's okay for us. And we don't have to have anxiety about architecture itself. Of course, it is a spatial and inhabitable art. It's not sculpture, it's not painting. And yet it's not not those. There are correlations. I have no more to add to that other than to just <laughs> say my, I have huge admiration and thank you for inviting me. Well, it's a great pleasure to have you. So with that, I'll just direct us to um, uh, return for 11, 15 minutes. We'll start promptly, actually we'll start probably five minutes early. We have a full um, suite of individuals who are going to um, join us. So a little coffee, a little water, and then we'll start promptly at five to 11, so that we can be on time as opposed to yesterday.
Okay, we're going to begin the second morning session uh, entitled Locations and Constructions Today and Tomorrow, Part 2. And we have an amazing round of speakers. I'm going to introduce um, them one by one, uh, all of them students of David and actually good friends of mine. Um, I collaborated with some of them and I've been in classes with also some others. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, the first speaker today is Duffy Half. Uh, Duffy is an architect and an architectural historian and theorist. Her work focuses on typology, public space, craft, and topography, as these issues were manifest in approaches to design in Palestine, Israel, during the British mandate and the first decades of statehood. Her work examines how these disciplinary themes reflected a broader search for a new na national style undertaken by local architects since the 1920s. Duffy holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and an MA from Tel Aviv University School of Philosophy and a BR from Tel Aviv University School of Architecture. She was a research fellow at the Israeli Architectural Archive Scholars Program at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art and a postdoctoral fellow at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology. She established her own architectural practice in Tel Aviv in 2017. And the title of her presentation is A New Materiality of the Ordinary, Palestine, Israel, 1940, 1966. So, Duffy. Good morning. I'd like to thank Franca Trubiano. Um, for organizing this and for inviting me to participate in a beautiful event in honor of a very rare teacher, mentor, and friend, David Leatherbarrow. David had me as a student for many years because my dissertation most likely took the longest time to write in Penn's history. Um, I typically associate its writing to standing at the edge of a cliff staring at the abyss below and having David kind of push me <laughs> to take a brave step forward. Um, but really, David, your generosity, um, your guidance, your support, and the way you made all your students feel that you were genuinely interested in the topics of their research and invested intellectually in their work is what made this journey or fall into the abyss um, possible. And before I share with you some of its findings, I want to wish my dear professor a happy, creative, prolific next stage. And knowing him a little bit, I'm convinced it will be just that. A new materiality in praise of the ordinary. In surface architecture, David Leatherbarrow and Moisen Mostafavi reinstate the facade as a primary instrument of representation in architecture, the platform in and through which buildings speak of their materiality. The term materiality has two senses. The first pertains to the social, economic, cultural, and political um, context in which architecture takes shape. The second involves ways in which construction methods and materials are employed. Leather Barrow's thinking in surface architecture as in several of his other writings, materials matter and practically primitive and architecture oriented otherwise, for example, understands these two senses of materiality as intertwined because the facade represents or represents this double sense of materiality it effectively reflects the value system of the society in which it takes shape. As Leather Barrow has shown, in some cases, buildings also bear a more active role. They exceed mirroring existing conditions or accommodating present needs and become ideational and reformative. 
These ideas have been guiding my research on pre and post state architecture in Israel in which a new materiality emerged. This new materiality in both its senses played an active role in the formation and shaping of a new national ethos. Several architects and planners in the newly founded state of Israel in 1948 expressed this new materiality by developing what they refer to as a new style. It was characterized by restrained formal gestures, abstention from material extravagance, the use and exposure of local materials, an emphasis on the legibility of structure and an appeal to rational building procedures. In 1961, the architect and critic Abba El-Khanani referred, referred to it as being honest. The new style's realist attitude, which advocated um, recognition of present material constraints, resembled arguments surrounding the post-war brutalist project that emerged in England. Leather Barrow's account in facts of building and of life of the Smithson's use of materials at hand in a post-war moment of austerity politics and re-engaged aesthetics, and his study of De La Sota's work and its commitment to an architecture of simplicity in less than perfect standards of construction in post-war Spain in invention and limited means were constructive for my research. In these cases, in Spain, England, and Israel, architects advance their practice as a call to make do with materials at hand in ways that were responsive to notions of imperfection or ordinariness. The new style in Israel responded to pressing material constraints, which were acute in the post-war welfare state and its austerity regime. It was also a product of ideological frameworks from the pre-state period, the foundations of which were cultural as well as disciplinary. It was therefore driven not only by a kind of zachlich approach concerned with economy and efficiency, but also motivated by a notion of zachlichkeit, tied to a cultural attitude um, in which simplicity, modesty, and frugality um, were seminal principles uh, tied to the prospect of nation building. Since many architects who settled in Palestine in the 1920s and 1930s were European emigres, there was a transference of the ideas that they had absorbed in their architectural training in European universities. In the interwar period in Europe, architectural themes partly responded to the economic and urban crisis that um, followed the First World War. Several modern architects backed by government intervention policies for social housing emphasized the need to rationalize construction and developed programs for minimal subsistence living. Their efforts were linked to an earlier rejection of 19th century revivalist styles and to an advocacy of an architecture that conformed to practical demands as well as to its materials and construction methods. In several instances, this approach had cultural underpinnings that were tied to notions of simplicity and frugality. Examples are found in the work of Ernst May in Frankfurt and his contribution to the concept of existence minimum, which was likewise advanced through the studies by Alexander Klein, who immigrated to Palestine in the mid 1930s, held a teaching position at the Technion and designed several residential neighborhoods in the Haifa Baylands, including the master plan for the new Technion campus on Mount Carmel. Ideas about simplicity and frugality in architecture recurred after the Second World War as well. Leather Barrow and Wesley's writing on pre-modern monastic culture and its influence on the Courbusier's post-war work in Three Cultural Ecologies and in Leather Barrow's Le Courbusier, a Modern Monk, guided my studies on frugality and renunciation. As Leather Barrow has shown, Le Courbusier's Cabanon, which he had built for himself and his wife in the south of France in 1951, was a modern case of a secular ascetic architecture. Measuring only 3.6 meters square, it accommodated living, sleeping, and working in a decidedly frugal manner. In addition to this disciplinary background, the, culture, the cultural foundation of labor Zionism played a part in shaping architectural discourse. 
Its proponents advocated a culture of modesty and frugality tied to a pioneering program of physical labor as this prospect of a socialist national utopia. Studies in social history of Israel have shown that the principles of this frugality evolved from objective scarcity, but this was not exclusively responsible for the culture of frugality, which had become a value in and of itself. Even the non-left-wing sects and the later immigrants of the 1930s who espoused a liberal economy and maintained a bourgeois lifestyle in the cities abided by the culture of frugality, which later became a status symbol of restraint and good taste. In the 1930s and 40s, an emphasis on progressive, purpose-oriented architecture divested of superfluities and excess was propagated by the parastate institutions, some of which were directly responsible for planning and construction. One of these was the organization of trade unions that took it upon itself to oversee all areas of constructive activity in the workers' movement in Palestine. Its publication, 20 Years of Building, Workers' Settlements, Housing, and Public Institutions, discussed the, frit the fitting representation of modesty that followed the organization's building exhibition in 1940. One of the contributors, the civil engineer Markus Reiner, trained in Vienna, made an argument with a strain of Lossian and Kraussian sarcasm in support of architectural propriety, meaning that a building's appearance should be appropriate to its social stature. Upholding a Sachlichkeit approach, he rejected the inappropriate use of materials in residential buildings in Tel Aviv, addressed the overindulgence of private homeowners, contrary to the dilapidated conditions of the city's public buildings, its synagogues, main theater, and city hall. Reiner emphasized the virtues of simplicity and was not solely concerned with the narrow economic irrationality of cost-intensive building. He made a metaphorical appeal to former immigrants' tents and huts, communicating a Zachlichkeit with a social and cultural view, according to which the appropriate architecture for the new society in Palestine would be attainable through ordinary means. The notion of architectural superficiality arose, manifest in a building's outer surface. Instead of using lavish materials, and I quote Reiner, adorning exterior walls for vain display, beauty was to be found in what he called organic building, a term he attributed to a building's proportions. This point is revealing as apportioning or taking appropriate measure is what you do when resources are scarce. Leather Barrow shows that the idea of sharing, equivalent, equivalent to apportioning, was key to monastic societies and consequently shaped the disposition of the architectural layout, which was arranged around the shared space of the cloister, the binding element of the composition that structured its shared community life. When Reinel criticized the superficiality of the surface, or what Leather Barrow has accordingly coined surficiality, he was not necessarily addressing its deviation from a legibly rationalized structural or constructional scheme, or as Leather Barrow has claimed regarding the Los House in Vienna, and I quote, accent on materials and methods of construction distorted the actual issues at work in the making of the building's facade. For Reiner, for Los, the building's cultural context, materiality in the first sense, or what Leather Barrow termed its situational performance, must have equal bearing on the facade if superficiality is to be avoided. In the same trade union's publication, the architect Arie Charot made similar remarks regarding surface superficiality. Reiner's concept of proportioning tied to apportioning and scarcity was reflected in Charon's use of the term equilibrium. Internal proportions, he wrote, mean a total equilibrium among the building's different parts, a lack of snobbish conduct or desire to dazzle the viewer with luxurious cladding 
behind which one finds a dilapidated structure. Sharon repeatedly used the term modesty throughout his text, a word that it is related to the moderate. Both derive from the, from the Latin modus, which also carries with it a sense of measure, mode, and manner. The idea of modesty is connected to the right measure and proportioning implies an equilibrium among parts of a whole, either a building or a community. In Hebrew, the notion of modesty and measure, tsni'ut, denotes a lack of arrogance, yet its root, tsena, entails a frugal lifestyle and also austerity politics and rationing policies. Sharon applied the idea of architectural modesty to building materials, maintaining that the local arch that local architects had to had, had typically be aligned were typically aligned with modern European architectural precepts, and had therefore employed smooth tout finishes, whitewashing buildings from top to bottom. He suggested a new approach in which building materials would remain would remain exposed and employed according to geographical location. He linked modesty to materiality, arguing for an architecture that expresses the connection, and I quote, to the ground on which it stands. The idea of modesty is here tied to a call to be grounded. Beside its literal meaning, being grounded meant quite plainly to be responsive to reality. As Leatherbarrow has maintained in Practically Primitive, the first dimension of a building was not pure materiality, the so-called nature of materials, but the milieu or topography in which those materials make, them, make themselves manifest. Materiality in the second sense was therefore inevitably engaged with materiality in the first sense. This notion of being grounded in reality was imposed when the Israeli government initiated a rationing policy in 1949. In his text titled Planning Housing Operations, Tel Aviv city engineer Yaakov Ben Sira contended that it was, I quote, a political necessity to lower the standard of living and learn to make do with the constraints of economic scarcity, urging architects to employ local materials, reduce manpower, use ready-made elements and rationalize construction. I quote him, if, he remove, if we remove all illusions and clearly see the means available to us, we have no other way but to declare a new style, the alignments of which are simplicity and austerity. Ben Sira's appeal to a new style which makes do with what is demonstrates concern for present conditions a material directness and immediacy sought to reveal the way materials actually appeared. A plea to use local materials produced in Israel was the result of rationing policies, but also reflected the aim of bolstering national pride and concrete, owing much to the fact that its constituent components were present in Israel, became the country's foremost building material. Although the new style entailed the rationalization of construction and made use of mass produced components and readily available so-called ordinary materials, lending its historiographic characterization as a gray modernism, some of its proponents did not compromise attention to detail and finish and incorporated a certain level of craftsmanship in their work, as was the case in Dov Karmi's projects during these years. Carmi was born in Odessa in 1905, and he immigrated to Palestine in 1921. He first studied painting at the Betzalel Academy in Jerusalem, and between the years 1925 and 1930, completed his architectural and engineering studies in Belgium at the Special School of Civil Engineering and Arts and Manufactures annexed to the University of Ghent. This point is revealing because Belgium was very much under the spell of Victor Hota, and the idea of craft as inherent to the architect's métier. Carmi's building research station at the Technion uh, embodied the, the, these tenets of this new style. The building has a concrete columnar structure evident on its exterior facade, 
with exposed concrete block infill that recedes slightly inward, accentuating the two construction systems. Where glass infill replaced the concrete blocks, the structural frame remained visibly coherent. The walls in the building received a variety of finishes. Concrete blocks were whitewash or left exposed. A different kind of handling was applied to exposed concrete cast in polished wood formwork. Although technically the same material, the specific process of its construction and handling resulted in a more refined finish. Carmi also maintained the traces of the formwork imprinted from the horizontal wooden boards, which recall, of course, Le Courbusier's internationally published post-war projects and his fascination with the concrete's potential recording of its fabrication, including all its imperfections. In other contemporaneous projects, such as the Mann Auditorium in Tel Aviv and the Weiss Auditorium in Jerusalem, Carmi used poured in situ concrete and then applied different bush hammering techniques to reveal the aggregates and give a completely different um, texture to the material. The aesthetic of building revealed different opportunities within this new materiality, unfolding not through myriad materials, but through different finishes of the same ordinary materials at hand. The principle of suitability is introduced here in which different finishes are fitting for different places. At the old Singalovsky school, Carmi used a similar material palette to achieve structural clarity. The building again had a legible concrete columnar structure with exposed concrete block infill, prefabricated adjustable vertical sunbreakers, protected openings to the rear. The facade was highly articulated with load-bearing elements distinguished from infill components and fixed parts differentiated from adjustable devices. The building rationally and methodically communicated its structure, the process of its construction, and its adaptability to the natural environment. The treatment of the material and exposed structure was also registered in the stair tower, which was separated from the building. All concrete components were left exposed and meant to be seen as such. Simplicity and frugality were put on show. These elemental modular buildings conveyed a sense of the ordinary in a decidedly rational manner. But though ready-made or readily available materials constituted many of the building's components, the architects did not reduce the creative process to a series of technical procedures, nor did they compromise design practices that involved the crafts of detailing and material finishes. These aesthetic issues reflected ideas on simplicity, propriety, and the community's interpretation of its particular regional and temporal circumstances, where opportunities were understood to spring from limitations. These ideas resurfaced in the mid 60s in a vehement debate on banality in architecture among artists, writers, and publicists, instigated by the architectural critic Abba El Hanani. His seminal piece, titled On the Importance of Ordinariness in Architecture, was essentially a swan song to the new style brutalist architecture of simplicity and austerity in Israel. His main thesis, titled in praise of ordinariness, echoed Reiner and Loss on the literal and symbolic concept of proportioning and measure. He also quoted Alexander Klein, his professor at the Technion, who had argued that a house in a street is akin to a tree in a forest. It must contribute, contribute to the overall image of the forest without standing out or being out of the ordinary. And finally, El Hanani praised the so-called ordinary architects who do not have their self-perpetuation in mind, do not seek to construct extraordinary buildings that are not truly involved in their milieu or attuned to what Leather Barrow termed their situational performance, but try to stand out. A cultural and disciplinary appeal to ordinary buildings which would participate collectively in the public domain, the beauty of which was not compromised, but in fact enhanced by the ordinariness of its parts, 
corresponded to the idea of a balanced, civic, and civilized collective community. El Hanani tried to steer architects away from the glorification, to steer architecture away from the glorification of its author and preserve some of the moral imperatives of the new style at a moment when principles of restraint, frugality, and the ordinary assumed a pejorative meaning and an entirely um, different materiality emerged. Thank you. Our next speaker will join us via Zoom, um, and it's Peter Lawrence. Peter is an associate professor of architecture at Clemson University School of Architecture. He's the author of the book, Becoming Jane Jacobs, published in 2016 by uh, the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, after graduating, Peter has been very involved in activities at Penn. In 2008, he organized a conference, Reimagining Cities, Urban Design After Oil. And in 2019, he co-organized together with Franca the conference Architecture Theory, Theory Now, right? Architecture Theory Now. Uh, the title of his presentation is Reflections on Sitting in the City. Uh, Peter. Hello, David, Franca, and the organizers of this wonderful event, which I regret not being able to attend in person. I'm Peter Lawrence, Associate Professor of Architecture at Clemson University, which is located in a suburban college town, a geography that has come to influence my thinking in some ways that I will share with you. The title of my talk is Reflections on Sitting in the City. On the occasion of another special event held in 1996, David Leatherbarrow wrote Sitting in the City or The Body in the World, which was later published in the book Body and Building. In this essay, David articulated important concepts of architecture and topography, which he defined as the horizon of architectural work that is more inclusive than the outer walls of a building and is indicative of the existence it sustains a wider horizon of physical and spatial conditions that traces typical human affairs. Indicating at the outset that he opposed totalizing design practices because of designers' inability to envisage and project a complete world, he concluded that this prioritizing of the undesigned world, this reaffirmation of the town, no doubt weakens design as originating authorship. Nevertheless, the real prospect for an architecture of our time, he said, is still to be found within the horizon of the city, that spatial and material trace of reciprocal interests. Here then, I would like to take up some of David's thoughts on designers' frequent struggles to engage with the open systems that are cities, to stitch projects into them rather than weave wholly new fabrics, to substitute their singular visions for the range and diversity of interests, motifs, and patterns that typically characterize an urban setting, and to make places for sitting in the city that are still architectural. My touch points and references here will be somewhat eclectic, but this I believe is partly due to architects' historically modest, if not inadequate, knowledge of or interest in urbanism and urban design. Iconic 20th century case studies and notable works that have frequently been residential projects with exteriors that were either suburban or rural because, I believe, of the anti-urbanism or suburbanism that characterized theory and the redesign of cities for much of the century, which was not substantially updated until the 1980s when modernist urbanism was replaced by a so-called traditional urbanism that was hardly appealing to the aggressive architects of the contemporary architecture generation. For many of them, the reaction to this new development and to the related question, whatever happened to urbanism, was to abandon both the field and the city to reiterate early 20th century ideas of the traditional city's irrelevance to claim we are left with a world without urbanism, only architecture, ever more architecture and to promote bigness. 
looking back some 100 years from that point, the pioneering architects of the 1880s and the following decades carried forward ideas from the arts and crafts movement, among them concepts of total design and the Gassam to Kunstwerk that it once originated in the socialist ideals and the parting of ways from the elitism of the Beaux-Arts. In the United States and elsewhere, accepting the rare enclave that warmly embraced the writings of Ruskin and Morris, such as the Roycroft community in East Aurora, New York, these political beliefs were downplayed if not ignored, even as the aesthetic agenda was promoted and sold to a well-heeled clientele. One of Wright's earliest publications, for example, the Modern Home as a Work of Art, originally delivered as a lecture to the Chicago Women's Club in 1896, anticipated, as David wrote, the totalizing authorship that was to become his practice in later years. Predicted, for example, the anti-urban broadacre city concept that Wright, that Wright promoted until his death in 1959, for which he designed not only the landscape, the homes, and the apartment buildings, but farms, bridges, factories, a stadium, a roadside market, and necessarily gas stations. At the same time, the modern home as a work of art alighted into concepts of the city as a work of art that prevailed into the 1960s when Jane Jacobs argued that a city cannot be a work of art. So when one considers the revival of the city as artwork idea in the work of Leon Creer, the charismatic leader of new, the new urbanism movement and the designer of a complete architectural fantasy called Atlantis, it seems fair to say the idea never went away, at least for traditional architects, progressive ones apparently having learned a lesson from their forebears and perhaps too well. Nonetheless, while a maturing generation of architects and designers may have casually accepted claims that the city was dead, in the bigger picture, architects have long held an arm's length relationship with the city. For some legitimate reasons, among them pollution, and poor housing, and poor public health conditions, earlier generations wanted to modernize the city, asking themselves, should our city survive? There were, of course, exceptions. Philadelphians Ed Bacon and Lou Kahn among them. But architects were not alone in this sentiment as historian and fellow Philadelphian Stephen Kahn has documented in Americans Against the City, Anti-Urbanism in the 20th Century. Indeed, we're all well aware that the people of the United States have long held at best an ambivalent relationship with the city, which at its worst, is manifested in schizophrenic mid-century policies to simultaneously renew cities while investing in competing suburbs, and today in the nearly warlike political divide between cities and their hinterlands. Although anti-urbanism, the flip side of suburbanism, is neither unique to America nor our time, it should perhaps be no surprise that neither the civic art nor civic design was able to make an enduring or substantial foothold in design thinking, education, or practice. As for urban design, not long before the term was popularized, architects didn't necessarily see site design or so-called plot design as their territory, thus limiting themselves to interiors and envelopes. Moreover, in parallel with the modernization of landscape architecture by Ian McHarg and others in the 1950s, urban design was not only a reinvention of civic design and in response to the post-war urban era of urban redevelopment and urban renewal, as an academic discipline, it was conceived of, of a, as a specialty rather than as foundational knowledge that would be shared by architects, city planners, and landscape architects. This educational tradition prevails in many schools, partly because the AIA, along with the ASLA and APA, is unlikely to suggest that architecture education should become a specialization. And as far as architecture education is concerned, National Architecture Accrediting Board criteria have historically ignored the built environment, although the recent 2020 guidelines show signs of promise in this regard for perhaps the first time. Perhaps as a consequence of their otherwise healthy abandonment of Gesamte Kunstwerk and interior design is somewhat ironically another field that contemporary architects have deprioritized. Yet when it comes to interest in the settings within buildings versus the settings outside buildings, interiors and furnishings remain part of a long and enduring tradition. Iconic chairs of a century ago are still emblematic of the careers of admired architects and entire 
architectural movements and are now coveted antiques. More recently, a fad or a phenomenon of furniture, the kind of bigness applied to furnishings, is an example of this. But my first question ultimately is this. While architects have asserted for a century their interest in the interior-exterior relationships of their buildings and they wax poetic about inhabiting space, concepts of inhabitation, and their concerns for their designs and inhabitants, what concern by comparison have they shown for out-habitation and out-habitants or ex-habitation and the ex-habitants of cities? These terms, of course, are somewhat absurd and exaggerate my point in the interest of brevity. The architects have long claimed interests in architecture's social dimensions and social condensers and innovated, innovated programs and public space and more recently an infrastructure. And what could be more fundamental a form of public infrastructure than a place to sit? Is the ostensibly outdated paradigm in the anti-urban object building actually so deeply ingrained that architects are unaware of the suburban mindedness they bring to so much of their work? How do we design for sitting in the city and what might this mean, architecturally speaking, and rather literally? By architecturally speaking, I mean focusing on buildings and setting aside park or plaza or public space design that architects might collaborate on with landscape architects and urban designers. As David has offered in cautioning against architecture as the city, he wrote, it might seem wise for architects to retreat from the city and concern themselves solely with the building, its interiors, external appearance, and immediate vicinity, extending no further than the adjacent sidewalk, forecourt, yard, or garden, and ultimately embracing a distinction between awareness of the city and responsibility for the building. If designers are going to make things worse, then this is certainly true. I would further narrow my thought experiment to certain urban buildings and aspects of these buildings. With an overarching interest in the public space that defines cities, I would focus on public rather than private buildings that naturally privilege private property and tend toward a fortress mentality in so-called defensible space, even in cities. Shared stoops, steps, and stairs would replace balconies and roof terraces. Porticos would replace piloti, and the site plan would be at least as important as the free plan in the key points of this urban architecture. Whereas, for example, inhabitants of the Wiley Theater by Rex architects passively view Dallas from their mechanized seats as part of the stage set when the curtains are lifted, ex-habitants of the Oslo Opera House by Snohetta interact with a building that has created a new urban topography. Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro's High Park Pavilion at Lincoln Center does something similar, as does the more peripheral Hexia Architects Cruise Terminal. Kengo Kuma's Darling Exchange Building in Sydney is characterized by a winding wooden ribbon screen that spins off the building to become a canopy of an edge of Aspect Studios Darling Square design. And the Fabrica de Cultura School of Arts and Popular Traditions in Barranquilla, Colombia by ETH Zurich and the Universidad del Norte has a tiled mosaic ground plane that is framed by an older building and rises playfully into and up into the new building. My last and even more modest exemplar is captured in Max Lieberman's painting Free Period in the Amsterdam Orphanage. It is a portrait of a group of youth occupying the exterior edges and adjacent sidewalk of their institutional home. Apart from enjoying an unusually sunny day in Amsterdam, the children's joy clearly comes from being ex-habitants of this building, and as pretty as the picture is, the promise of someday leaving it behind and inhabiting other parts of the city. In contrast to the small collection of accommodating designs, recent decades have seen a trend of hostile architecture. These generally client or inhabitant made modifications to buildings exemplify the opposite of what I'm proposing here. Intentionally uncomfortable vent benches and spikes to prevent sitting in the city, typically targeting people with no inter interiors to inhabit are just two antithetical examples. My more life affirming exemplars may all 
may not all be masterpieces. In some cases, I don't fully understand their authorship or intentions, the working conditions that created them, if the buildings are wasteful or seek to minimize impacts, or how they will weather and inclusively, inclusively serve their communities in time. Moreover, my selection may admittedly further exaggerate my points. However, with the exception of my most modest example, Lieberman's painting, these are inventive urban buildings located in different climates and parts of the world that reimagine the topographies and horizons of their sites in ways that those not attuned to architecture can comprehend, and that I suspect memorably situate people in their cities and suggest possible alternatives of how one might occupy those cities. Their interior, exterior, site-city relationships are more than liminal in between spaces. Some of these buildings become perches, some benches, other sofas. Ultim but ultimately, when it comes to sitting in the city, most are not just accommodating, but commodious and generous. They welcome strangers, as they must, because cities are full of strangers. To conclude, I must admit that I'm still trying to find the edges between architecture and the city. I would not want to see architects or our students return to self-aggrandizing ambitions of complete and totalizing designs, let alone casual or careless urban planning. At the same time, I would want them to be able to see with knowledge of our history when these ambitions appear in new guises. And I would encourage them to push a bit further into the public realm in its various dimensions and in a participatory way. As design educators, we know it can be difficult to get students to draw anything outside of a building, even a sidewalk. This, I believe, is because after 100 years of the erosion of the city by automobiles, those carriers of the patterns of anti-urbanism and suburbanism that I have complained about so many have become alienated from their bodies as, be, as beings designed to walk and interact face to face and become fearful of strangers to a degree that compromises their roles as architects. For these many reasons, I think it is time for us to help teach them to re-inhabit the street as a place, among other things, for sitting. With that, I shall end my talk here except to say thank you so much, David, for all that you have shared and taught me and so many others about architecture and landscapes, cities, and scholarship. And next speaker is um, here with us, Marcia Feuerstein. Marcia received her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. She's a registered architect and as an associate professor at Virginia Tech's Washington Alexandria Architecture Center, teaching in the master's and the PhD programs. She considers architecture through the lens of the body, embodiment, performance, and theater, having focused on Oscar Schlemmer, iconic architectural projects, and drawing from her early work with disabled populations Recent publications include Expanding Field of Architecture, Women in Practice Across the Globe, Confabulations, Storytelling in Architecture, Architecture as a Performing Art, and Changing Places, Remaking Institutional Buildings, as well as contributions to a number of edited volumes and journals, The Routledge Companion to Drawings and Models, Ceilings and Dreams, Body and Building, ARC, Montreal Research Quarterly, and others. She started her architectural career in Buffalo, New York, and has continued to practice when the spirit moves her. Uh, the title of her presentation is Standing While Wandering on Topic. Thank you very much. Um, a month ago when Franca invited me to offer reflections on David's scholarship, how David's scholarship is important to my development as a scholar and teacher through one of his texts in 15 minutes. Um, and to speak to his, these ideas in my own work, um, I chose to look at the introduction to the Roots of Architectural Invention, which I first read while I was David's teaching, a graduate and teaching assistant. I thought I'd look, and I thought I'd, I'd do just that, look back on my teaching and scholarship and the idea of topics and topical thinking in both 
seminars, and studios, as well as in my writings. When I began at Penn in 1988, I was pretty quiet. Um, David would joke about saying I was, quote, speechless, um, but was kind enough to be patient and supportive of my obvious fear of speaking among so many smart and articulate colleagues who are, quote, good on their feet, unquote. I saw myself as being within a conversation without saying a word um, and cherished everyone's ger generosity um, of presence while I was there. Besides putting together slides for his theory class, I remember searching for copyright information for Roots of Architectural Invention, something I try not to do to my own students. Um, and I remember receiving the manuscript in addition to all the images and in reading it focused on the idea of topics, topos, as standing while taking a stand um, somewhere specific and then sort of around. Um, David introduces the topic of top of topic of topics where a pla where places or topoi situate architectural thought and practice, which identified it as a set of architectural topics, site, enclosure, and materials, as you all know, common topics for architecture. And these are fundamental questions that do not go away, nor can they be assigned to particular past periods. They are lasting. It was one of my introductions to the PhD studies and specifically to David. So what do I do here? The introduction is six pages and begins by stating why the book was written as, quote, a response to the current discourse and architectural style, a discourse that, that has become dominant, excessive, and misleading, and the stylized images architects typically produce. The art of building has been transformed into a business of self-display and promotion through the design and construction of figurative motifs, making it an object of consumption. He then states, my argument is that buildings should not be identified with stylized images by designers or scholars, because when they are, because, because when they are the result of, um, is something other than architecture. Um, um, and that they must be uh, lasting across time while specific answers are specific to their time. Um, the understanding and experience of their persistence actually makes up the structure of architectural reality. This he describes as a reflection on the history of architectural topics to grasp the basic experiences that motivated the various formulations from the past and to see how these experiences are similar to ours. David reviews the idea of topics and the theory of topics from logic, rhetoric, memory, tracing Aristotle's writings as a way of reasoning through topics and dialectics, the discovery and construction of arguments, rhetoric, and by collecting them themes or topics or subjects, details in the art of memory, as well as um, whole parts, related things, or from a sign that locates assertions bearing on the particular case, a topic as a formal generative principle, something empty, capable of being filled with ever new arguments, becoming persuasive, um, David wrote, became an art of invention that allowed one to, quote, find the commonplaces of any speech, the considerations of a general nature that would be shared by many people and subjects. This was a key to unpack for students um, when I was teaching um, um, from foundation in construction of an argument, a design is an ingenious invention, which as Davis Wright creates new designs because of something new that enters the commonplace, a situation changes. When situations change so much arguments or designs, that topics of the topical arguments are always circumstantial and local propositions comprehended by um, listeners in a specific location, a quick switch that changes according to uh, circumstances with a capacity to respond immediately to a new situation by question, by seeing and seizing similarities and new relationships between unprecedented particular con uh, conditions and antecedent general conditions. These are all David's quotes, not me. A kind of festina lente where topical arguments are always circumstantial and loca local. He ties the topic, the topical of rhetoric to physical objects and buildings through uh, by talking um, about Francis Yates' Art of Memory, where a correct recollection is located in an object or at a location within a building. And as I interpreted, it was animated by the memory as well as the mind's action and movement wandering through this imaginary space as each place became a 
touch tone along the path, changing as we wander with a, with a specific aim or aim, aimlessly about. But how, where, and when we are oriented, intentionally or otherwise, was key to this art of invention. And a memory within, with me, memory, um, and a memory um, with memories with topical questions as places where architectural intervention resides that provoke curiosity questions and wondering about long led um, assumptions so that questions motivate all manner of projects that respond to the uncertainty arising out of life situations before considering style and image. The key for me was allowing an undercurrent of wandering, questioning, uncertainty, and wondering with an open imagination where taking a stance, standing and looking around was really important. And these arguments, designs built within topical situations, transform the original argument. Situational thinking where, where, where common places as architectural places are essentially topical and memorable while based on human inhabitation, everyday actions that occur in space, architectural place and cause architecture architecture to encompass and join common places. They become what David later re, re described as good architecture with which should not constantly talk, should keep itself silent for only then will it uh, receive the human visitor. My interpretation of this, these concepts um, of wandering and situational thinking and architectural design and theory was to consider the topic as an opening or even a potentially filled place that could be filled by posing questions that could lead to un unexpected outcomes. I, I, I call them empty places that are filled, but David just said he doesn't like to use the word empty, so I'm not gonna use that. <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd talk about my courses, which, um, which, which I thought was kind of obvious thing. My graduate seminars and studios, just a few of them, because I've talked for about 30 years, developed around, um, around by using these, this theoretical framework through architectural situations and how I, how I approached my scholarship as well. Um, uh, one, one course that I taught was called Theatrical Inhabitations, Modern Domestications, which explored various ideas of, of modern through theory, which included ideas of um, arguments, lightness, verticality, horizontally balance, off balance. I tried not to be obvious about anything. Um, and then in, in, in Theatrical Inhabitation, um, and, uh, well, no, wait, wait, the first one is on modern architecture, leanings and gleanings, sorry. Topics explored various ideas of the modern, including these ideas, uh, arguments, lightness, verticality, horizontal balance, off balance. Um, in theatrical inhabitations as modern domestications, as well as body and building, students were invited uh, to this in a way, as a way to situate action or performance through themes such as the mechanics and mechanization, wandering and mobility, estrangement, sites and situations of dreaming, cladding and masking, materiality, intimacy, plast and corporeal, the ephemeral, automatic and automata, mime and double, prosthesis, et cetera, um, to be ambiguous ways of intentionally provoking the students to discover multiple meanings and ideas that, that might or might not result in any, any real clarity. Each was considered through an architectural project, a built project, a performance or film, um, and a primary text, as well as many secondary texts all which shared the subject, but not necessarily the time period or the sense of constancy. The seminars were designed to maintain an open exploration and wandering around and among the various sources. Um, and students might read an architectural treatise along time, alongside a contemporary project and related film to read one through another. For example, there's just two examples from my most recent semester. Um, on the left, uh, a student was reading Camilo Cite, according to artistic principles, and considering um, O'Donnell and Toomey's um, CEU project in Budapest. Or one was looking at, um, and then on the right, the left was the, the, the um, Cite project. The, on the right was um, Ruskin's Seven Lamps of Architecture, by, by also looking at, um, at McCullough and Mulvan Architects Rush Library. Um, for studio, I crafted projects as unique provocations that sat within general common building types for students to consider in general, but not change according to their own interpretations and research. This stimulated situational thinking to create, as David wrote, 
quote, a kind of overturning, overturning upsetting, or shaking. It establishes a place for an I wonder. Um, in the design studios, um, the projects had many stages and a, and a kind of general evocative statement, a description, a skeletal program and two possible sites. For example, I would, I would ask them to design a chapel of the lost and found, which included find a grave um, in them and, and maybe a dwelling, um, uh, a treasury of shadows for a shadow theater. Um, or most recently, uh, the city of Alexandria's Museum of Histories, which, which, which traced the various histories of Alexandria. Um, different from providing students from a site and complete program, rather the vagarities of the project allowed it to be an open work. Um, a, key, a key beginning studio exercise I always often used was to construct situations from a few, usually three, sometimes four um, words that students picked out of a hat. They were asked to use these to invent a persuasive argument, a piece or part of an unknown whole, and build a, me a measured sectional model of this part of their now yet unknown building or site, using the three words as a kind of a performative narrative. This demanded that they think situationally by imagine, by ima while imagining what happened, for example, on the stairs or the landing, rather than visually create an image of a building or choosing a typical element like a stair with no spatial meaning. These were traces of life that were part of an unknown whole. This occurred because before they had any specific site, as I said, or a, a a program um, and the students were free to invent um, a place constructed from seemingly random but actually entirely common situations created by the combination of these three words to form a tiny script or a program that contained and housed the event built as a sectional model. Um, they became commonplace architectural elements where everyday activities occur within any building, a place, a stair landing, a window stair, fall, a wall threshold, an everyday situation, arguing, sketching, writing, eating, napping, listening, or something else, um, as, and something else like um, birdsong or breezes or smells or crumbs or perfume. And they were randomly joined to create the situation. For example, a, a landing for arguments and crumbs. Um, and sometimes I added a material like chalk or wood. Um, and, um, and other times students assumed a character in another exercise, a character of characters, I did never call them Susan, users, of a project creating a narrative, a story with a collage or montage of that character, say, entering a project or being on the site somewhere. This occurred at any time during the project, often before the students began designing while they explored the site, developing their program and throughout the design phase. So, so this one, um, oh, that's sideways, sorry. I don't know how that happened. These are all upside down, but anyways, that's fine. Um, this is from a, a thesis student who just, just graduated um, and, she, and she was doing a, a project um, for a, um, uh, drug rehab, kind of rehab center, and it had a boat building. Um, um, it was a master plan with a, a boat building component, um, but she wrote a series of, of sort of narratives as she was walking through the site and creating ideas through these montages. Um, and then this was another one, which is, um, which is a shadow theater um, of Alexandria, which was also a studio project, um, and she, she was working on it with me, but she created a whole series of characters, um, and while she was in my class, she looked at a number of topics, um, I think, I can't, I, can't, I can't read all of them there, but they may have included estrangement, mirroring, I can't remember, um, and, then, um, and then developed a series of images of the project, along with those characters, telling their story as they, as they inhabit or look at this, the site. Um, uh, we also read a series of um, short texts or chapters, usually after midterm, um, in the studio, reading aloud, um, and including most this semester, we read um, Breathing Walls, Unscripted Performances, Table Talk, um, as uh, from architecture considered otherwise, as students were developing and finalizing their designs. Um, and we didn't read them all the way through. We would jump around and students would choose those passages, passages that they found really compelling. Um, and we would read them together. Um, and it, this aligns with my work on narrative embodiment and performative imagining of spaces that house performances common to all buildings. Speaking and listening to the text itself provoked something that asked for more thought, 
about a wall, a breeze, a scent, a sound of a unique voice emerging from the text, intimately engaging through sound that seemed to affect and seduce the students to become part of their sounded breath and the space of sound. This was something like what Teresa Brennan has written in Transmissions of Affect, of feeling and creating an atmosphere, charged sensibility through shared reading of poetry and a rhythm of writing that goes beyond sight. Each, student, uh, each session allowed, it, allowed students to perform the words as if they were reading a play, except we jumped around. Um, but also in doing so, they began to perform their own projects, the places and spaces that they were designing. Um, the first person voice grabs you. It takes you on a, a journey with the author. And so this is what I found with David. He switches into first voice uh, throughout his writing. For example, he writes, when I sit down to order a meal in a restaurant of a hotel, speaking directly to the reader as if face to face, David's use of I um, and my, um, and then switching to something I often use myself to begin with a question, a query, a recollection. Um, as he writes, um, questions motivate all, quest all manner of projects that respond to the uncertainty arising out of life situations. So for example, um, in an essay that I wrote on Oscar Schlemmer, I be began with my own experience of walking through the house Rob to find, even confront Schlemmer's figures throughout the house while questioning and discovering um, how the domestic word with, world was inhabited within and around these huge presences that Schlemmer inserted. And in, and in the sky with diamonds um, led to questions of wondering about my unexamined assumptions, such as about the East Wall during my first visit to Le Corbusier's um, uh, Chapel Notre Dame de Haut in Le Champ, where I recounted my visit of wandering around and entering um, and wondering about the discovery of the stars or diamonds in the East Wall or sky. In illuminating quality of architectural reveals, I began with a detail, an architectural detail, the reveal that I wondered about in its um, ubiquitousness, the reveal that I detailed while practicing in the 80s. And then um, in Camila Cite's um, tiny colophon of a winged snail that he designed um, to end his treatise um, on Vienna city planning and wondering why a snail with wings um, a unique image of Festina Lente ending, ending his ignored cry about the design of the Ringstrasse, but also was it about the loss of a favorite fresh snail market destroyed by the Ringstrasse construction, as well as the haste and quickness that the Ringstrasse permanently embedded in, in and divided Vienna. And then finally, after taking photos of ceilings, I, found, I discovered myself within the spaces of the floor and the ceiling as a quick and unchoreographed embodied trace of my own presence, um, which led me to an unchoreographed understanding of the awry um, through a series of seemingly unrelated projects from Norma Jean's Shy Bot to the Kogod Courtyard in um, DC to um, Ai Weiwei, uh, Herzog and Demuron's Hansel and Gretel, Richard Wilson's 2050, and Charles Foster becoming a badger. I began in Penn's PhD program 35 years ago and was wholly unprepared for PhD studies. So much of the roots of architectural invention manuscript was like a foreign language to me. But Penn um, and David's mentorship, along with Joseph and Marco, transformed the way I considered architecture and design. And I was given the opportunity to test my um, ideas teaching in this very space um, uh, with Jeremy Foster and Dennis Playton and with the mentorship of David, um, to whom I'm very grateful. Um, and, um, and, and now, some of it makes sense, but I think a lot of it still, still is, a somewhat has a touch of nonsense. Thank you. Our next presenter also joins us long distance, Tonkau Panin, 
is a professor of architecture at the Faculty of Architecture at Silpakhorn University in Bangkok, Thailand. Born in France, Tonkao studied architecture at Silpakhorn University, the University of Houston, and the University of Pennsylvania. She's a founder of Research Studio Panin, an architectural design and research practice based in Bangkok. Um, the title of her presentation is Interpretation and Abstraction in the Architecture of Adolf Laws, a Reflection of David Leatherbarrow's Reading of Historical References. Tonkao. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ton Ka Panin from Silapakam University, Bangkok, Thailand. First, um, please accept my apology for not being able to join you in person. I'm here today to present a paper titled Interpretation and Abstraction in the Architecture of Adablos, a Reflection on David Leather Barrow's Reading of Historical References. In the summer of 1987, a short essay titled Interpretation and Abstraction in the Architecture of Battle Blows was published in the Journal of Architectural Education. The essay written by David Leatherberry offered a fundamentally different reading of Battle Blows's work that has shed a new light on the paradoxical relationship, not only between Lowe's and his contemporaries, but also between Lowe's and Vienna's architectural culture at the beginning of the 20th century. In the essay, David wrote, and I quote, a job Lowe's design is considered with respect to the question concerning the use of both interpretation and abstraction of history of architectural design. The history of Lowe's design is reviewed and situated in the context of the development of early modern architecture. Then, Lowe's idea on the character of Viennese architecture are examined. This claim to be both modern and traditional is introduced as a paradox and then elaborated. This leads to a description of the interconnection between interpretation and abstraction in architecture and to the proposition that both allow an architect to sustain culture by creatively reanimating it. Interpretation and abstraction. On January 24, 1856, in Zurich, Gottfried Semper gave a short lecture on ornament. Semper wrote, I think that the dressing and the mask are as old as human civilization. And the joy in both is identical with the joy in those things that drove men to be sculptors, painters, architects, poets, musicians, dramatists, in short, artists. Every artistic creation, every artistic pleasure presupposes a certain carnival spirit, or to express myself in a modern way, the haze of carnival candles is the true atmosphere of art. The denial of reality of the material is necessary if form is to emerge as a meaningful symbol, as an autonomous human creation. For Semper, the virtue of the mask lies in its symbolism, the representational language it conveys. And as David's essay implied, this idea of symbolic representation is what separates Semper's theory from that of Lowe's. Although Lowe's idea resonates with Semper's decline and notion, his theory also rejects certain symbolic representations of the surface. The task of the surface was to cultivate the property natural to the materials and the nature of each setting. So leaning towards the technical and formal language of materials, Lowe's decline and theory was a way to create the unity of each setting through the nature of cladding material, not through its symbolic language. So while Semper considered cladding to be symbolic, Lowe's cladding was considered to be more practical. But this sense of architectural practicality needs both an interpretation and abstraction of its setting, which can be understood through Lowe's objection of the Wintrasse architecture 
because the buildings on the Windrasa were dressed in historical attires in an attempt to symbolically represent their contents. By contrast to the Windrasa building, Losa's building on the Mikula Plaza can be seen as an attempt to reanimate history and create a setting that was still relevant and necessary. At first glance, a dot Losa's building on the Mikula Plaza seemed to be alienated from its surroundings. Yet the building's disposition defined and redefined the form of the public square. Integrating Lowe's house into the Mikula Plaza was tricky. The fact that the site is opposite the Hofburg and the Mikula Kiosha was already a risk. The new building now known as the Lowe's house was to occupy the site of a building called Dry Lauther House. Its original intent was to contain a shop and an apartment house for Goldman and Salaj gentlemen outfitters. Begun late in 1909, but the project was completed in 1911 after uh, many debates and negotiations between the architect and the civil authorities. A comparison of plans of the Nicola Platz shows that the form of the square itself had been constantly reshaped during the 20 years previous to the building of Lowe's house. The changing perimeter of the Hofburg redefined the square into a more um, centralized space. Yet part of Lowe's house involved a further redefinition of both the site and the square it was to enclose. So by giving up a triangular piece of land in front of the site, Lowe's house redefined the perimeter of the nuclear plots and established the circular continuity of the enclosure for the square. Together with the Hofburg, the Michele Kirche, and the Pali Hoberstein, Lowe's house contributed to the creation of a continuous surface around the square, articulating it as a uniform spatial entity of the city. Lowe's house also demonstrates correspondence with other buildings around the Michele Platz in scale dimension and articulation of its entrance and automotives. The um, gesture of non-load bearing columns at the front yielded the building to the square. These ornamental columns were deliberately created and placed within the public realm. Elements such as columns and windows were in many ways similar to those of other buildings around the Michele Platz. So Los created a sense of unidentical likeness between his building and the other participants of the square, enough for the building to define itself and redefine other buildings around it. So in the end, Los's building speaks the language of the city. For Los, architectural facade and cladding was not only a matter of self-configuration, but also a question of urban order. The order and hierarchy of urban space was articulated by both the building's form and pattern. These major points um, from David's essay help us understand not only the Lowe's house, but also Lowe's view towards architecture within an urban order. Before a Lowe's house, there was a competition for the um, Geisel Franz Josef Stadtmuseum which was to be located within the boundaries of Karl's Platz next to the Karl Kirche, held in 1901 and 1902. This competition raised the problem of redesigning the entire um, Karl's Platz. Images shown here are uh, an entry by Otto Wagner. But also Adolf Loos did not officially participate in any of the competitions. He offered ideas for the project. There are two of Lowe's sketches that show his interest towards the project. His sketches demonstrate an idea related to the um, reorganization of the cast blocks. Despite this um, fragmentary nature of the sketches, they show the use of historic forms in an attempt to link the new enclosing structure to the existing Kalkiesha, which is not an unfamiliar method given the later building on the uh, Mikula Plaza. The new parallel blocks of facades formed a focal point towards the calculus that would now be enclosed. As I said, um, despite the sketchy nature of the drawing, it shows the hierarchy of forms between the elements to be um, combined. 
the new building is neither subservient to nor in competition with the square it enclosed. The new facades seem neutralized, yet the hollowed volume of the arcades at the base provides special integration with the cow's plots. This is a civic gesture to make the building become a part of the public square. The building on the left appeared almost as a prototype of those house. Furthermore, the sketches show two smooth walled stretches of buildings running towards the Kalkirsch at the same angles in a funnel shaped plan. It seemed as if Lowe's wanted the facades of these buildings to envelope the space and lead to Kalkirsch, which would be the focal point of the square. Therefore, Kalkirsch would have been nested among surrounding buildings on one side of the square rather than remaining floating in the middle of a vast open space. The um, smaller sheet of sketches show the church facade in the background viewed through a narrow street. Although it is not possible to determine um, from these sketches how Lowe's envisaged uh, the actual execution of his plan. Since the Ringstrasse um, conflicting axis already blocked the view, it would have required many changes to create this kind of vista uh, towards the Kalkir. But it also would have provided the encroaching, encroaching envelope for uh, the Kalkir and the Kalkir, as well as connecting them to the fabric of the city. In the end, I think, both the building on the Nikola Platz and the sketches of Karl's Platz demonstrated different ways in which Lowe situated his designs within an urban fabric. The past was never differentiated into a clearly distinct former period. The boundary between past and present was not marked out, as David Lederbello concluded. Abstraction in Lowe's work is the result of the attempt to represent what is essential in the architectural inheritance. Abstraction is the technique of interpretation. It is wrong to see abstraction as merely the omission of details or figures. This process knows no limits and those did not omit all historical figures. There was elimination in this process of interpretation, the elimination of distracting figures. But this was complemented by the articulation of ornaments which identify the building, brought it into being as a specific situation on that site. To the degree that architectural settings can represent patterns of life by giving them visible concrete presence, abstraction must be seen as a process which combines the side technique, ethical or political knowledge, and theoretical vision. Lowe's dumb facade is an abstraction which reveals his interpretation of good Viennese urban settings. The truth of his interpretation can be measured and should be measured by gauging the representational force of his abstractions. That is, simply whether or not they can be seen as Viennese urban and good. If so, if Lowe's had a better understanding of history than a historicist, then we have an example of how interpretation and abstraction can sustain tradition within modern culture. Thank you. Thank you. The final presenter for this session, Alexander Eisenschmidt, is also joining via Zoom. Um, Alexander has a diploma in architecture from Germany and a PhD from UPenn. He's a theorist, designer, and associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago's School of Architecture, where he directs the Visionary Cities Project, a research-based platform devoted to the contemporary city and speculations on new forms of architectural urbanism. His work investigates the productive tension between the modern city and architectural form, a topic on which he has published, exhibited, and lectured extensively. He's the author of The Good Metropolis, From Urban Formlessness to Metropolitan Architecture, guest editor of City Catalyst, a special issue of AD, and the co-editor of Chicagoisms from 2013, 
and co-editor with David of 20th Century Architecture, um, which is a, a collection of um, historical documents of modern architecture. Alex is uh, or has curated and his research and design work has been exhibited in venues such as the International Architectural Biennale in Venice, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Biennale on Urbanism in Shenzhen, the Architectural Triennale in Lisbon, the Drucker Design Gallery at Harvard's GSD, and the Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in Seoul, Korea. Um, the title of his presentation is City Beyond Form. Alex, please. Hey, David. Um, I wish I could be there in person to celebrate your life's work. But as you know, our little one is, is keeping me at home. And so it has to be via this all too familiar medium. I was asked to speak about one essay, to pick one essay that impacted my work. Um, before I do that, I wanted to give a bit of context. Before applying to PhD programs in 1999, uh, I visited different institutions and met with potential advisors. Uh, and I clearly remember my conversation with, with you, David. Um, you appeared interested in my rather rudimentary ideas about the relationship between architecture and the city. And but your probing questions would really occupy already from that meeting on occupy my thinking years to come. I was, of course, prepared to to talk about um, your work, uh, but it never came up and you never made the conversation about yourself. Uh, my engagement with some of the other PhD granting institutions was quite different. Um, I distinctly remember how one professor from another distinguished institution that shall remain nameless, gave me at the end uh, of our meeting a, a, a bound 400 page document with all of his articles written to date. I, I couldn't tell if this was a reward for my displayed knowledge of his work or a nudge to study up. I, I, I left a bit puzzled, but certainly with the impression that first and foremost, I needed to know his uh, work in order to emulate his ideas. When arriving at Penn uh, as a doctoral student in fall of, of 2000, and this is a picture I believe Tom Cow took of all of us a few years into the program, um, and by now maybe others, other presenters have showed this image as well, it, it, it became clear um, that for David the, the ideas of the students were important. Um, that, that he preferred to ask questions over giving answers, and that he was invested in cultivating a realm for discourse that was open-ended and therefore allowed one to enter into. Rarely, if ever, one would spot uh, one of his many writings in, in one of his syllabi. As, as a result, our cohort of, of students that you see here quickly developed a rather sophisticated scheme of, of sharing David's articles, copying these texts on the Xerox machine at the Fine Arts Library and passing them around to talk about them over our daily lunches. This was also how I became aware of, of David's text, uh, Architecture, the City and Nature, Part and Whole. It, it, it could have been Juan Manuel or, or Peter who alerted me shortly after its publication in 2002 about this text, and it would become one of those essays that remain hugely influential for my work. I was at the time trying to figure out how architecture's relationship to the city had become simultaneously a source of inspiration and of discontent. David's characterization of the town as a place whose full comprehension can only be approximated and its totality never fully grasped opened up a whole new set of inquiries. His introduction reads, the actual existence of urban, natural, or architectural unity can never really be known, for it is impossible to actually perceive all the parts that may make up a land or cityscape. One reason for this is practical and concrete. 
cities and unbuilt terrains are so widely expansive that they always extend beyond one's power of observation. Another reason is that the elements that can be observed within any stretch of terrain always conceal other less obvious aspects, recessive ones that are no less important because less apparent. Now, at the time when I was examining projects that sought to engage the city in its totality and document the overall complexity of, of modern urbanization, David Snowd explained why many of the attempts to fully understand and comprehend the metropolis remained unfinished. They simply couldn't bring themselves to finish the work, or better, the metropolis prompted them to keep exploring the concealed parts of the city. Projects such as Nicolas de la Mar's Trai de la Police or Robert Musel's Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften and more recently Harvard's project on the city are all efforts to document the, the complexity of modern urbanization as much as they are evidence that this very condition can only be approximated through a cumulative study of, of multiplicities that is ever growing and in constant flux. De la Mar's Traité, for example, is an unending report of urban facts and events from history to the present through the survey of Parisian archives and with the aim to distill lessons of conduct, as he says, for the present and the future, sprawling over four volumes and adorned with more than 700 folios, the work would remain unfinished, giving an indication of the impossibility to reduce urban life to rules. Similarly, the work uh, for the Der Mann ohne Eigenschaften, the man without qualities, uh, that famously chronicles metropolitan life, lasted for more than 20 years without Musel being able to complete the final volume. As thousands of pages of, of diverging drafts and alternative endings document, life of the metropolis could only be captured through an act of endless chronicling, where more is crossed out uh, than retained. For architecture, this inconclusiveness of the modern city has larger repercussions. And David writes that it's inexplicit depth tends to escape the attention of architects, which, as he suggests, has something to do with an architect's normal concern with the outwardly apparent aspects of objects or entities and the one that give evidence of design intention. In other words, for a practice that instills proclivities towards whole objects and complete forms, the incomplete, partially hidden, and increasingly complex world of the city presents a cognitive challenge that often results in equating architecture to the much larger urban realm. David's text gives the example of Aldo van Eyck's refusal to differentiate architecture from urbanism by viewing the house as a small city and the city as a small house, an analogy that he further contextualized through Alberti's asymmetrical reading between the two realms. Possibly prompted by David's note on the architect's habitual views of the city, I began to look for strands within urban and architectural thinking that recognize the incoherent intricacies and ingraspable scales of the city. While David rightly calls out what often escapes the attention of architects, I was wondering if the attention of others was instead captivated by the inexplicit depth of the city. To my surprise, some of the most vocal protagonists in early 20th century Germany, during a time when the intentionality and deliberation of design explicitly confronted the apparent aimlessness and seemingly accidental nature of the metropolis. While this largely fostered a tendency to view urbanization as undermining and negating architecture's effectiveness, a small group 
of individuals complicated this notion by finding potentials in the city's most unlikely places. They sought to make sense of the never ceasing incompleteness of the city and mine this condition for architecture just as others were escaping from it. Simultaneously captivated and bewildered by the apparent lack of form of the modern metropolis, some figures began at the turn of the century to focus on the disjunctive and anarchic moments of the contemporary city in an attempt to articulate a new understanding of these conditions and a way for architecture to move through them. Here, the term formlessness was introduced into the discourse and it became a term that simultaneously managed to name the unnameable conditions of the metropolis that differentiated the city's lack of form from architecture's will to form, and that became a rallying cry for a new kind of urban architecture. At opposite ends of the spectrum, we have August Endel's embrace and Werner Hegemann's rejection of the formless the former an architect and the latter an urban designer, yet both articulating their position as a source for architectural imagination. Endel entirely reversed the negativities associated with contemporary urbanization as he spoke of the modern city as a, quote, heap of stone and its buildings as, quote, flat, dull and formless. And yet it was exactly in these formless piles of urbanization that he found a new urban aesthetic and even what he called beauty. While the metropolis could no longer be understood as an object per se, nor had it any overarching representational value that he could acknowledge, localized impressions of the metropolis such as the infrastructural concoction of Gleis Dreieck, a uh, kind of railway intersection uh, between three major branches of Berlin's uh, public transportation system. Uh, this Gleis Dreieck was viewed as a new spatial parameter indigenous to contemporary urbanization and instructive for architectures to come. Hegemann, on the other hand, aimed to combat urban disorder, something like this, uh, that we see here in the slide uh, by, by defining it. Hegemann wanted to define it, but inadvertently by doing so, captured really the most complex image of the city. As curator of the biggest city building exhibition of its era, he intended to provide a record and narrative of urban architecture's contribution in wrestling with the formless. Juxtaposing the formal classical city with the formless industrial metropolis. He knows Potsdamer Platz, which Schinkel had envisioned as a silent clearing at the edge of the Tiergarten, had developed into a pandemonium of traffic. But the exhibit, and especially the two volume solo authored catalog by Hegemann, can only be described as stream of consciousness urban history a text so saturated with detailed information, interlaced histories and urban codes that readers could detect neither a structure nor any central argument. Unintentionally, he had produced an urban document that reproduced the complexities of the modern city. In these works, the formless conditions of the city became an operative concept that in turn penetrated the architectural discourse. Connecting the formless to the city at once describes the city through that which is ungraspable and at the same time exemplifies the formless through that which cannot be located. With the intimacy, almost equivalence between the city and the formless in mind, its relationship to architecture becomes even more fundamental. The city's formlessness inevitably acts upon architecture, eating away at its core, undermining its premise and weakening its status. The challenge to architecture made by the city, however, brings surprising revelations and carries unexpected promise. Even and especially in its provocations of failure, as Hegemann's attempt to exhibit the metropolis suggests, the formless city not only denies the representation of its own terrain, but also offers itself as the very environment for speculation. On the one hand, the criticality of the formless seems limitless, 
it's the point that it destabilizes itself. On the other, its commitment to challenge also clears away the status quo and makes room for things to come. This position not only abandons the elevated view of the conventional planner who aims to compose totalities from above, but it also challenges the confidence of the architect in the conditioning of singularities from within. That in turn seems to suggest an urban architecture that David's final paragraph of the essay outlines as, quote, less figurative than operational. I understand David's phrase here not as a rejection of form, for there is no escaping from it in architecture, but that in order for architecture to have an urban dimension, it needs to go beyond itself. At the time when architecture's position taking is dominated by resistance or embrace, no in between and the one canceling the other, David's more nuanced understanding is a rare form of productive architectural critique, one that creates openings rather than closures, generates questions rather than provides foregone conclusions, and incites alternatives rather than reinforces partisan rhetoric. Thank you, David, for all your brilliant work. If Daffy and Marcia can come here. Thank you very much for these um, round of wonderful presentations. I think that there are some issues in common discussed in all of them. Uh, the issues of uh, frugality and austerity uh, in uh, cyclicite uh, architecture uh, discussed by Daffy and then uh, the, the consideration of um, David's Lossian you know, critique of the Gesamtkunstwerk building and city by Peter and, um, and then Marcia talking about um, situation and appropriateness and topic uh, brought somehow into focus in uh, Tonkau's also consideration of loss, losses building through David's eyes and and then the question of recessiveness, that uh, formlessness that uh, Alex brought to the table and the tension with architectural form. Um, so I'm gonna be formless or recessive and <laughs> hoping that some form of uh, questioning discussion comes forth from um, the audience or the presenters. So I invite questions or comments, please. Sorry? <laughs> you have to turn the mic on also, Daffy. It's, it's just the bottom. bottom. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, in, in hearing the full spectrum, which I think was kind of summarizing that, um, one, I, I kind of think about the crossings of, of the first level uh, between Tom Powell's, uh, Peter's, um, and Alex's. I, I, I wonder if you could back in and speak a little bit and then also maybe Alex in response. Um, if, if there's, oh yeah, I remember. Uh, if there's a, an opportunity for you to talk about um, reciproc uh, reciprocating, in other words, Peter, if you can speak to how your projects might be uh, opportunities for finding that line in the form of focuses in the city, notwithstanding that um, you're contending with a historical definition of architecture as city or city as architecture. Have you? Um, have you had have you had to contend uh, with this question of you know where form plays within that? I mean, we're showing us the Oslo uh, project. You have to wonder whether the sort of uh, you know distinguishing of the opera house as a complete figure and a cube and its relationship to the landscape is precisely this operation between form and formlessness, right? But not necessarily dialectically, but potentially as constructively in the way that I think Alex was suggesting at the end 
is made possible when you're trying to reconcile those two. Similarly, Alex, in, in your case, I was wondering if you're looking at these sort of um, sort of intellectual paradigms, right, where you're trying to leave things uh, at the moment of definition or non-definition, given the circumstances that are, as you said, chaotic and sort of tending towards the formless, do you see some um, opportunities in those writings to kind of construct uh, uh, visions for how one designs given those present conditions that have to be given in form, that have to be given um, in responding to, to the project, right? So I was wondering if you could speak across those um, in, in a first instance, maybe I'll invite Tonkao um, to sort of um, speak to that because um, you know, interpretation and abstraction has to contend with that tension that always exists between understanding that the formlessness is a condition of modern life, but that form is the responsibility of the urban designer or the architect. I don't know if that helps maybe kind of try to kind of triangulate some of your concerns. Peter, I think you should start. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Franca. Thanks again for uh, organizing everything. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say I, I didn't catch the really, I'm sorry, the part of your question until you had the mic. So that was perhaps a delay in my, my response. But um, from, from that point, I understood a question about, about form relative to the opera house in the context of um, Alexander's discussion about the formlessness of the city. Um, it, um, in some ways I regretted like the choice of the opera house as being rather iconic and, and, and sort of uh, uh, so visually uh, um, exposed. Um, but on the other hand, um, I, I selected it for, you know, um, for its its role uh, as as public space in in, in that city, but um, I would say that uh, across across my examples from um, you know, from a kind of drip edge uh, coping of of an old bu building that is you know is appropriated um, for as a seat in the orphanage to the you know like the you know, the massively expressive um, work that is the opera house I've, I've tried to suggest, and not to mention, you know, like a standpipe could be sat on. I've, I've tried to suggest um, different types of occupation of the building that might be, um, in fact, somewhat liminal, um, like in the orphanage to, to something which I've sort of suggested as something sofa-like, uh, or is it, you know, kind of mega, uh, what, what some, when some furniture designers, you know, describe as mega furniture. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave my response there so that others could weigh in. Yeah, I think, I mean, I just wanted to, to say, I'm, I'm so sorry to, to not be there and, and to Peter and, and Tom Cow and the others. It's, it's really an, an amazing event that, that we're missing there. Um, it was all planned and then it all got undone. In my case, at least, I had to stay here with having the tickets laying right next to me. Um, so really sorry for that, David. Um, yeah, I mean, the in in my reading, and I guess I'm, I'm somewhat partisan because I'm so fascinated by the formless, uh, it, it seems that with the emergence of architectural theory in the sense that architects started to write about um, architecture, they simul simultaneously also were troubled by what they saw around themselves. <laughs> so it seems that architects were always somewhat um, uh, stressed by uh, what they saw in, in the city. And, and so I'm, I'm always, um, I guess, I then became very alert of instances where, where architects were less stressed out or at least used their stress to, um, to find uh, productivities or, or latencies with, 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 within uh, what, what the city had to offer. Um, and that's maybe somewhat similar to the way that also Benjamin would describe um, certain moments in art where he says that they're 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 pregnant with inestimable meanings, um, and so um, and I guess that you know 
and I also heard the last part of the question, but I think, Franca, you were absolutely spot on that uh, these architects that I'm looking at, they, they um, looked at the kind of chaos of the city and, and, and tried to deduce certain meanings from it. Um, if, if only they, they didn't want to stress out too much <laughs> in, in the, uh, at, at the moment that they had to face it, uh, but at it, it very concrete moments, it sort of almost became a, a kind of pre-collage moment, right? Because these writings were uh, at the turn of the century. And so I found them really uh, powerful indications of um, artistic and even later than architectural experiments where they sort of forecasted um, experiments like Las Loma Holinar's kind of uh, playful theater with, with light and shadow that are indications of the reflections of the metropolis. But they were already at the turn of the century until 19, uh, 1908, 1910, talking about a kind of, the kind of mesmerizing reflectiveness and, and the, the play of light and shadow and, and the play of different forms, um, only that they could only point back to impressionism. They didn't know what was yet to come. Um, and so uh, maybe that obliquely answers the, the, the question of, of design strategies that one might deduce from um, those, those um, observations of the city. Um, maybe I could add some, something. Um, for, first of all, um, I wish I, I could be there. I, uh, please accept my apology for not being able to join you in person. But um, I, I really appreciate um, Franca's uh, comment because for my part, I mean, the, this relationship between uh, the process of interpretation and, and, and abstraction, I think it is a um, sort of a recurring theme in both David's teaching and writing. What it helps me is that it helps me um, look at, also help me look at other buildings and also cities. And I think it helps me refers to architecture both as something formal and as something formless. And as David said before, it helps me to look at architecture both as not as art, but not not art either. I think that's um, my, my short comment. Mm -hmm. There was a question there. Does that work? Okay, great. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I I think uh, I think there is a uh, at least a, a theme that's common to many, if not most, of um, the um, presentations that have been made this morning that I was hoping I could get uh, you to uh, comment on, um, uh, or maybe get some kind of conversation um, staged around these ideas. The, the, I guess. One way to summarize or to enter into those ideas would be to um, uh, think about um, recessiveness as a theme uh, that recurs uh, in these presentations, the, uh, the strength, um, uh, the paradox of the strength of a building's uh, designed weaknesses. Um, I was thinking that, um, at least from my way of thinking, maybe perhaps too often that translates into um, uh, an elevation of austerity uh, or maybe um, maybe the too quick response with austerity to observations of precarity. Um, I, I guess what I'd like to hear, and maybe we could get Billy to <laughs> chime in on this as well, is um, a third position or middle ground um, between, I guess, at, at one extreme. Uh, you know, we might, in a, we might, uh, in um, the specifications for a building, uh, cite. Uh, a source of rose petals uh, that could be uh, continuously um, shed uh, in an environment uh, to generate an effect uh, that uh, that is an absurd uh, position on uh, at one end of the spectrum balanced against doing nothing uh, on the other. 
Um, and so this tightrope, I guess, between doing nothing uh, and over scripting is what I have on, on my mind. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking um, uh, some input on how to hold that middle ground and where we might, where we might find it. I just, this isn't pertaining to what I spoke about, but, but, but the thought that I just had was that um, I'm thinking about the, 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 the renovation, the redesign of um, the East Wing of the National Gallery. And, um, and before the, the reno, before it was open, um, you know, the previous one, um, you know, the iconic um, mobile was designed to move and the HVAC was developed to um, move it. Um, and I talked about this a bit in my, my um, essay on reveals, but when it was re renovated, there was no thought about that really important aspect of, of animating that space. And so now the, um, this, the, the mobile stands still. And, um, and so there is a great deal lost when you don't really specify or really think about that, um, that original performance that was so important in that space. And I think that's what you're getting to in some ways. Maybe. Yeah. I, I just wanted to note that when I first saw the, um, the buildings of Dov Karmi. Uh, I didn't notice uh, the secondary and tertiary articulation of surfaces. Uh, and there is, um, I think, the possibility within a austerity of sort of back pocket content. Um, and the, the building doesn't declare, you know, it's like when I first saw the Narrow Sciences Institute and then saw it from another distance. So the structuring of apprehension from different distances, suddenly the surfaces reveal care of the worker, of the people who live there, that makes the thing uh, resonate with content. But from another distance, it seems you know, like means and ends were all that mattered. So there must be in, in projects, this sense of, um, uh, Stephen has called it restraint or recessed uh, content. Maybe the example that you showed is that there is a surplus that's just not, on the one hand, it's made apparent on show, you know, we're uh, living an ethos of let's survive as a settlement. But on the other hand, within that, uh, somebody building and somebody designing said we could care for the surface in several ways. And this, I think, is a uh, another reading from another distance that doesn't make itself always and everywhere apparent. That's the Locean business of non-talkative architecture. And yet, if you look at it, it's got a lot to say. I mean, people cared for this thing when they made it. Uh, and this business of multiple finishes and appropriation from different distances, maybe that helps us a little bit um, that there is uh, uh, beauty to the, that that formless thing that Alexander explains so nicely in the um, uh, the the not yet apprehended. Um, that's what I mean by back pocket content. One of the things that's really interesting in hearing um, everybody's research and what they're doing is in the way that you've influenced all of these people, because it's as if you have um, made these incredibly dense and rich um, desserts here and here and here and here. And, but you haven't clogged everybody all up their, their arteries or their ways of thinking. So it allows everybody to kind of go in, indulge in the, in these sort of very brilliant and interesting ideas and, and then find their way through to the other side. And I think that that's the great gift 
And I think one of the, the stories, Alexander, you were saying when you got the 400 page bound volume so that you would, you know, simply extend the philosophy of the person who was giving you that book. I think what David does is he gives you these like swimming lanes where you swim in between um, these wonderful ideas at to, to a totally new destination. Um, and he gives you that freedom, but he gives you the richness to keep on going. And one of the things I would say about rose petals and um, uh, I, one of the things I was thinking about is in, in practice, in building things, the, the, the things we swim between, at least I, I swim between, are somehow um, a kind of beauty and emotion and, ex and practicality and making things work. So I'm swimming between, I want people to sort of, I want them to start crying, but at the same time, I know that at the bottom level, there are more people and it has to be a dark blue and not too many petals. So it, it is always, it is how you move through something and being able to be given a path that allows you to, um, to, to reach a destination. So when I was thinking about the Calder mobile and I was thinking about the, um, the loss of the, the movement because, um, the diffusers were positioned in a different way. And I was thinking, what is the other thing, what is the new thing that you might be finding or getting now that you are no longer seeing the mobile move? Because I'm sure there was a very practical reason because the HVAC needed to be redone because it doesn't live up to the standards that you know museums need to have in order to be able to take loans and other art. And so probably the air shouldn't be blowing in that way. And is there something else um, that then comes out of that? Anyway, it's clear to see that the uh, effect that you've had on people is so profound, but formless. In other words, everybody is able to find their way. You didn't just, you know, give them something that they had to go to. You allowed them a way to find their, their own passage. I think we can you know, give closure with these wonderful comments by Billy to the session. So thank you very much. <laughs> what, we're meeting back again.
How are you, Peter? Can you hear me? You, you are muted. You are muted. So I am. There hey, you are. nice background. Day. Almost entombed. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the Hal Sapieni podium in Malta. Uh, yes, yes. There are amazing places in Malta. Eh? Oh, boy. It's, yeah. it's, uh, very, very strange places. Yeah, even the 16th century stuff has a kind of power to it that you don't you don't find in Italy or Sardinia. That's right. Yeah. Or even Sicily. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So how are you? I'm okay. <laughs> I had COVID. I had COVID, you know, I had to oh. recover for about a month and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my lord. So you're okay I'm, now? You don't I'm have any problem. No, I'm Peter? fine now. I'm fine now, but it's it's been uh, it's, it <laughs> was a pain. I wasn't very sick, okay. but yes. Alberto? Hey, hi, Hello. David, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get started in a minute. We are broadcasting. <laughs> so we'll mute ourselves. So, uh, Welcome to this afternoon's uh, book discussion session. Um, it's called Locations and it'll be followed by a roundtable conversation. I'm Marcia Feuerstein and um, I'm here to introduce and moderate. Um, although I'm hoping that Alberto, who's going to be, uh, uh, and then, um, and then um, so, so we've got four people, uh, Ann, Ann Bain or Bain? Bain, sorry. Um, Peter Carl, Franca Trubiano, and Carlos Eduardo Comas. Um, and Anne will begin with her um, with, with her um, talk. Um, before I give you the title, I'll introduce her. Um, Anne is um, with the Royal Danish Academy and a professor in architecture um, at the Royal Danish Academy School of Architecture. She holds a research fellow um, no, she holds an MArch and a PhD in architecture from the Royal Academy School of Architecture. As a visiting research fellow in 95 to 96, she studied, studied under the late Professor Marco Frascari and Professor David Leatherbarrow at Penn Design University at, at University of Pennsylvania. Since 2004, she has held the chair of SINARC, Center for Industrialized Architecture that bridges the gap between architectural education, the construction industry, and the arch architectural profession. Since 2014, she has co-authored the graduate program, um, um, Settlement Ecology and Tectonics. Her research topics are ecology and architecture, tectonics, material studies, building culture, craft, hand, and industry machine. And her selected books, um, includes circular construction, materials, architecture, and tectonics, sustainability in Scandinavia, architecture, design, and planning, towards an ecology of tectonics, the need for rethinking construction and architecture, and tectonic visions in architecture. <clears throat> um, the title of her talk is No Things in Themselves, or the Question of Ethics in Construction. Anne. First, thank you so much um, having, how you say, I wouldn't say survived, but at least more or less uh, enjoyed yesterday and totally exhausted uh, from all the impressions and wonderful talks and, um, and the, uh, the, the total gratitude for this invitation, first of all, for the university, for, from the university and from Franca Trubiano for organizing this and, and of course for David, which I've been looking forward to coming and celebrate. So thank you for all of it. And I have to, I couldn't print my, my stuff. So I have to open my computer again. Um, let's see if it works. So yeah, and actually I changed the title a little bit since I sent it you some, some days ago. And now I call it, uh, No Things in Themselves, a tectonic reading of David Leather Barrow's The Roots of Architectural Invention. Um, the phrase, no things in themselves, that is put forward by David Leather Barrow in The Roots of Architectural Invention 
I've chosen for the title of this brief tectonic reading because I find it representing a particular understanding of the architectural discipline that characterizes his work. It opens for questions of what we study and engage in, in architecture. If the constituting parts of architecture are no things in themselves, what are they then? What is the broader context? What are they related to? What are they made of? And what are their origins? The phrase offers a normative trajectory, yet it's rede redefinable. A position, yet it's open for discursive in investigations. It echoes established theories, and yet it allows for reconsidering conventions of the existing. When I was invited to contribute to the Festschrift in honor of Professor David Lerero, I felt a strong sense of gratitude and obligation. This was accompanied by a familiar feeling of the pain of unknowing, a feeling also associated with the thrilling experience when first arriving at University of Pennsylvania about 25 years ago as a visiting scholar to join the PhD program in architecture. At the time, it was part of the Graduate School of Fine Arts. As for my first endeavors, I was to participate in an opening seminar with Professor David Leatherbarrow. It was taking place in a crowded small auditorium and Leatherbarrow spoke in a low tone of voice and one had to stay fully concentrated to get all the nuances. The lecturer introduced the topic, the paradox of practical theory and informed a discussion about under what conditions theory emerge in architecture. When concluding his lecture, he reassured the audience with a friendly smile, its ground is in unknowing, it's a pain in the stomach. This is where it all started for me, on the unsettled grounds of architectural thinking. Please, oh, I, I have to do this, that's right. It works, oh. What do I do? Thank you. So uh, this is, I'm back. I'm not back. Here we go. This presentation comprises uncommented extractions of notes from the PhD seminar uh, with David, David, with Leatherbarrow that I attended in the year of 96. Reflections on the forming elements that encouraged me to engage in philosophical studies in architecture. And, and tectonic readings of central ideas offered by Leatherbarrow in his book, The Roots of Architectural Invention, Site Enclosure Materials, focusing on the three chapters, lawful functions, enclosed habits, and design and construction. Um, yeah. Finally, I will show a few examples of how this field of knowledge and Leatherbarrow's thinking has affected the curriculum and research that we are now undertaking at the graduate program, Settlements, Ecology, and Tectonics, and in Senior Center for Industrialized Architecture at the Royal Academy. This formative book, The Roots of Architectural Invention, not only offers a fountain of insights through series of original references and analytical perspectives, the musicality of the language and the grace by which historical and contemporary elements and ideas are woven together shows the noble mark of Leatherbarrow's work. This book and his later writings, The Three Cultural Ecologies and Building Time, have acted as continuous sources of inspiration and guided me to stay on track, studying the grounds on which architecture can be understood, discussed, theorized, and enjoyed. These important learning experiences have cultivated through ongoing mentorship and academic dialogues generously offered by, by David throughout the years as his, as his pointed um, PhD opponent as Velux professor as part of the Sustainability in Scandinavia Penn Summer School, and as keynote lecturer Leatherbarrow has regularly visited Royal Danish Academy School of Architecture and shared his insights with faculty members, our PhD group, and the larger body of graduate students. As mentioned, to set the scene from where I, it all started for me, I've selected few notes from the theory course, theory two, inquiry one, on the January 17th, 1996. It was on theory and theorizing in architecture. Wonder about it, that is what theory is, from know how to know what. Experience in revelation, that changes your view. 
Theory has no object. The work itself is the target. Designs are better when they emerge out of thick questioning. The ethical dimension of architectural design is culturally defined, circumstantial, conventional. Theory is to raise questions. Theory causes difficulties. If you want to solve a problem, do design. Critical thinking is not provided by the text, but by the reader resisting the text. Questions that the reader puts to the work and the question the reader asks himself. A critical attitude towards critical thinking. Writing theory becomes a canon. It becomes a component. It's not only a step, an enactment. It's different every time you repeat the object, but it's a new gesture every time. To be welcomed as a visiting scholar in the PhD program in 96, 95, 96 at Penn Design by Professor Marco Frascari became a valuable turning point in my postgraduate academic education. Getting the opportunity to access the rare library uh, sources and the Louis Kahn archives, meeting scholars of excellence and a diverse group of brilliant PhD fellows grounded a more distinct understanding of the fundamentals by which architecture is constituted in both theory and practice. It also showed how theories can be created and theorizing can be critically discussed within the wide ranging field of architecture through open conversations amongst professors and PhD students. During that time, the theory courses I attended in the PhD program was taught by Joseph Rickwood, Marco Frascari and David Lillibarrow. And the course contents focused on architectural theory, central treatises and carefully selected references on architecture the sessions were organized according to detailed lists of literature and a selection of topics that were highly ambitious, both when the topics were reaching back in time in, 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 of antiquity or the Renaissance, as in the course readings, or when they were framing modern thinking in architectural production in the course of inquiry one and two. As part of the course readings, I were, to my surprise, asked to read aloud from Vitruvius's treatise, De Architecture. This included an English version, the 10 books of architecture and original editions, both in Latin and Greek. The original texts were all, most often read by Joseph Rippert. Rippert would unfold the details on how cultural specificities of antiquity should be contextualized and interpreted, which included the concrete building practices that Vitruvius referred to. Albeit the readings concentrated at topics of antiquity, they still seem surprisingly relevant to present day architectural dilemmas. As a similar, with a similar hermeneutical approach, the theory course inquiry two focused on studies of modern thinking and design traditions, exemplified in the work by Le Corbusier, Adolf Loos, Sverifin, amongst others. And the course was taught collectively by Marco Frascari and David Leatherbarrow. This setup seemed to be intended to include various perspectives, and often they enjoyed challenging each other with detailed questions concerning specific historical incidents, or by offering counter arguments to ideas and theoretical positions they had just agreed upon earlier. All in all, an intellectually playful affair, but it also felt deadly serious. The PhD program at Penn was fundamentally different from the PhD courses I had previously attended in Denmark, and at the time, there were no courses planned for PhD students in architecture and no courses that included philosophical reflections regarding materiality, building technology or architectural practice. Only courses that focused on general theories within a broader field of humanities were offered. Moreover, at the time they were not taught by architects with doctoral degrees, but by professors in archeology, span literature or art, art history. These sorts of PhD, PhD courses felt growingly unfitting during my first years of PhD studies in architecture, the ways by which ideas and concepts were presented as well the epistemic basis and the didactics applied were never fully related to the genuine architectural thinking or vice versa, something was missing. The experience of missing something grew in the first years of attending the PhD program in Denmark and due to the nature of the architectural education that is based on edu educational traditions of the Royal Danish Academy, um, for generations, architectural education in Denmark has been based on training in project solving, creating design proposals and learning by doing through artistic methodologies and design related craftsmanship. 
In the 1990s, there were no required readings of curriculum, and one of the few books that were recommended to read was Experiencing Architecture, authored by the legendary Danish architect um, and professor um, Steen Eider Rasmussen, um, who was a professor, professor in building art, and he, and he has influenced generations of Danish architects after the Second World War. Experiencing the doctoral program at Penn was heartening indeed. It felt like coming home. Altogether, the PhD courses supported the understanding that architecture can be fully recognized as a unique discipline. In the, course, uh, in the courses, formative ideas, concepts, principles were extracted from re researching into original sources, thinking and theorizing, and they helped to define the grounds on which architecture can be founded and clarified ways to talk about its ethical dimensions. Material potentials, the making of buildings and how these elements correlate and act as signifiers in architecture have been a center for attention throughout my architectural education and scholarly career. This includes knowledge embedded in the culture of building technologies and building eco ecological dependencies to nature and how these elements can form basis for theories in construction. Having studied under late Professor Boy Lundgaard, who claimed that architecture is articulated through construction, founded this interest. Boy Lundgaard is the founding partner of Lundgaard Tranberg Architects and is recognized for the Grand Tiefgen Collegium and the uh, College and the Royal Danish Theater, amongst other fine works. Obviously, these interests made the PhD pro program at Penn Design an appealing ac academic environment to seek. In addition, one of the six case studies of my PhD thesis happened to be the Louis Kahn Richards Medical Research Laboratories. And knowing that Louis Kahn's co collection was housed at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania added to this motivation. When getting introduced to the roots of architectural invention in 95 for the first time, I had just read the article, Tell the Tale Detail by Professor Marco Frascari. Through analysis of work by Alberti and Carlos Garba, a creative concept of construction and construing was offered, representing a unified understanding of details, which referred to the logos of techne, the knowing of bringing forth, and the techne of logos, the bringing forth of knowing. The carefully selected terminology described the breadth of various phenomena linked to drawing and execution of architectural detailing and it was evidently applied as a method to approach the double-faced nature of architectural construction. This way of examining the objectives embedded in factual construction and proposing concepts related to specific building technologies, I had not met before so articulated. It therefore became an important uh, foothold for my following PhD students into the meaning of construction and architecture, offering, offering a unique approach to academic methodologies and a vital mindset appropriate for theoretical studies in architecture. In Roots of Architectural Invention, the scholarly uh, code of conduct or school of thought was further or is further elaborated. Ideas outlining material culture are defined through topics as site, enclosure, and materials, and studies across historical edifices and architectural theories, theories are presented in carefully selected texts by the theoreticians of Alberti, Semper, Lowe's, and de Corbusier, amongst others. The book not only offers a thorough review of ideas and historical accounts, but it also presents critical analysis of central buildings addressed in ways to illuminate current thinking, which at the time in the early 90s was concentrated on style. The book immediately became an important reference to me, not the least because it formed an enlightened critique of problems re related to reduc reductive perspectives in architecture, describing various sorts of dilemmas, ambiguities, and loss of val valuable nuances. Moreover, it, it presented the work of Gottfried Semper from a new angle that brought his ideas into the forefront of construction and architecture, providing them with relevance for a contemporary setting. Prior to this reading, I had only studied Semper's work through original sources in German and the first edition of Grundlagen der Architektur, Studium zur Kultur des Tektonischen, first published by Professor Kenneth Frampton in 1993. This book was actually brought to my attention by Professor in Literature Studies at Copenhagen University. Often I have returned to 
roots of architectural invention for specific insights and clarifications of topics, concepts, and terminology. Yet some chapters have played a more significant role than others. The chapter, Lawful Functions, where the complexity characterizing the theoretical grounds concerning the order of things of Gottfried Semper's work is unfolded in detail. Here, Semper's particular concepts concerning symbols of spatial order, formal purpose, and organic law are explained as independent elements, which helps one to understand how subtle inner logics that include divergent conditions can be turned into potentials when describing architectural phenomenon or ideas. Semper's idea of radical human activities and the embodiment of function types is furthermore explained through the inner logic of their development and the very culture of construction, but also the correlating to form, uh, as correlating to form. Leatherbear concludes that, I quote, Semper's argument forces us to wonder about the inner sameness of geometry and conduct, although this topic has no name in current discourse, it, it is nevertheless the radical basis for full understanding of architectural, architectural enclosure, unquote. Now having studied these complex topics for many years, I fully believe that this unnamed discourse of theories in architecture can be named tectonic thinking or as framed by Leather Barrow, architecture as tectonic art. How to restore the ecological balance of the earth to prevent the growing scarcity of natural resources and stop pollution effects of construction at a global level have become urgent subject matters in the building industry and current discourse in architecture. Two primary strategies that answer to the calamities can be, can be identified. The first one points at further development of advanced or smart technologies such as AI, digital fabrication, robots, etc. Whereas the second points to the use of low impact materials, passive energy systems and reuse of materials and buildings. However, each strategy must involve considerations about green energy supply, proper use of materials, aspects of durability, polluting effects and life cycles. Nevertheless, an incomplete understanding of the role of technology can be observed as the shortcomings in general architectural production. It not only separates form and content, but also impatiently ignores the multiple factors which contribute to its, the building's embodiment and the cultural significance of construction. Consequently, the tectonic potentials do not seem to be fully released. Regrettably, these undesirable circumstances have grown to, a higher, uh, to a, an ever higher level since Leather Barrow offered his critical analysis on similar topics in roots of architectural invention. The results are particularly evident in the fabrication of buildings in the industrialized countries, but also within the architectural environment per se, there seemed to be a general lack of deep tectonic considerations. Despite the distress such critical circumstances may cause from an architectural perspective, I still find them essential to deal with. I believe there is no need to persistently address, I, I, I believe there is a need to persistently address how fundamental questions concerning material properties, local craft traditions, mode of conduct in construction, that, is, that also be industrialized, and being a building technique link, linked to architectural design practice can be examined through critical thinking, theorizing and experimentation. Productive definitions of the various sorts of knowledge, knowledge that are involved when distinguishing between design and construction and how the techniques of working a material entered into the definition of, uh, entered into a definition of its properties have been characterized by Leather Barrow in, have been characterized by Leather Barrow. In chapter design and construction, he describes, he describes Alberti's ideas on materials relating to the difference found in the work of the architect versus the craftsman. Three kinds of knowledge can be related in fabrication of architecture um, are extracted. That is technical knowledge in the art that understands the movements of weights and bodies, ethical knowledge in the understanding the uses of mankind and theoretical knowledge in understanding the noble and curious sciences, unquote. 
Although the historical context of the Renaissance, these definitions still hold relevance when discussing the ethical dimension of te technology and construction architecture, both from a general perspective and regarding the wish to restore the earth ec ecological balance. To exemplify how these ideas can be transferred into current architectural education and research, I'll now show a few highlights from student work and extracts of the latest research project going on in CNARC. In the curriculum of the graduate program, Settlements, Ecology and Tectonics, Tectonics which I've been chairing since 2014, we set, we set out to study material cultures, cultures the, make, the craft of making and the role of location in architectural production. For the past seven years, we have run a series of courses under the, under the heading Research and Innovation Studies, which is a two and a half month module in collaboration with partners in the construction industry. We always teach in pairs of two supervisors and the students are asked to work in groups of two or three to enhance the dialogue and ensure different perspectives. In 2019, we collaborated with the Thatcher's Guild where the students were asked to explore the potentials when using reed and thatching techniques as basis for architectural invention. As part of the course, the students must define specific problems they find critical as for the larger perspective of material use, the range of tectonic expression, and the current challenges in the professional construction industry. One of the projects have led to testing mineral substances as lime, clay, and sludge to protect against fire hazards. Their testing showed interesting results, which led to further design proposals, where they created a whole new set of details that would frame the, the facade openings to protect escape routes in case of fire. In that sense, the project investigated the material properties, the craft culture, and through this developed a new language of construction and architecture. The diploma project presented here is a South work in Reykjanes in Iceland. It holds the title, The Potentials of the Site, and is oriented towards the nature of the specific site, the regional building culture, and the character of the program. The project refers to traditional building techniques of cut stone and scarce use of timber for construction. The facades are left open for ventilating the indoor environment, preventing the salty steam to build up. Integrating the natural environment of geothermal heat for local salt production, using regional materials and designing regarding to the climate conditions have led to a delicate architectural language, keeping it simple and relating the building to the site. In a similar, but you could say more deep explorative manner, um, we, have, we, have, we have done research within um, parallel fields. And that is rooted in historical studies, critical thinking and testing of cultures of construction. And we are presently working on the research project that construction for the green transition. The larger framework of the architectural, um, of, of the, uh, of the architectural practice and construction industry in, in um, have to answer through the Danish political ambition of reducing the CO2 emissions by 70% in 2030 and by 100% in 2050, and that is uh, according to EU law. The idea of the project is to develop and test new sustainable construction solutions for thatched building facades that are environmentally friendly and fireproof, and which in the long run can be scaled to an industrial, industrial level. The focus is on fire safety, which is one of the key challenges when building with biogenic materials. Together with two of the thatch, uh, two Thatchers and a clay mason and the Danish Institute of Fire and, uh, Fire and Security Technology, we are testing how different types of clay mixtures and technical solutions can be used as environmentally friendly fire retardants in building facades, either as surface treatment or as clay plates built into the construction. Scale, taste, scale testing of full wall elements vertically thatched and impregnated with moraine clay have been executed and the items were exposed to permanent gas flame of approximately 30 minutes. The test results have been surprisingly positive in favor of using clay as fire retardant. And the next step is towards developing new standards for construction uh, will be pursued. A full-scale thatch structure, fire impregnated with clay have been on display 
at the exhibition, 70% less CO2 transition to the viable age at the Royal Danish Academy in the winter of 2022. It is constructed as a breathable building envelope with wood fiber boards as windbreaker and internal vapor barrier of clay plaster on load bearing prefabricated insulating straw elements. We now see how embedded knowledge in local craft traditions, studies of historical buildings and industrialized construction can push forward or can push conventions in the construction industry and lay grounds for new architectural inventions and designs. In light of the overall ecological crisis we are facing as present uh, day civilization, the role of ethical knowledge that refers to the cultural values embedded in construction created by human action, ac action seems more important than ever to address since it frames the fundamental aspects that defines the making in architecture. As framed by David Leatherborough, these elements links directly to the choice of materials, their properties and durability and the fundamental understanding of how they are always place bound. Leatherbear's concluding argument in the chapter, Design and Construction, and I quote, there is no things in themselves in construction because materials are redefined as long as the construction endures, unquote. Manifest that ethical questions are central to understand the role of technology as part of our natural environment. And in, in, in addition, Leather Barrow encourages us, and I quote, to see human things and artifacts as part of nature, rejecting the worn out man nature distinction, unquote. More than ever, this understanding seems necessary to improve the course of current construction industry and make architecture play a central role, not only in the green transition, but as the route for sustaining future human civilizations. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, next, we're gonna have um, Peter Carl, who's coming to us from London. Um, after receiving his MARC at Princeton, Peter Carl spent two years at the American Academy in Rome, and then another two years at the University of Kentucky, Lexington, where he met David Leatherborough. He taught with Dalibor Vesely for 30 years at the University of Cambridge, and the first few years with Moisen Mastafavi and David. Um, he then set up the PhD program in architecture at London Metropolitan University for six years, followed by two years as a visiting professor at the GSD and retirement. He's writing a book on architecture and practical wisdom. And he's going to be speaking on topographic thickness, reflections on David Leatherborough's topographic stories. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm regrets that I'm not there with you in person. I'm very grateful to Franca and the organizers for inviting me to help celebrate the years of learning from David Leatherborough. In fact, almost 50 years. I met him at the same time as I met Danny Lieberskin, Joseph Rickward, and Dolly Borvesely. A few years later, after I moved to Cambridge, I was fortunate enough to teach with David and Moisa Mustafavi, and we've kept in touch since. I've been asked to respond to David's inspiring book, Topographical Stories, in which I hear earth and word, which in turn is close enough to Heidegger's strife or agon of earth and world from origins of the work of art. This is another way of saying design, which resonates with millennia of formulations like matter-mind, form-content, body-soul, 
visible, invisible, and the Aristotelian physis and nomos, later dogmatized by the Stoics, as David observes. So in general, the embodying conditions for cultural possibilities. Accordingly, we find ourselves in the presence of an archaic and profound symbolic order. Concluding his exploration of this theme, David finds that topography comprises the following attributes. Its extensity or horizontal character, its mosaic heterogeneity, movement within it continually confronts difference. It cannot be equated with land or materials such as, phys as physical substances, nor is it form as a material volume or profile. It presents itself as a paradox that is manifestly latent, given, not shown. And it is temporally both a record of an invitation to praxis both chronicle and conditions for human freedom, as I like to think of it as human finitude. This is an attractive group of attributes arising from David's negotiations with myth, philosophy, theory, criticism, and his careful and intelligent exploration of texts and architectural examples from the 16th to the 20th centuries. That is, he doesn't attempt a conclusion conclusive definition of God, as it were. Instead, he identifies the customs and mores of the world he has discovered, including two things to avoid, C and D in the list, with the intention to invite creative participation from his readers. David avoids negative polemics. He even manages to make Peter Eisenman sound credible. There is always to David's interpretations an optimism or hope a concern for what might lead to profound understanding or orientation amidst the contending fragments. David makes an original contribution with this work. Dalibor hardly mentioned topography in the Cambridge seminars, and it does not play a big role in his book. However, he did use it in the studio, where it was part of a hierarchical sequence, topography, physiognomy, articulation, which expanded or contracted according to one's horizon of concern. So for example, the street could be the topographic reference, the building the physiognomic and the facade its articulation, or the facade might be taken as a topographic reference, its general configuration, the physiognomy and the moldings and columns, et cetera, the articulation and so on. Two insights are possible to derive from this usage of topography. The first I'm only going to mention, because as far as I can judge, is more important to me than to other writers on architecture and phenomenology. Implied in this sequence is a stratification of dependencies or embodiments, of which both Dalibor and Meriponti speak, but do not develop more explicitly. Taking Caravaggio's Supper at Emmaus in the National Gallery, we can express the strata in terms of movement. The thoughts move about most rapidly, speech less so, gestures even less, the furniture less still, and the walls and floor least of all. The more articulate strata depend upon the more embodying strata, eventually converging upon the Rousselian expression important to Mendel Ponty's interpretation of nature, quote, the earth does not move. <clears throat> the different strata have a relative autonomy. They can go wrong, or most often result in partial understanding. And within this stratification resides the communicative movement of which Dalibor speaks, accounting for how nomos is an interpretation of physics, or world, an interpretation of earth, or how the cultural possibilities communicate with the embodying conditions. The second insight to derive from Dalibor's sequence and closer to David's concerns is that topography plays the role of background, is that in which the horizon of a topic appears. When we concentrate on a detail of a topic, 
we ask that the background faithfully extend its depth on our behalf. That is, we can trust everything to remain in place. I haven't filled the corridors with lions. To me, this is a corollary of the strata we've just been discussing. But the important point is that topography is not necessarily a race extensor supporting objects which we survey optically. Or rather, that is one option offered by a background from which one cannot escape. The Meliponti declares the impossibility of an ontological void. That is, we are always already enmeshed in possible means. You might just as well have said that we are always negotiating the claims and affordances of the deep background. The institutional character of the shifting horizons of reference accounts for both the anonymous solidarity of a culture as well as for the moral tenor we attribute to judgments that are good or bad, i.e., the phenomenon of decorum. On this basis, when David says that topography is self transcending in its excess, excess latency, I wonder if we are not inquiring into the nature of transcendence itself. Or are we getting carried away here? Have we lost topography? Or more precisely, what it is that topography contributes to this background, if the background is not simply being, which Heidegger designated, quote, the transcendence, pure and simple, quote. If the latter is the case, we can invoke all the usual tropes surrounding building, dwelling, and thinking in the fourfold and go home. However, I think David is right to identify a topographic order in the way that he had. David acknowledges in his conclusion that one can speak of urban topography, because anyway, to be preferred over urban fabric or system. And I take the emphasis in this book upon the dialectics between architecture and rural or garden or landscape conditions to refer to a more primordial state of affairs. What needs to be understood for founding a city, as it were, including its ethical orientation. Part of the issue resides in the choice between topology and topography, and with that, a reinterpretation of the conventional meaning of topography. In principle, the logos of topos conforms to the reciprocity of nomos and physis, and might seem to be the more appropriate formulation. However, topology is currently given over to one part of logos, geometry and mathematics, and that of surfaces. Adding graphos to topos looks at first sight like a doubling of embodiment, but with the significant advantage of displacing thought and its cognates like cognition, intelligence, concept, and so forth from primary consideration as that to which embodiment is accountable. David's text mostly considers how architecture enhances or depletes the richness of given natural conditions. And the metaphor of graphos writing refers to an intervention, a praxis of transformation that makes a definite place within the multifoliate potentiality of the deep background. We get a sense of this from a Middle Assyrian cult pedestal or altar on which a relief depicts the self-styled king of kings to Kulti Minurta I, approaching and kneeling before a representation of the same altar. The inscription dedicates the altar to a god associated with a light, Nushka, who is usually represented by a lamp. However, it appears that the symbol atop the altar is actually a stylus and tablet, in which case the deity invoked would be Nabu, associated with writing and the crafts. Perhaps we can take the doubling of the king and of his altar to allow both Nuska and Nabu, anticipating Plato's much later use of the crafts, the logos, and light in his rendering of participation in the world soul. In any event, what is most important for present purposes is the base of the altar. The altar and the relief positions its base directly atop the base of the actual altar, 
whose upper surface provides the ground traversed by the king. There is no other indication of the setting, indoors or outdoors. The event takes place in a time out of time that can be reenacted in ritual, ceremony, and later drama, to the extent the temple is implied, so then is a whole city. What is necessary is the base, its attachment to the boundless earth in a particular site enables the king to communicate with his deity. He traverses the ground with humility, perhaps trepidation, barefoot, grasping his scepter and extending his right index finger. In other words, the base establishes a condition between earth and the deities propitious for communication with humans. I'm dealing here with what I'll call the first mark, the point of departure of the transformation of earth into topography. Although he does not say as much, I take Heidegger's involvement with the pain of Georg Trakl's poem, A Winter Evening, to correspond to the strife of earth and world. Quote, pain rends, it is the rift in German Riss. It's rending as a separating that gathers at the same time that drawing, which like the pen drawing of a plan in German Grundriss, or sketch draws and joins together what is held apart in separation. Pain is the joining of the rift. Pain is the difference itself, quote. The Riss has the power over its subsequent development that the priority of the question holds in the hermeneutics of Gadama. From this we gather that neither earth nor world dominate. It is the strife which claims us as the deep background. Earth is always already architecture. The mood surrounding this making of the first mark need not be so solemn. Consider, for example, the wit with which Joyce establishes the dialectics of city and water with the Martello Tower that begins Ulysses. But given how badly we have treated our natural inheritance, it appears that we need, after all, a more profound attunement to the conditions which claim us and for which we are responsible. In any case, the likelihood that the first mark of any intervention is geometrical brings the concerns of topography closer to those of topology than might be expected. In general, I think Steinberg captured our involvement with geometry when he depicted Don Quixote tilting at geometry in nature or in our monuments, leaving open the possibility that ge geometry might after all be something entirely noetic in the clouds, in the French curve, after Robert Stoffelman. But as a mode of topographos, the role of geometry needs brief comment. In his essay on embodiment for Joseph Spesher, Dalibor argued that in Plato, the geometric order was a species of parallel discourse that resonated with the other concerns of the Republic and the Timaeus. And I think this is an important insight. If, however, we shift our attention away from Pythagorean harmonics to rhythm, I think there is something more fundamental at stake. Not only are words embodied rhythmically in chant, poetry, and song, but as we see here at the original ninth century temple at Chidambaram, devoted to Shiva Nataraja, who dances the cycles of cosmic creation and destruction, ritual attunes praxis to rhythm. In its speech, and it's accompanied by music, in its gestures and movements, in its architecture, in its ornament and regalia, and in its cycles of performance. It is a fundamental characteristic of the deep background and therefore its strife. We permeated with myriads of rhythmic phenomena. In lieu of getting lost in this topic, permit me to suggest that Pythagorean harmonics and the geometric themes derived from them, such as those of the Neoplatonist Proclus, represent an attempt to introduce modes of closure or limit 
within the rhythms that would otherwise be unlimited. And to endow these moments of closure, the familiar geometric figures, or perhaps the modi, with symbolic properties. The apodictic structure of geometric knowledge is a concern mainly to geometers and magicians. Le Corbusier was certainly among those who regarded geometric harmony in mystical terms. And for him, the right angle was a sign of the human, since as he remarked, quote, nature did not make right angles, quote, traces on the Rodian shore, I suppose. David was right to point out in his book the significance of Le Corbusier's epiphany on the Breton Fauchel. And I wish to emphasize here only Le Corbusier's invocation of two contradictory states of mind, both dream and geometry. This will be a fundamental characteristic of l'espace indecible. Le Corbusier introduces the motif of measure into the plate from Procision. In his poem de l'Engredois, measure is the governing principle. And I'm going to read this from the right, top right to the bottom, across to the left, and up on the left, by which he proceeds from astronomic rhythms to seasonal cycles to geometry inscribed on a stone to his self portrait as a pebble. Skipping over the similarities and differences between the two stones, the sequence itself proposes to indicate how the individual participates in the cosmic conditions. In other words, what we have called the first mark is here both topologos and topographos, and it translates temporal into spatial harmony derived from the fundamental division into opposites of night and day. Indeed, his symbol of the right angle unites the upper and lower curves of the solar diagram into the square circle horizon that is both plan and isometric. From the poem, we learn that the horizon is also the cranial womb in which the architecture creature is created. The break in that horizon is the portal of the pupil and several other things constituted by the drawing of the right angle in charcoal. The Corbusier's version of the first mark symbolically, if not practically. The affiliation of measure with justice is much more archaic than Plato as is the pun on right or droit, connoting straight, upright, a right angle, a legal right, correctness, and moral rectitude. Not to mention the even more archaic cross and circle, which is found in many cultures and incarnations. Here we see temporal division, probably the four seasons, framed within temporal completion, or as Plato put it, time the moving image of eternity. All of these examples predate acquaintance with geometry and its Euclidean incarnation, when we find ourselves considering Husserl's effort to locate the origins of geometry in practical life, whereby craft and construction practices respond to the ceremony and ritual, which enable the reconciliation of human history with dying, reviving nature and the celestial movements. This is approximately the sense of measure that Le Corbusier invokes when again in Precision, he finds what he calls, quote, the measure of life, quote, in the distances between the glasses, plates, and cutlery after a meal. And he goes on to argue that his architecture shares this character with vernacular architecture, here from his Voyage de Lyon. <clears throat> Excuse me. With respect to his buildings, the proposition is a certain plausibility. Although Le Corbusier's largely imagistic or emblematic version of nature contrasts profoundly with the subtle dialectics David shows to have animated Neutra's work. With respect to cities, however, it is a different story. One might have expected Le Corbusier to find the measure of life in the topography of the Marais at the bottom of the central image. Uh, for example, but of course he did not. 
or we are obliged to acknowledge a new measure in response to technology, apparently justifying the capacity for geometry to carry crude generalizations about human settlement. This problem corresponds to the distinction drawn by Dalibor between creative and productive. And it is in response to such confusions that David's argument becomes necessary. If we are to shift our imaginations to a more concrete and nuanced understanding of how what sort of embodying conditions support what sort of cultural possibilities. Before concluding, I would like to briefly call attention to three other styles of topography or place writing. The first of these would be ancient Egyptian settings, which deploy imagery and statuary within rhythmic columns of hieroglyphs, which can in fact be mirrored across opposite sides of a room, in which case one side would be read backwards, to establish a condition in which, as it were, the stones chant the meaning of being situated. Secondly, are the configurations of the Maya, where the hieroglyphic style of embodied reference appears on everything from cocoa cups to incensors to well regalia to monumental architecture, as you can see from these images from Copan, in which the iconography associated with the fifth century founder, Kinix Yash Kukmo, persists throughout Copan's history at several registers of scale. It is difficult to convey the intensity of this hieroglyphic practice. I, at jungle clearings, or topographos metamorphoses into a topologos, whose extensity has recently been exposed by LIDAR surveys, the black dots in the the lower left are buildings surrounding Copan's ceremonial center. What accomplishes this metamorphosis is ritual whose character appears in this depiction of the Central American Tlaloc water mountain, with the waters of death and rebirth, like from baptism, mixed with the blood of life and of sacrifice. These practices have regularly stimulated revulsion since the 16th century. But I'd suggest that the overall metabolism is more honest to our obligation to the fundamental natural conditions than is the commitment to individual freedom within the process of practices of exploitative capitalism, which of course itself is not bereft of victim. The third example of topographic writing um, is this poem by Li Bo, or Li Bai or Li Bo which is contemporary, in fact, with our example from Copan. In the second stanza, he makes reference to a fourth century BCE legend about a fellow who followed peach blossoms along a river until he arrived to a cave, which like the Mayan example, was a metaphor for death's encounter with the divine. Since in the Chinese legend, the cave eventually opened out to a land inhabited by people who had never heard of China's turmoil, evidently enjoying immortality. Early Tang is also the period when the techniques of ink brushing calligraphy transform into landscape painting. No early Tang example survived. This is from the Northern Song, painted just before the Tang collapse. Much of this was devoted to mountains. In the third century CE compilation called the Book of Mountains and Seas, a sort of mythic geography of China, records 447 mountains together with their legends and cults. Incidentally, the term in Shui, mountain water, is a traditional name for landscape painting. As much mountain as cloud in the paintings, these mountains are also setting for the Homo Viator seeking to arrive home or to visit a friend or a temple. It corresponds to the way one views such works. And who David identified at the Varalo Sacramante, also devoted to a sacrifice incident. 
These two examples of wandering in the natural landscape anticipate the English garden as much as do the underworld of Aeneas book six or Elysium. Such wandering is itself a form of graphos, generally having the character of an unfinished sentence. And Augustine's conception of pilgrimage as having a sacramental or bodily aspect, as well as a theological or noetic aspect, may be generalized beyond its Christian context. And so far as we have taken Graphos to stand for our projects, they too have the character of pilgrimage. And by such means does our finitude encounter its fundamental conditions or transcendence. The need to acknowledge the chthonic or death in the trajectories of assertion might be exemplified by the reports of Tang artists who broke with the established discipline of inkbrush custom and resorted to tossing the ink, rubbing it with their hands or with their hair and so forth. Emulating these practices is a later Southern Song example, which I've given you here, from Yu Qian's Eight Views of Xiao and Xiang, where the exchange between savagery and subtlety makes the white of the background into two opposite conditions. It is nothing that on which ink blots have fallen, but it is also the mist, the speciality, the mood of transience, the deep background itself. Before topography evaporates altogether, I would like to conclude with a brief reflection on the first project David considers in his book. I've always admired David's capacity to use a single project to carry an argument. And his account of the Neurosciences Institute in Mahaya by Todd Williams and Billy Tsien is justifiably renowned. I wish to consider one aspect only in indirectly connected to the project, but the mention gives me the opportunity when, to include Todd in the honors of whom I have fond, fond memories from our university days. Apparently, Dr. Edelman expressed the wish that the Institute have the character of a monastery. At first, I assumed he simply meant a quiet place to do research, but it occurred to me that he might, at least implicitly, have had thoughts of the sacred. In his lectures and in his book, Consciousness, Edelman sought to counter current ideas of thinking as computation which he once disdainfully dismissed in an aside to a lecture at IBM as, quote, logic and the clock, quote. Evidently familiar with the phenomenological literature, he favored a conception of thinking as embodied and extended through its involvements in the world. His image of the work of the brain was a forest, which he would illustrate with this painting of the virgin forest with setting sun by the douanier Rousseau. So an instructive topographic metaphor. He would ask the viewers to subtract the panther and the human, but speaking for myself, my brain is full of panthers and people. And he certainly wouldn't have gotten agreement from Kinnik Shyarab Bakal, the famous seventh century ruler of Palenque, nor from Eduardo Cohn, whose book how forests think may exhibit the usual preoccupation with thought, but usually de develops a forest metabolism that includes indigenous peoples, Christian missionaries, and industrialists. Indeed, Pakal exhibits the multiple fluid identity distributed throughout his environment with which Philippe Descola challenges Western anthropocentrism and perspectivism in his book, Beyond Nature and Culture i.e. beyond physical normals. As it happens, Edelman's metaphor roughly corresponds to one of my own, in which I imagine the revealing, concealing, clearing of Heidegger to occur within a forest described by Derrida. What was the same recognizable forest, but comprised of earth, stones, plants, animals, and people that have the constant potential for deferment or difference? To repeat, one is mostly granted partial understanding. Indeed, I may misunderstand, but I take this to be a less elegant and less inviting way 
of expressing David's list of the attributes of topography. Thank you very much. And again, many congratulations to David. Thank you, Peter. Um, next, we're gonna have Franca Trubiano, who we all know. Um, Dr. Franca Trubiana is Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, graduate group, chair of the doctor, doctoral program, 2021 to 22, and a registered architecture with the Order of Architects of Quebec. My French is terrible, Franca. <laughs> Her research on fossil fuels, the building industry, and human health was sponsored by the Kleinman Center for Energy Policy. Amongst her book projects are the co-edited Women Rebuild, Stories, Polemics, and Futures, um, 2009 Oro, our AAR plus D, the edit, edited design and construction of high-performance homes, building envelopes, renewable energies, and integrated practice, um, and the forthcoming single author building um, author, Building Theories, Architecture as the, as the Art of Building, and the co-edited Bio, Matter, Techno, Synthetics, Design Futures for the More Than Human. Franca was president of, um, president of, the, of the journal Technology, Architecture, and Design in 2015 and 16, and a member of the Journal of Architectural Education. Um, she's going to talk about the coincidence of opposites in locations and enclosures. Thank you, Marcia. I'm not quite sure how to follow up those two talks, so I will do my best. Uh, like many of my colleagues who have shared their thoughts with us over the past two days, um, it has been a pleasure to celebrate the work of my mentor, David Leatherbarrow. I trust that the few reflections that I add uh, to this incredible collection um, are worthy of the event. Uh, at the very least, I hope that they encourage us to continue the conversations that David has started. Right, I have to figure out how to do this too. <laughs> All right. So lately, I've had two recurring yet opposing thoughts. The first is that I have been less than loyal to my discipline architecture a field of study and a profession that I love and cherish and to which I've dedicated the better part of my intellectual life. To it, I feel that I've been less than constant when desiring to capture a moment, an opening, to consider the following questions. Have the last 300 years of architectural production and discussion contributed to a substantially improved built environment? Has architecture facilitated the recovery, restoration, and return to a more resilient world? Has it helped us master material and immaterial forces in service to improving human and more than human lives? Has it worked to foster a greater sense of community, stability, and dare I say, belonging? More to the point, I've been asking myself whether I've been looking in the wrong place for answers to these questions. Should I really be concerned with whether designs and their constructions succeed in delivering better performing buildings? Whether geometry, form, figure, and extent are the constituent parts of a design vocabulary? And even whether history is as relevant a catalyst for architectural representation as it was in decades past. Now in many ways, overriding anxieties about the environment, social justice, basic human rights challenge the relevance of these questions even disqualifying their very treatment. Debating the status of the arts, including the art of architecture, seems significantly less important than contending with impending climate traumas and increased evidence of human violence across the world. Our current generation of architecture students might rightfully contest architecture's ability to even discuss these subjects. This has certainly contributed to my less than loyal thoughts. And yet, I would suggest that being a little less dedicated to architecture might in fact help us bridge the often interminable gap between thoughts and things, between cultures and constructions. And with this as my aim, I return to 
A-O-O, -O, not triple O, but A-O-O. -O. I like the sound of that. A work that invites us to look differently, to see, study, and articulate origins and destinations that lie just beyond the limits of architecture, and to reflect on what the book calls pre-architectural considerations, thoughts, ideas, and topics that exist in advance of architecture, maybe even in the before time of architecture. Now, what might these considerations be? In Oriented Otherwise, we're asked to reflect on environment and use. That is how buildings are sited and how buildings are inhabited. By environment, we might mean, we might, the larger landscape, site, topography, and region within which a building participates ecologically. And by use, we might refer to lived practices, habits, markings that are both visible and invisible through which we occupy space and space occupies us. Now, according to Oriented Otherwise, in the distance, in the space, and in this gap that exists between environment and use, we might learn to orient ourselves differently. We might learn to consider, excuse me, we might learn to encounter and participate in what has been mentioned more than once over the past two days in a form of movement that occurs in two directions, quote, this is not me, but our colleague, in two directions, two distances, and within two kinds of depth. This is the kind of movement that we encounter in what I will say is locations and enclosures, the subjects of this essay. Let me share with you my second recurring thought. This one asks the following question. Has architectural theory fully relinquished its interest in and responsibility for thinking through making? More than ever, belief in the architect's ability to create a better world is seriously contested. Architecture's heroic phase has been over for decades. So too the idea that one masters the discipline by being fluent in the thoughts and deeds of a select few. Thankfully, in the wake of much needed challenges to architecture's intellectual limits, it has finally begun a journey of self-criticism by opening itself up to challenges that are offered by discourses in ecology, environmental theory, anthropology, geography, gender studies, and post-colonial studies. In this way, an expanded definition of the discipline one inclusive of cultures, contexts, and communities of difference is radically rearticulating its principles. Canons are contested, previously forgotten voices are lifted, and paradigms rewritten in the face of increasing evidence that architecture has historically represented different things to different people. Now, this much needed reexamination of presumed universals and essences has coincided, however, with a rigorous contestation of the very idea that the architect has the ethical capacity to think while making. Weariness of creativity or ingenium is endemic in many discursive practices which critique all forms of project making aimed at constructing a better world. Surely we have no shortage of evidence of the ways that architecture has been less than responsive to human needs and those of the more than human and architects, it seems, are implicated in the forces of neo-capitalism and hence are destined to contribute to the political subjugation of others. It's not surprising, therefore, that the moral standing of those who participate in architectural decision-making is strongly debated in academic environments such as this one. Here, theory as a subject of critical inquiry appears subsumed by an ideology that discourages the fostering of any, any, intellectual horizon where architects might be seen as capable of an embedded yet emancipatory practice. In this setting, there's little hope for a curative definition of architecture. Theories practice as a form of identity-based negation, critique, and disqualification of any form of architectural intent. Moreover, a reticence to embrace the often strenuous and complicated tasks of the architect as material maker is notable in design practices that are inundated with an abundance of representational, analytical, and predictive tools. These protracted vehicles for figuration willingly assimilate architecture with the optical world and its mediated practices of withdrawal, denial, and willful abstinence from architecture. 
And yet, beyond these near dystopic land, sorry, beyond this near dystopic landscape of theories disqualification of and withdrawal from architecture, I hope that this essay demonstrates how both architecture oriented otherwise and surface architecture and many other contribute an alternate horizon for thinking architecture, a horizon that's grounded in a deeply optimistic and productive engagement with discipline. And I assert that it does this in two ways. They do this in two ways. First, by being decidedly constructive when conceiving, describing and interrogating the full range of artifacts that they designate as architectural, be they texts, paths, terraces, skylines, landings and crossings, windows, and the traveling shadows. All of these are the sites through which we embody intellectually that Vitruvian triad. Amongst the many arguments that are put forth by these works, a central tenet is that architectural deeds are most restorative when concurrently technical, operational, and representational, when equally material, useful, and figural. Now in this worldview, building, program, and aesthetics are most particular when indiscernible. The second way that I think um, this happens in these works, and maybe more important to this essay, is that both texts appeal time and again to ways of thinking that are deeply combinatorial and composite. Philosophically inspired by coincidencia oppositorium or the coincidence of opposites, false dualisms have no place in these works. Both have little interest in delineating recognizable boundaries between what is nature and what is artifice, what is art and what is building. All endeavors to do so would be misleading and ill-conceived. Now it may be expedient for those who wish to territorialize debates in architectural theory, but staking sharp borders between matter and thought as between locations and enclosures is wholly unhelpful for the work of world building that is architecture. As communicated in the chapter, um, Breathing Walls of Oriented Otherwise, quote, only designers and theorists puzzle over these distinctions, end quote. When speaking of the range of liturgical and spiritual performances that are made possible by sacred rituals and their extended environments of altars, pulpits, baptistries, Oriented otherwise reminds us that, quote, while the separation between built and unbuilt conditions seems so obvious, it is in fact the product of analysis, an outcome of reflection that narrows a fuller and more basic grasp of the situation. Hence, when given in matter, when cited in place, and when lived in time, Architecture does not revel in distinguishing the constructed from the construed, the built from the perceived. It is only the mind that seeks to divide what is indivisible in the lived world. Far beyond what we think, reason, or analyze, we come to know the world, excuse me, we come to know of the world in traveling or in meandering, the edge, the limit, that separates and conjoins locations and enclosures. It is here in the in-between of perpetual becoming that architecture as an embodied art of building manifests concordance in discordance. Now, according to a historian and scholar of Renaissance psychology, uh, Edgar Wynne, quote, it often takes less time to grasp an enigma which is bound up in a knot than to follow a straight argument of indefinite length. Quote. In his 1958 Pagan Mysteries in the Renaissance, Wynne reminds us that many pre-modern works of art anticipated in communicating the ways that nature speaks in coincident opposites. Phrases that we actually heard earlier today, festina lente, making haste slowly, serio ludere, serious play, discordia concours, discord and harmony, and one that is an ongoing interest to architects, the whole in the part, sustain our belief in coincidencia oppositorium. Now, the remainder of this talk considers two coincident opposites inspired by oriented otherwise and surface architecture, both of which seek to restore um, to us to an ethics of building. Now, in the first case, I aim to expand the definition of locations by directing us to an ecologically centered mindfulness grounded in an empathic 
relationship with buildings. And in the second, I return to an idea of enclosures that revalorizes the architect's task in thinking through making and in making through thinking. The first discordant concordance to which I will refer to is that quite simply, buildings are alive in all the same ways we are. In unscripted performances, an essay we encounter in Oriented Otherwise, the reader is invited to enter a world of unlimited empathic possibilities. Here, the built environment is theorized as a field of forces and counterforces, of poise and counterpoise. Like the contraposto in, embodied by Polyclitus's sculpture of Doryphoros that we actually saw yesterday as well, so too buildings are theorized as sites in search of balance and equilibrium. We learn that in the case of buildings, it is by way of, quote, columns and beams, retaining walls and foundations, that the building must work at staying as it is. It must work with ambient conditions such as gravity, winds, sunlight, and so on, end quote. Indeed, we naturally expect all buildings, including this one that's graced um, our activities over the last two days to work in accordance with the laws of gravity in attaining static equilibrium. Doing so, however, buildings also struggle. They actively, quote, work against these forces and suffer their effects, end quote. Now, we can only recall the thesis of another book on, we on weathering the life of buildings in time, which reminds us of the many ways that architecture actively channels a building's transformation over time in the face of natural forces that make and remake the building anew. Continuously refinished by architectural forces, buildings in their environment are constantly at work. And difficult work it is. For according to Oriented Otherwise, no actor on stage ever suffered as much as buildings do. We know all too well that buildings are routinely used and misused. They're added to and altered without concern for their integrity. They're challenged by erosion, be it human, environmental, historical. Even as we speak, tragically, the building fabric of entire cities, as well as the lives they shelter, are being willfully destroyed out of sheer malice. In all these ways, buildings must labor at opposing, at resisting. As oriented otherwise reminds us, a building's capacity and identity become apparent through resistance. Now indeed, in these words right here, I cannot help but hear echoes of 19th century German thinking if we think of Heinrich Hübsch, for example, who argued in 1828 essay in what style should be built for an expanded definition of architectural representation, one in which potentially climate and material availability were recognized as motivating forces in the historical development and formal identity of buildings. Hot and cold sites, dry and wet weather, he believed, contributed to how building elements, details, surfaces, and their figures were made and hence appeared. According to Hübsch, Walls were built very differently if made of hard marble rather than soft tupo, tufo, as in a structure whose, quote, ratio of thickness to height was determined by the resistance of the material to compression and buckling, end quote. Wood, on the other hand, was best used in ceiling spans because of its linear growth pattern and its, quote, resistance to fracture, end quote. To each material, its appropriate location, use, and form. His countryman, Karl Boddicker, developed a somewhat different theory for explaining how building elements were impacted by contingent forces. In his 1846 text, Principles of the Hellenic and Germanic Ways of Building, Boddicker argued that structural forces emanated from within the material in which they were found. Each material corresponded to a law of atomic order, and hence each had its own force and strength. Materials either reacted to forces in tension, fracture, or compression, which were actually manifest in absolute, relative, or reactive strengths. Now, in describing how the union of matter and force was made visible in architectural art forms, 
Boddicker's language was decidedly animated and almost anthropomorphic. Quote, in the unformed state of the material, these forces are dead or latent. The material is aroused and compelled to demonstrate its structural strength once it has been given a form that is appropriate to it, end quote. Now, French architect Jean-Baptiste Rondelet, I couldn't help it, was no less interested in the contingent forces of climate and geography. In his Memoirs sur les progrès de la science, la construction, written in 1802, he identified location-specific rules for building wisely and soundly. Different countries had different climates and access to different materials, and hence contributed to different arts of building. When Rondelet described the various structural elements and woodworking techniques needed in erecting and framing a roof, he identified significant variations in the slopes of Egyptian and Greek and Roman and Parisian buildings. His calculations were meticulous with measures differing in matters of degrees and minutes. Rondelet acknowledged significant regional differences between building with bricks in Persia, France, and the Mediterranean, noting, quote, the soil of Esfahan is a natural clay so that an unbroken ground, excuse me, so that on unbroken ground, no foundations are needed. While unbaked bricks do not, of course, survive in Athens or Rome. His knowledge of building materials through time, through use and in place contributed to a proto-ecological understanding of architecture, one that one may name as, quote, a theory of location. Indeed, for Rondelet, Barker, and Hoopsch, buildings were alive and their lives contingent upon their location. Now, architecture conceived as a dynamic field of forces is precisely the topography of meaning that's made possible by oriented otherwise. A work which returns to theory the possibility that buildings are in fact animated with the same life, the same vitality, and yet the same anguish experienced by us mere mor mortals. Tacitly and literally, architecture labors when resisting its own demise. It does this simply by existing, but it also does this by how it is cited, how it is planned, and how it is built. In Oriented Otherwise, we're reminded that buildings suffer. They experience a form of architectural pathos, David's words that is born of the building's encounter with ever-changing and contingent forces, be they found in higher floodplains, harsher winds, or fiercer despots. Poised and counterpoised, buildings are wed to their environments over time and in a place. They are bound to their location. There emerges the possibility of a form of representation intrinsic to architecture. For when the building identifies itself with its milieu, it becomes something that it is not, and hence it represents. Indeed, when building coincides with what it is not, it, quote, inaugurates precisely the sort of self-negation that is necessary for representation to occur, end quote. Now, to be clear, I suggest that this is not the kind of self-negation associated with the building's physical decay, deterioration or ruin when contemporary building products perform badly or fail. Wastefulness, end of life, and consumption without replenishment are not the condition of self-negation to which I refer. Indeed, materials do not fail. We fail them. We fail them every time we insist on using chemical synthesis to give them life. We fail them every time we rip them from the ground, extract them from the soil, and transport them thousands of miles away. We fail them every time we render them toxic. And we fail them every time we forget their historical and cultural horizons. More to the point, we fail the very idea of materiality when we overlook the fact that buildings simply follow the same path, the same meander, that we do. They recede and even, when, and even when properly tended to. I couldn't help it. They return to the soil from which they were born 
it is only human hubris to think otherwise. This is the ecological vision that I suggest expands our definition of locations to include pre-architectural considerations that quote, buildings live in matter. In the face of tremendous environmental crisis and social anxiety, so empathizing with our built environment might return to the discipline much needed relevance. Now I'm gonna speed up a little um, and I'm, I'll just uh, end with enclosure. Earlier in this essay, I promised to offer a demonstration of theory that thinks through making, and I suggest this is wholly possible with the return to surface architecture. Here, projects in the architectural canon of 20th century modernism are edified by the art of thick descriptions. Here, detailed readings of architectural facades are for much needed insights into the art of building, a material art that is composite and combinatorial. Let me demonstrate how. Now, to be sure, the building envelope has remained a much contested site of signification for decades. Surface architecture demonstrates just how seriously our discursive ability to theorize the facade has suffered at the hands of postmodernism and structuralism. Now, it does this, however, not by way of critical theory or by referencing discourses in anthropology, geography, or political theory. It does this by deploying the art of interpretation as David said yesterday, of thinking in things, an art that I would say is natural to architecture. Inspired by Gottfried Semper's naming of the vertical enclosure as the architectonic element most given to the dual experience of presence and essence, surface architecture characterizes the building facade as the site tasked with reconciling opposites that are building production and architectural representation. And hence, it is the site of our final coincidentia oppositorium. Echoing Frampton's pairing in his own work, Tectonic Culture, in which representation is placed in opposition to ontology, surface architecture seizes an important opportunity to rearticulate what facades might mean in the context, in the larger context of building. In this, it challenges theoretically the somewhat terrifying intellectual abyss that persists between the how and the why of architectural production and appearances. In this gap, we're asked to ponder why technologies that are used to build architectural surfaces are rarely considered discursively, notwithstanding the representational capacities, and why ideas that inspire architectural figuration are seldom subtended by the knowledge of materials of which they are built. The question, this is David's question, therefore concerns the alternatives to this division between production and representation. How can design utilize the opportunities of current industrial production so that the practice of architectural representation is neither independent of nor subjugated to the domination of technology, end quote. Surface architecture dedicates its full attention to resolving this question and to indicating a way forward addressing an earnest, quote, the contested relationship between expression and technology, end quote. To the end, it argues that, quote, the commonplace task of covering, dressing, or cladding an architectural construction is a particularly clear example of the conflict between representation and production in our time, end quote. Now, with the care of literary craftsmen, its authors give voice to the material and representational passions of architects as the verses Berlage, Kahn, Le Corbusier, sorry, Albert Kahn, Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, Richard Neutra, and Jean Prouvet. In the case of Neutra, we're reminded of an architect whose combinatorial vision at times dissimulated material reality as when he painted wood window frames at the VDL house with metallic paint to suggest that they were made of aluminum, it's David's words, while at others was entirely adept at inventing and prototyping complex material systems. Alternatively, in the case of Dutch master Berlage, his built work is interpreted by David in the context of Impressionism. The Holland House facade in London is described by enlisting the language of light, color, to attribute to composition the power of construction. And in the case of Le Corbusier, it's the balcony that's theorized as the privileged site for 20th century return to architecture parlante in its function as both separator and not, container and release valve, 
the balcony embodies multiplicity, interstitiality, and unity in difference. Indeed, Le Corbusier's balconies remind us that in the art of building, it's impossible to think in terms of either or. In this example and, and in others, surface architecture engages in forms of combinatorial thinking that demonstrate how things are often more than they appear, cultivating architectural thoughts at the threshold of both and and community. Now indeed, enclosures are far more than that. Enclosures are surfaces of exchange, of transference, of mediation. They're also willing and unwilling points of entry of humans, of air, of water, of birds. And with every opening of a window and with every movement of a sunshade, with every prospect viewed, the building's skin as enclosure performs materially, environmentally, and representationally. Now every um, ever faithful at reconciling intellectual divides, surface architecture actualizes the art of interpretation by offering us three important gifts. First, the gift of a theory that sees deeply, reads closely, and thinks empathically, empathetically, sorry. The second is the return to a practice of composite thinking that is both tectonic and atectonic, constructed and figured. And the third is its willingness to engage with the ethical capacity of thinking while making. So in conclusion, in this essay, I've sought to argue that orienting architecture otherwise and thinking in the depth of the surface may seem contrarian notions, yet it's precisely in these moments of seeming discordance made visible by David and his writings that we are offered important glimpses of hope that is needed in ensuring architecture's relevancy in the 21st century and in delivering a practice of architectural theory that valorizes the architect's task in thinking through making. That we can do so is thanks to David. Thank you, David. Thank you, Franca. Um, our last uh, speaker is Carlos Eduardo Comas. Um, Carlos is, comes to us from the, university, the Universidad Federal de Rio Grande do Sol. Um, he studied architecture in Port Al Algre, University Federal de Rio Grande do Sol, Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania, and Paris, uh, U University of Paris, Saint Denis and has written and lectured extensively on modern architecture and urbanism with particular attention to Brazilian, Latin, American works. He is Professor Emeritus at the Universidad, Universidad Federal do Grande do Sol and a permanent professor of its graduate program in architecture. A former president of Doco Momo Brazil, and um, ANPARC, Brazilian's National Association of Graduate Architecture Programs. He's currently a um, member of the advisory board of um, IFAM, American National, uh, Brazil's National Heritage, and a senior uh, researcher in CNPQ, Brazil's National Research Council. Distinctions include the 2017 Philip Johnson Award from the Society of Architectural Historians for Latin America in Construction, Architecture 1955 to 1980 the catalog he co-edited and co-authored of an exhibition he co-curated and the uh, 2018 Primo Fad de Pen Pensamiento y Critica from the Iberian Association Fon Fomento de la Art y Diseño for Le Cabousier, the, uh, the Recarche Patente, 50 years later, to which he contributed a major at essay. And his talk is titled Uncommon Ground. <clears throat> Please.
I suppose. Okay. It's great being here. Um, <clears throat> a fast shrift, I'm told, is an offer, is an offering. Mine is a modest commentary on a device that uncommon ground does not address directly. Namely, the piloty so fundamental for Le Corbusier, whom David recognized elsewhere as a champion of historically grounded modernism, and his Brazilian disciples, whose work David has visited, studied, appreciated, and written about, Lucio Costa and company. Piloty is a French word meaning a set of piles raising a building up from unstable ground. Le Corbusier admired the Neolithic pile houses in the lakes of his natal Switzerland. His original, broadly functionalist argument for houses on pilotis stressed healthier dwelling conditions and the recovery and the recovery of built up terrain. The second of six points, it is less developed than the others, but all said to be the result of a quest for pure technique. The piloty became, sorry, the piloty became the first of the five points of the newer architecture, the cornice duly forgotten. Load, load burying walls no longer paralyze plants, Corbus says. The piloty lightens the raised architectural volume, frees space for circulation, frames the surrounding buildings or landscape. Outdoors flow into indoors, immediately transparency assured. Drawings show the piloty as part of an independent structural frame, linking it with the domino scheme of 1915 and it is cantilevered flat plate floor slabs. Greenery on the roof is said to be one that in the piloty is a reconquer but shares location with the car. Corbu knew that piloty has the same root as pilot, pilota, pilot, piloto, or meaning someone who guides or directs a course of action. The prehistoric aura odds, adds to the technophile argument and intimates savagery and innocence. The free plan updates the game played by antique columns and walls with a twist. Modern columns may be not only freestanding or engaged, but also juxtaposed to walls right before or behind. Hypostyle hall or gallery, the piloty reverses the classic podium. It accepts the classical separation of the piano nobili from the ground, but interprets this separation in terms of voids rather than mass. Concurrently, it recalls vernacular refinement, Turkish yalis and kiosks. The base in a tripartite elevation crowned by the rooftop guard, the body of the building at least slightly cantilevered to free the facades, the piloty foreground, a secondary compositional strategy recalling erudite refinement as well. Classical and classic, Compositionally related to arcaded buildings everywhere, the piloty lineage includes Venice's Palazzo Ducale, Rome's Palazzo di Campidoglio. The argument is formalist and historical, but precedent is emulated rather than replicated. Arcades, arcades stress vertical continuity and the horizontal discontinuity between open but roofed open space and totally open space. The flat underside of the slab stresses horizontal, horizontal continuity and vertical discontinuity on Via Letage in Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier looked to his master Perret for modern colossal columns. Exposed beans should be credited to Russian engineers. Feeding on old associations between column, tree, and the human body, <clears throat> the argument is phytomorphic and anthropomorphic too. 
modern architecture compared to a smart girl with no makeup and spindly legs. It is epistemic too, the body of the modern building being a cantilevered box. The body of the building, of the modern building being a cantilevered box, the PLOT reveals the enclosed, uh, <clears throat> the PLOT reveals the supporting structure of that box. It will usually contain an enclosed staircase, <clears throat> which can be glazed for mediated transparency. If walls run partly before or partly behind, or partly behind columns, so much the better for displaying the free plan. All the same, the pillow team may be fully enclosed by mostly blank walls. Otherwise, a single freestanding column is enough to evidence structure externally. Piloti, the word becomes short for at least a single exposed ground floor column, signaling an independent skeleton. But it may also correspond to an intermediary ground floor in a hillside, as in the apartment building where some breakers was introduced. Otherwise, the pilotee may just hold a tray that receives another structure, as in the pavilion with an expanded base, true to the um, original idea of the pilotee. Now, Le Corbusier is vague about the use of the open pilotee. He presents it as shelter, a new element for living, garage for cars, parking protected from sun and rain, playing ground. In practice, until the mid thirties, his open pilotee comes into flavors. In ideal city plans, roads on pilotee replace streets, while the pilotee under building Zahadon shelters pedestrian circulation and unspecified activities. These presumably include teenagers hanging out and casual encounters between adults besides children's playing, park, parking courts are adjacent. In real life, commissions and competition entries, the panorama is more complex. Pressures for ground floor occupation being manifold. Economics do not favor idle space or idle looking space. A peristyle or pilotee convinces a covered driveway at Villa Savoie, number four, and walkway at Maison Bezo, number three. Villa Stein's pilotee, number two, is enclosed. The open pilotee at Maison La Roche, one, does not make much sense to my eyes. Beneath the curving salon, it looks residual, the showy yet shadowy half of the front garden cut off from the house's life. The situation at Maison Cook is hardly better. The open pilotee extends between a party wall and an opaque staircase sheltering the front door, but fails to reach the rear service entrance. It's not inviting, though two set chairs in a photo try to suggest a porch. As for Maison Luchet, they have uncovered entrance stairs alongside the open pilotis, which Le Corbusier notes may shelter bricolage or the washing and drying of clothes. This is sensible, but the connection between pilotis and house proper is a nuisance in bad weather. The exceptional pilotis of the mid rise Swiss pavilion is forceful enough in form a muscular portico made up by muscular columns. It dispenses the chairs fronting each other awkwardly in another photo of the benches would suit the situation just fine if between the columns to face the internal lawn of the Cité Universitaire. In the institutional designs of the 1930, the open pilotis is primarily a vehicular domain interspersed with primarily glazed foyers demanded by program and temporary, and temperate climate. The pilotis of one Zla building 
shows a sequence of se seven elements with voids at the extremities. The pilotis of uh, another shows a sequence of five elements with solids at the extremities. All voids are distinct to cars, the stimulus configure hyperstyle halls and gallery. Two of the five points, as well as some breakers, were easily relatable to Brazilian precedents. Timber pile structures were found in Indian dwellings along Amazonian rivers. Piloti supported waterland dub structures in the Hili and Gold Ridge state of Minas Gerais in the 18th century. The analogy between waterland dub and reinforced concrete was duly noted. Most 19th century plantation houses near Rio had galleries, had galleries with square uh, Tuscan columns defining an horizontal opening. The U-shaped courtyard house and the chapel formed a walled compound separate from the fields. Wooden pile houses were a common type in the Amazon and the Atlantic seaboard. Costa and Niemeyer explored the potential of the domestic piloti in designs for narrow urban lots that pay attention to a smooth progression from openness to open piloti to enclosure and vice versa, a double piloti. The T-shaped plan defines two courts and animates serial repetition. As for inter three is at the same time, three institutional designs pit Costa against Le Corbusier, first alone, then teaming with Niemeyer, Rady, Moreira, and others. The semi detached houses for the Molevad Company town competition are Costa's answer to Maison Luchet, emulating the Swiss pavilion. The reinforced concrete piloti holds a floor slab supporting waterland dub selves. The interiorized stairs ensure a smooth transition between the piloti and the enclosed upper stock. The second is uh, the Rio's University City. It seems Costas wanted to build Rio's University City on pilotis in a lake in the southern sector of Rio. Slightly more realist, consultant Le Corbusier's proposal for a campus by the old Imperial Palace features roads on pilotis doubling as covered walkways. Schools are mid-rise lab buildings over expanded bases, minimizing the open piloti. Costa and team's counter proposal has roads on ground and the standard school has a low rise lab building on an open pilotis accommodating pedestrian circulation, socialization and recreation, no cars allowed. This lab is part of a patio layout with low wings for workshops and garages, a mock building scheme avant la lettre. The third and most important is Rio's Ministry of Education and Public Health, who had, uh, which had a whole square block in Castello, a downtown expansion obeying city beautiful rules. Uh, C is the uh, <coughs> square site that uh, the ministry owned, and B is the seaside for which Le Corbusier was to, was to make uh, another proposal. Cost and teams, um, sorry. The Costa team's first design is symmetrical and U-shaped. Two meterized wings on open piloti double as marquees for pedestrian access to a taller slab across the site. A pot cocher between the wings in an opposite auditorium atop the municipal garage at the cruciform detail. An alley carved between the slab and the garage leads to the, minister, to the minister's entrance. 
Le Corbusier's alternative scheme for a seaside site spreads the wings and uses their pilotis for parking. The party is cruciform, facing the sea. A gallery on an open pilotis juts out from the stretched slab. Slightly off center, it is on axis with the auditorium and the slabs of opposite side. As earlier, there is a garage under the auditorium and an alley crossing it. Auditorium and gallery adjoin the vestibule, a solid between two voids, also glazed at the front and rear. Oddly, the gallery does not roof, does not roof the public entrance right beside. Moreover, Kobu wants the base to encompass the gallery. So the large, so the ladders, short sides, exterior is rancy like colossal columns, <clears throat> while blank walls atop the elongated slabs piloty flank the gallery, wasting the sea with view. That was the pretext for changing the site. A second proposal for Castello, done two days before departure, repeats the same mistakes and open a layer of palm trees beside an open piloty for, um, for um, pedestrian. Uh, there is bad orientation of the slab buildings, which faces away from the existing institutional buildings and away from the built up section of the downtown. The ministerial garage and entrance remain under the auditorium, first intended partly for parking, then uh, purely pedestrian. So, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> then for the Castello site without Le Corbusier, the final design is to shape it. The main slab reverts to its original position. Its piloty is now 10 meter high. The staff vestibule at the, low, at the loose end leaves uh, outer colossal, colossal columns exposed. The public and the ministerial vestibules stretch between the gallery and the auditorium. Colossal columns help a central one-story high colonnade to carry the gallery and support the lateral accesses to the auditorium, creating the illusion of a single low block along the street alignment. The ministerial garage and entrance remain under the auditorium, first intended partly for parking, then purely pedestrian, the low piloty under the gallery allows diagonal shortcuts and accommodates events such as concerts and exhibitions. The ground is an active element of composition for a granite carpet crosses the tall piloty and planted bands about the staff vestibule at either side. The photograph does not really show you the difference in tone because this esplanade is really gray, light gray, and the uh, paving uh, between the um, planted beds is white, is uh, white Portuguese stone, the same Portuguese stone that covers the um, walkways, no, the sidewalks. Also, good for it. This is planted beds, the exposed columns, the five uh, bays that define the central portico and uh, the um, auditorium. The colossal columns. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, what I wanted to say before is that the T-shaped part T is seen and, and experienced as an H-shaped with two four coats linked as a single esplanade. 
and uh, the, some breakers are monumental in the north facade. And this is a, a, a quite recent photograph where you can see the, uh, the trees uh, that have risen, uh, that have grown and that uh, actually balance uh, the, the gallery wing. Yet the pilotis featuring a void between two solids crossed by a public route, uh, colossal columns and, and a symmetry balanced composition, a symmetrical balanced composition had appeared earlier than the first miniature design in Marcello and Milton Roberto's winning entry for the headquarters of ABI, the Brazilian Press Association, on a small L-shaped corner lot in a block next to the ministry. By law, a perimeter block with parking in the inner courtyard. A minimal cantilever combines with a double height open pilote that extends the sidewalk and shelters both the vehicular access to the parking courtyard and the building's vestibule, controlled by an initiate front desk and leading directly to the elevators. And you see this. Okay. Defining engaged colossal columns, shops with mezzanines flank the open pilotis, one rectangular, three enclosed by curved walls for efficient handling of space. Those are oblong uh, column with window walls facing the shops with the mezzanine. The Roberto's designed other mid-rises in Castello before World War II ended. The LBT building extends over the sidewalk, combining the mandatory public gallery with an ABI type open vestibule, but this time a recess rather than a void. The IRB building occupies its narrow three-cornered site entirely, offering at the tip a fully open mezzanine level vestibule surrounded at distance by outer colossal colonnades. The Santos Dumont Airport, which is illustrated, stands on landfill next to Castello. It's a long slide building with offices that sit atop a double high cruciform concourse bordered by shops or offices with mezzanines behind colossal columns. But colossal columns are three story high facing the airfield and two story high facing the street. There are no doors at the main street entrance and sliding doors opposite gave access to and from the airfield originally. So that is vast squarish main concourse on occasion turns into an open piloty for pedestrian and baggage carts. Meanwhile, the ministry architects kept designing. Costa and Niemeyer worked together in the Brazil Pavilion at the New York World's Fair of 1939. An L-shaped pavilion at a cornered lot is two started and still framed. Cantilevers define horizontally stratified, horizontally stratified um, street and avenue facades with a covered ramp on the forecourt leading to a terrace between the seniors main gallery and the trapezoidal auditorium. At is another instance of the void between two solids traversed by a public road as a rectilinear stairs linked to race and the garden between the curvilinear and the straight wings of the pavilion. A colossal colonnade gives monumental overtones to the gallery as seen from the garden, whereas the auditorium appears as an independent volume sitting atop the floor slab. At the ground floor, a mostly curvilinear enclosed restaurant is set back from the street's cantilever's edge 
but hides some of the external columns, just like the curving freestanding walls hiding the coffee bar at the corner. The part is part of the open piloti, also used as exhibition space between forecourt and garden, like a market set in a small square. The so far unusual hiding out of outer columns in the cantilever both stresses the ground floor's porosity and suggests the suppression of a facade plane. The casual, the casual, no, no, sorry. Uh, no, we're moving to another project. And uh, if uh, the column, the column uh, was steel and with uh, clad in uh, into an hourglass section, metal sheet in the pavilion, and if it was clad in granite at the uh, ministry, it is now a square pillar painted brown in this uh, um, uh, preserved historic city in Minas Gerais. And, uh, and that's, you have uh, a photo of the, um, sorry, can I have a glass of water? Okay. okay. Okay, this project was actually a counter proposal to a first design. Oh, thank you. <laughs> by a first design by another member of the MASP team. <clears throat> so this is a, 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 a sloping street that links the palace of the governors at the main plaza on the top of the hill with the Casa dos Contos, which is this uh, squarish building here, and which was uh, the 18th century treasury. So it was a very important building. So the first proposal for this hotel takes the queue from the Casa dos Contos, and it's, uh, 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 you can see uh, the amount of retaining walls that in the, in the uh, sheer quantity of uh, earth uh, cut and fill that was necessary in order to implement the building in that position. So the counter proposal, which is this one by Niemeyer, uh, uh, is very theatrical in a rustic way that befits the hilly terrain in a historic context, uh, which looks like a, a broken stone uh, seen from the street with protrusions and recesses defining private over public uh, quarters, restaurant to one end, reception to the other. In the preceding photograph, uh, you saw the balcony of the restaurant in, uh, in the um, right uh, bottom and the ramp that led to the reception desk at the opposite end. Here you have, uh, uh, here you have one um, view stressing the difference in approach from each other. This is with the in the, uh, instead of the Casa dos Contos. And uh, in that other photo, you see the connection between this building and the other. Uh, this building was a monument in a way. This was a, a, is going to be the uh, Grand Hotel that uh, was going to uh, cater to the tourist trade uh, of the city. And so its importance is we in a way similar uh, to the importance of both the palace and uh, one of the several churches that exist in, um, in Ouro Preto. No? Um, okay. okay, it's a uh, different, you know, the very strong opposition between uh, back and front. 
much as uh, we've seen in the ministry and in the uh, in the pavilion uh, and uh, the uh, PLT, the corners of the PLT uh, may uh, the central section you know is two story high and the right section is almost five uh, stories, no, four stories, okay? And this is one of the reasons why the Niemeyer building was preferred because actually uh, the way uh, he uh, appropriated the site with, was a minimum uh, cut and fill in relationship with uh, the uh, uh, earthworks that were demanded by the neo-colonial scheme. So uh, it was part of a demonstration of technical efficiency in terms of preserving the site. And uh, that photo is also important because the idea of uh, this uh, central section, which I have been calling the point of the solids, is a different site. It's the portico of the hotel, which is on the axis with this retaining wall that are also part of the earth is part of the composition, it's actually uh first part composition because there was there is a plain ground on the other side. The section here is two stories, one story. So it's the same thing, different uh, uh different form. <laughs> okay, so those are another views. Okay, so those are service quarters. The car can get into the site which he couldn't, which it couldn't in the uh, city scheme. Okay. And uh, the second hotel, and even more rustic and very small, is in a uh, mountain town uh, near Rio, the Friburgo Hotel by Lucio Costa. Which actually I can you know, say nothing. Just ask you to read the photographs. This is the entrance facade. So when you drive by, you see first the garden facade, then you make a new turn, and then you get into the facade, into the entrance facade, which is much more uh, full of protuberances. And this is just an open space. In the veranda, which also configures another apparition of these solid uh, void between two solids schemes. And you can have see the plan. This is open session. As in the other projects, uh, the pedestrian route, the uh, marsh, the architecture of the veranda is always extremely. Uh, Carefully choreographed. In each case, it's a very small hotel. You get this and you advise you to make a series of U uh, turns so that uh, it really expands uh, the space and you get also a much slower view of the um, of the um, of the um, architecture, but also a feeling of your body appreciating architecture as it moves. Okay, two residential complexes. This is Lucio Parquini Apartments. Uh, three of them were uh, um, built according to design. <clears throat> three different pilotiers. One almost enclosed by shops, one that is half and half, and one that is a totally open pilotis in the uh, uh, following, let's say, uh, the uh, corpse preferred uh, uh, layout. Okay. They make a one sided street along the park. It is the building, uh, the first building, the one that completes the existing street. Then uh, photos 
of the interior. Vegetation, landscaping uh, are used to make this open pilote uh, uh, and enclose it, a semi-enclosed plate, so that, you know, vegetation is used as a building material, if I can say so. The length of each block is more or less 80 meters. It's a reasonably urban block. Garages are uh, underground from the point of view of the um, street and um, on ground uh, from the back. You can see the piloti as an in intermediary floor between the base of the building, the actual base of the building and the, and the body of the building. And this is the very well-known Pedregulho. This is an aerial view. It's to almost 400 meters long. Okay, the pillage is uh, the intermediary type. You can see the see through. And this is also double pillage because you have a pillage on the level of the entrance and another pillage on the level of the terrain. Okay. And this is in this uh, very long uh, slab from uh, uh, now and then, you have all the public facilities of the uh, state, okay. And three uh, images of uh, buildings that weren't built for my hometown are also showing a totally enclosed pilot with the exposed columns forming uh, the base a colossal kind of base. This is an, a hospital. So, and this is the very interesting uh, headquarters for the uh, Rio Grande do Sul railways. Okay, so now I've made a very more or less long, um, let's see if I can read. Uh, when you look at all those examples together, you can, you can see a diversity of sites, flat and hilly, from small lot to macro lot, whole block, super block, even district, if you think of the university campi, uh, a diversity of programs from uh, monumental uh, to domestic, uh, representative, representative to utilitarian, for people rich and for people poor, uh, you have a diversity of materials, uh, concrete, wood, steel, mud, all dealt with the resources of a coherent architectural system. It's modernity, mood, uh, to disciplinary constants, irrespective of the size and the scale of the problems and their architectural solutions. I guess there are two themes admitting many variations, the hypostyle hall and the hypostyle gallery in connection with street and square, line and circle. They play associated with the compositional activation of the whole site and its ground. So that with the piloty as a mediating device, built form and open space became an unit. I think this is quite important. This is the idea of the wall, the compound in a way. And this uh, suggests, uh, this uh, tells me that uh, a spatial progression and sequence of set opposition. On the one hand, the Brazilians were not subservient either to the city beautiful or to the functional city of Siam. Uh, they suggest a city of Kazai corridors and Kazai includes it blocks. On the other hand, they understand perfectly the distinction made by French academician Catherine de Cancy between type and model, between the topological scheme materialized in many geometries versus the exact copy. Standardization, yes, for this, no. no. Uh, you have uh, as insistent uh, two types, but have been uh, uh, calling uh, the void uh, through uh, 
two solids, uh, even if when they are glazed, you know, it is traversed by a public route. And certainly a descendant of the Brazil Pavilion is the Carpenter Center in Cambridge, no doubt about that. No, uh, and you have the other solution which is to concentrate the vestibule no, and the staircase, the circulation in, in accord with the extremities open. So that you have one scheme that is uh, one scheme that is porous that is permeable, that you can go and walk through uh, and uh, which can link uh, places with the same kind of intensity as in uh, the Ministry uh, of Education, and it can link places with, uh, uh, with different uh, atmospheres, different uh, 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 use characteristics. But the in the sense is always working with the same uh, topology. Uh, what else? One scheme is uh, uh, one scheme is porous. The other is is uh, closed at the center. No, so I would say that one is like a, a propylene or a gate, no? while the other is more like a bastion and a tower. I'm not making any judgment of value about the schemes, what I'm telling you is really, you know, the diversity and how types enter, architectural types, all types, uh, enter into a concert, you know, with uh, a given system of construction uh, and a given situation, a given building site, a given location. Uh, and uh, also, in all the examples, uh, even if I don't have the right photographs, well, I can tell you that uh, uh, the, uh, even when the ground is reduced to um, minimal uh, depth, uh, it, it acts as a stylobate and paving and landscaping are both you know, building materials. Uh, so there is no, no. Uh, in, in that sense, it's another way of doing exactly what uh, uh, David's quotation was was telling uh, before. Uh, okay. Uh, well, that's what I more or less what I was scrabbling. You know. So. Um, the Brazilians did this in full. Uh, understanding, in full understanding uh, of, no, sorry, this thing isn't bad. And actually, I think that there are two recent examples by Brazilian architects in Europe, in Europe that uh, testify to the vitality of this thing of thinking. This is SBPR, which actually the principal is Angelo Butti, which is, who is a guy who's uh, fairly well known in uh, the States. This is in Lugano, Switzerland. And uh, I love the, the way the building also uh, enters, in, uh, part, uh, enters in collaboration from uh, the urban point with the old, uh, with the different buildings in its vicinity. Uh, okay. And the other is in Monaco, is I Weinfeld is uh, an architect in uh, his uh, early 60s. Uh, this is La Petite Afrique uh, building in Monaco. It's uh, a super, super, super rich uh, address, you know. But this, in a way, this is a kind of the, uh, the realization um, where in every floor is a pilotee. You know, it's like uh, the demonstration uh, that uh, actually uh, Le Corbusier's piloti didn't stay uh, at the ground. Then you have the photo of the uh, of one of the apartments. Uh, you see the Mediterranean in the horizon. <sighs> okay, I think that the Brazilians understood perfectly. Okay, what. Uh, what uh, uh, what uh, what the, the Brazilians had full understanding of the Corbusian points and all 
of the between the lines. They sympathized with the Corbusian impulse to flee the earth and fly to outer space, challenging gravity, but they begged to disagree with the black and white antagonism of the Corbusian polemics. They were aware of the fate of Icarus, who came too close to the sun, and that of his father Daedalus, who built labyrinths for monsters. And they did not buy the idea that pilotes are acupuncture, acupuncture needles light in the ground. Actually, they don't buy that idea. They see them as they really are, which is love, clubs, bringing violence into the scene, as Hannah Arendt argued and Ananarad was evoked in this uh, room uh, before, uh, a building site is always a violation of the world as it was. In order to have a lasting world fit for human inhabitation, in order to nurture a common ground, I think that we have to accept the cutting of the umbilical cord and stand up like Piloti, like David. Okay, so uh, so we're ready for our our round table, but first we've got um, we're going to be joined by uh, Professor Alberto Perez Gomez, who um, you all know, um, and he's going to offer um, some interpretive thoughts on the content that you've just heard. So I'll leave it to you, Alberto. Thank you very much, Marcia. It's always a, an impossible job, you know, <laughs> but, but I think maybe I can offer just very brief comments because as usual, we're a little late according to your schedule uh, and perhaps I can get your, uh, your round table going. I'll just say that I think this is a remarkable uh, offering that uh, testifies to the richness of uh, David's uh, uh, work uh, as a teacher as, uh, as a writer, uh, the, the, the diversity of the positions and interests uh, and passions that uh, I have had the pleasure to listen to this afternoon. Uh, it's really remarkable. Uh, I have, you know, very little of substance to, to add. I, I enjoyed thoroughly uh, each one of the presentations, maybe a couple of remarks. I am... Uh, fascinated. I don't think I've ever met uh, Anne uh, personally. I have, I know other people uh, from, from Copenhagen. Uh, I've been involved in some PhD defenses and, but I don't think we've ever met. I, I knew about her interests in, 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 uh, in materials and tectonics. And I, I did not actually or originally recognize the, the, the genealogy of the work. So for me, it's been very interesting to hear how she connects her own interests to her passing through through pen and her um, education with the, with the, through well through David's uh, positions, particularly about this issue of tectonics, which of course is only one aspect of, of the, the the incredible richness of um, of um, of David's uh, writings. I, I like very, very much the way that, that uh, the, the, the interpretation of traditional materials is taken to face uh, contemporary conditions while acknowledging, I guess, what we find, what we've learned from Heidegger. I mean, we are all in a way in the same boat. We come from the phenomenological uh, tradition. This all has resonances where that go, uh, you know, back to Husserl Heidegger about the, the capacity of technopoesis to, to reveal 
but to do this under contemporary conditions, I find this very fascinating. Uh, learning from, from history to solve this uh, uh, crisis that we face today is, in my opinion, the best way to go. I mean, there are many other aspects that I, I guess and uh, 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 the that for an are tacit, because this is of course one aspect of the architectural problem. Uh, but I find this this uh, presentation incredibly, incredibly interesting. Peter, as usual, Peter, I know much better. <laughs> we go we go back, and and I always loved his uh, meandering uh, 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 way of uh, of dealing with uh, with with issues in architecture. I had a little bit of a problem with the audio, so I probably missed one, one word in five. You know, it's, it's a little, I am really sorry. I don't know if it's Peter's fault or if it's my computer, but I have to confess that. So, so, so I may be missing something. I love the, if I understand correctly, uh, the way he takes the question of topography from, uh, from, from uh, David's work and opens up Op opens it to disclose both its problemat problematic uh, pot pot this pro potential uh, uh, problematic condition by really uh, naming the question of topography as being separate from the question of place, which I think is really the issue. Like, if I understand properly what 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 is uh, what was at stake, is that. Uh, if we take from Heidegger and particularly our friends, Heideggerian philosophers like Edward Casey and Jeff Malpas, the, the, the position that place is primary for human being and that it comes with, well, particularly in the case of Malpas, that it is articulated with language, with speech. Uh, the, the, the question of topography uh, is tricky because topography, of course, is the writing or the drawing of, of place. And the way that, that, uh, that David, of course, presents it in his book is really, to me, very resonant with this question of uh, the conditions of existential place, all these categories that, 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 that Peter uh, showed in his lecture in the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the presentation. Um, but of course, the paradox is, is what happens when one has to represent place, right? Because of course, the, the, the presence of place is, a, is this fundamental philosophical problem, issue, a pre-given, a, a condition of being. But when we represent it, the nature of the representation is really what is at stake. And that's, I think, what the conversation was about, you know, ranging from, from Rousseau to, uh, to modern representation, to the representation of place in, in Mayan iconography or wherever, you know, I, I, the, this, this, the, the, what I guess really moved me most intensely, something that I recognize very, very clearly through my own work is uh, the moment that it becomes clear that, that geometry uh, could be the matter of dreams, the way that, that Le Corbusier uh, re retrieves this possibility from something which is archaic. If you know, taking it from Husserl, from the origins of geometry, that that in 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 the beginning of the human experience, geometry was indeed the matter of dreams, and this is precisely why geometry is associated with architecture because it has to do with this uh, with this condition. Um, and which we have perverted really after Galileo, where, where, where we don't, we, you know, we cannot see it very clearly. Um, and that Le Corbusier recovers. For me, this is uh, perhaps the, the most important uh, thing that I take away from, from, from Peter's uh, uh, conversation and how that of course connects to the possibility of, of bringing back the presence of place through topography which would be, of course, the issue of architecture, the way that, that David uh, talks about uh, in one of his other books, I, I, I don't recall right now, that, that the architecture represents the, modern, the moment that it is in continuity with, with place, uh, with, with, with its topography. 
And, and this, this continuity for me is one of the most fundamental questions that is a problem in a lot of contemporary practices that is, of course, oblivious to this primacy of place that, of course, for, for, for David is articulated as the topographic problem, the problem of the topographic arts. So anyhow, I, find, I found the whole conversation, and particularly the richness, the texture of the, of the presentation, very beautiful. Peter, I enjoyed it very much. I, I wish I, I could catch it all and I could read it. Franca, with her amazing articulateness, which I remember from when I had the pleasure of having her here at McGill, uh, because she's remarkably articulate. Uh, 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 I, you know, make me uh, fear for our life. I mean, the anxiety uh, uh, that we all feel, by the way, because I think, it, I think it's not only you, Franca, uh, also we dinosaurs that somehow believe in the, in the discipline of architecture have exactly the same experience of anxiety that you articulated so beautifully. So bravo for that. You know, but, but I don't, I, I really believe that the, the struggle, and I think you, you try to say that this is precisely what is opened up through uh, David's work, precisely by making the discipline open, open to so many other things, right? That invites these questions of, uh, of, uh, of sustainability, of ecological crisis, et cetera, et cetera. It's absolutely true. I mean, I, I don't deny that, but I, 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 perceive just in your expression, a kind of skepticism about this problem. It's like somehow, yes, <laughs> it's possible to speak about those terms, but the problems are so big that maybe it's not even worth to doing it. And of course you confessed it, you know, in the beginning. I, I, I find that, uh, well, it's, it's of course, I share your anguish, it saddens me, but I have to tell you, I mean, uh, David and I, we, 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 we were together in Tel Aviv not so long ago. It's one of the last times we were together. And one of the issues, I mean, we were invited there precisely to try to articulate what was the disciplinary range of architecture because, the, because research around architecture has become so, so uh, insanely ridiculous that people are looking at everything around it, but not the discipline. And I would say that, that in your generation, this is something that perhaps one has to deal with. It's curious that you know, you, you're talking about coincidencia oppositorum, which is of course the, the, the classical term that names how the work of art means as an emotional experience, because we don't understand the contradiction of opposites intellectually, but we understand in our heart that the two things come together in our heart. You can never resolve it intellectually. And this is precisely what architecture has always given us. Always. That dis discipline that maybe you are suspicious about uh, is precisely what it gives us. Precisely this possibility of understanding ourselves as complete through a coincidence of opposites. So anyhow, this is, uh, of course, complicated. And I, of course, understand the dilemma, you know, social issues, gender issues, all that stuff. Huh? But, uh, but architecture is a discipline. And, uh, and I think ultimately it has to do with the spiritual health of humanity, spiritual health of humanity, you know, which cannot be reduced to all, even if the world goes to hell, or we can, you know, save its, uh, save the possibilities of shelter, that will never be enough. And finally, I, of course, appreciated uh, our friend Komash, who was so kind of us. Uh, in fact, I was with David again in South America when I met uh, Komas uh, in Porto Alegre. He was very, very kind, uh, taking us around and showing us. And I really appreciated this, this uh, trip through the, the idiosyncrasies of the piloti in, in Brazilian architecture. I, of course, in my own experience, I completely agree. I, I found the, 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 the way that Brazilian archi architects uh, in, in, the, in the 20th century, particularly, of course, you know, the, the, in, the, in the wake of Corb, interpreted uh, the question of modernity so joyful, so ludic, 
that uh, that uh, that is absolutely you know incom incomparable with with Cor himself. So I, I completely take that in my own in, you know my own memory. If I can add a memory just to finish uh, visiting the Ministry of Education in uh, in Rio de Janeiro uh, with some friends, we we managed to. Of course, we walked in the in the beautiful in this uh, space lifted that you showed us in your presentation, and then we were uh, uh, we were lucky enough to be able to make it to the roof, go out into the into the roof. That is an amazing terrace. I'm sure you know it very well, and I was very moved by the by the way that 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 the roof when you look down frames this beautiful garden by, by Roberto uh, Burle Marx uh, that, you know, it's this kind of hedges that, that remind us of Hans Arp that make my heart sing. So it's, it's completely different from, from uh, the, 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 the stiffness of the principles of early Korb. I mean, Korb, in fact, probably matures uh, at the end of his life to become a little bit closer to what these connections between between uh, uh, environment and architecture always revealed to me in Brazilian architecture. Anyhow, so that's my five cents worth. Thank you very much to all of you. And again, uh, David, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. My doctor really did not uh, uh, advise that I travel. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I I'm actually trying to cut back on travel also uh, ethically for the planet because I have the same concerns as. Franca. So I decided that I would just congratulate you from here. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Um, we are going to have a quick, maybe five minute round table. Um, um, so if everybody would, would like to come up here and we could, you could comment um, on, on the comments that um, Alberto made. Um, and um, we could, um, have some questions if anyone has questions or comments. Uh, oh, did some uh, wait? Oh, yeah, I'll wait for Anne to come. What? Okay, so why don't we start? Peter, do you have any any comments or or ans uh, uh, comments to uh, to what Alberto has said? And you're you're muted. I mean, you should unmute, please. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> no, I, I thought he was very generous, <clears throat> and I'm uh, <laughs> I'm very sorry about the sound. I realized listening to it, not only was that I sound like I had a kind of box of Kleenex stuffed in my mouth, but the, um, I noticed that it skipped a couple of bits. So, I mean, it, 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 it was, I'm, I'm very grateful to be asked. I'm sorry it wasn't more lucid, but it probably it wasn't much more lucid, even if you got every word. <laughs> <coughs> Franka, do you have any? Uh... Oh, no, don't. Yeah, okay. please. Yeah, you, you, you know that I can't help it, right? So here I am. <laughs> looking at David at one side and Alberto is at my other <laughs> triangle at this point here. So I, I just wanted to uh, maybe just offer a few thoughts, um, you know, relative to the problematic of um, why using, uh, you know, the coincidence of opposites. Um, I actually f find it as a really sort of productive space um, to consider possible solutions. They're not obvious solutions. They're not determinant solutions. Uh, they're certainly not objective solutions. They are precisely, as you said, Alberto, a kind of solution that sits in a space that is uh, almost impossible to define because they're sitting somewhere below the head. You know, our colleague Marco would have said that it's a little bit lower than the heart. It's in your gut. Mm. And I actually... Um, not that I disagree with you, but I think it's really between that movement of the heart and the gut, uh, hopefully not too further down, uh, the heart and the gut that, that I think maybe some solutions can be found. Um, but also it's, it's, I, I think it's, uh, uh, I think in honoring the notion of theory as a space, as a space of movement and a place where one can occupy um, intended solutions as opposed to objective solutions is what I think I wanted to offer um, to David. 
uh, contrary to the day job where you know, the, the world still requires a sense of confidence and objective solutions. Uh, I, I think uh, valorizing the fact that uh, in many instances, um, simply residing uh, with these uh, more latent possibilities, this is precisely, I think, where the heart and the gut exist. So I would agree completely. Um, but there is the hard work of having to offer solutions. And that's, 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 that's the abyss that, you know, we just need to jump into every once in a while, even if it's filled with problems and alligators and stuff. But I, I appreciate very much that, yeah. So I'd like just to make one... two comments. <clears throat> one comment, one on your comment. Okay. Okay, yeah, Peter wanted to say something too, but- uh... Okay. Oh, just, okay. Just two seconds to what um, <clears throat> Franco was saying and what David um, was saying yesterday about <clears throat> the business of architectural writing when I was in universities, when, as far as I can tell, everybody went to all the other disciplines in the university for insight. And the one thing that still seems to be the case is the other universe, the other disciplines don't come to us. Yeah. Yeah. Follow that one. Yes, I miss it. Is that? Oh, you're going to say now. And do you have any comments to um, Alberto's? Were you, were you here when Alberto discussed your work? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Well, do you have any, any thoughts or comments? Um, where, where to begin? Um, <laughs> let me think. Um, I think you're both right and wrong when you talk about that the, the, the tectonic somehow is, I may, I, may, I, may, I may have understood you, but, but that it, it may be a more narrow, uh, understanding of architecture or part of architecture. I think, I think maybe that, or at least to me, uh, uh, the, the tectonic is some, I mean, that's somehow what architecture is, is made of. Uh, this is sort of the, um, the, um, the inner core of its, of its um, presence in the world. In case we didn't have the tectonic, we didn't have the, the true building, I mean, the very building, the physical object, um, it would be something else. So this is um, this is to me very, very important that we can discuss it this way, and we can bring we can bring forth theories and ideas that can bring us further, that can at least get us more enlightened about what we're doing right now and where we are going. So in that sense, I find the tectonic um, inevitable in, in, in every way. I would agree, absolutely. And um, Angelo Butti, the um, young Brazilian architect whose work in Lugano I showed, uh, was um, in an interview uh, in a show, in a show, no, in an event, um, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and uh, was presenting his works and, uh, and um, the interviewer asked, why is it that insistence that you Brazilians have on a structure? Because that's what lasts. And I think that, uh, that uh, another theme that is adjacent to what we've been hearing here, and which is very present in, 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 in David's work, is actually that there is a time for different things in the building. And the things that last more really have not, well, uh, not to say that they have greater value, but actually without being very essential, just, as you say. Does anyone have any other comments or questions? To look out to look out to the access. Well, um, let's, let's hear David. What? David. Let's hear David. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yes. So if it's okay, we're actually right on time. So that's a miracle. Uh, we were going to take a short break before we return to hear from David. Wait, 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 um, wait, wait.
Um, I just want to um, identify that we'll return here at 5 p.m. Okay. Um, and please um, do not travel too, too far. But I do also want to note that as I was sitting here, I was getting uh, tornado warnings for this area. So I just want you to know that. I know this is a really weird thing to say, but I do need to say it for safety, okay, that there are tornadoes in the areas, number one. What? Uh, no, there is a reception here um, after uh, David's talk um, at 6 p.m. and the building will not be locked tonight. So before I say that, I wanna say thank you to all of our members of this particular panel, including Peter Carl from afar, Alberto Perez Gomez from afar, and Marcia for having really sort of stepped in and uh, volunteered to do our um, session this afternoon. And thank you to um, Carlos and Anne.
introduce uh, David. I'm not going to introduce, I'm going to welcome David uh, to the podium because uh, apart from the fact that um, in uh, company of so many um, intellectual family members, it's um, no need for introductions except to maybe return to the fact that year after year, moment after moment, period after period, we get reintroduced um, to David's work and to David's thinking. And I think we have many, 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 many years of new introductions with new projects for sure. I just wanted to also, um, in concluding again, thank so many people for all the efforts that went into um, joining us, contacting us, sending us notes for David, which I will forward on as well. Um, helping with the organization, helping create the kind of spirit of community that is needed in these, um, uh, in these circumstances and in order to uh, create a, a place where people can feel really comfortable um, in sharing their ideas, particularly when their ideas are uh, very meaningful to them and their work is meaningful to them. So again, I wanna thank everyone who came, the presenters, the moderators, some folks who've come from afar, even in incredibly busy times. Grace, thank you so much. Um, and, uh, you know, Carlos having traveled quite far to come and be with us. So thank you so much. Um, and we hope that um, um, the spirit of uh, sharing and the spirit of, of uh, deep thinking and reflection that was offered by our presenters yesterday and today uh, can contribute the, the great work that can continue the great work that David has done. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome David to the podium. Please join me in thanking Franca Truviano for spectacular work. And I'll repeat the thanks that uh, she has just um, given to auditors, uh, visitors, presenters, and, and friends who, who've come. It's, um, I'm sure you can imagine uh, marvelous uh, for a person to um, benefit um, from such friendship and association. And uh, what I've seen in the past two days, the black and white of, of the books and lectures and writings and conversations now rendered in full color um, through the work of so many wonderful people. It's um, the role of teacher and student is, is reversed. Um, and I'm very grateful. Yesterday, um, Grace Law likened uh, the first days of emeritus status as equivalent to um, a graduating student's commencement. Perhaps you were as um, moved by Amanda Gorman's inaugural reading uh, um, when Biden was elected president. So I thought that um, with Grace's prompt, I would have an epigraph for today's uh, brief comments from a poet um, whose recent book I read in one sitting. And then the next day I read it again. <laughs> and I thought maybe a, a simple quotation uh, would be apposite um, in this instance. Uh, in ancient Rome, augurs were official diviners, their darting eyes interpreted, interpreting omens and the inked stain of birds across the sky. Uh, the breakage is where we begin. That um, inked stain, uh, I don't have a better definition of, of topography than she offered, and perhaps I'll try to elaborate um, in this talk. So much has been said uh, about my work, uh, I'm reluctant to say anything more. Um, yet when asked, I agreed to talk uh, and thought maybe uh, what would be at least of some interest would uh, be a brief account of what I take to be my future preoccupations, if you will, a prospectus of future work. Uh, an alternative title would be an invitation to future collaborations to each of you. Uh, to do so, though, um, I think I'll need to recall a few premises and projects that I haven't been able to clear from my desk. 
And uh, please forgive me if the wind up takes a little bit longer than the pitch. Just as the perceiving mind is an embodied mind, a sensible building is a situated building. This is true even when the work initially seems, indeed may have been designed to be discordant in the context at the moment of its completion. Much of my research and writing has endeavored to affirm the worldly character of an architectural work. This effort has meant doing battle with two rather formidable adversaries whose dislike of one another is much greater than mine of either of them. First, there's the idea of the built work as the realization of an architect's idea. By idea, I mean the sort of conception that poses the principles of configuration, those that guide construction, govern expression, and presume significance. On the other side is the notion of a work as the result of contextual forces, those that transcend the architect's proper remit. Works thus understood show the ways they've incorporated extra architectural pressures. Perhaps also some suffering is involved. It seems to me these philosophies tend to overlook a rather obvious fact that works only come to life when inserted in the world, which is in turn decisively altered by those very insertions, making it partly their outcome, though it never relinquishes their claims, its claims. When in three earlier books, On Common Ground, Topographical Stories, and Architecture Oriented Otherwise, I tried to develop language and concepts that would be adequate to the relationship between works and worlds. It became clear to me that they are not those of compromise, nor of that deliberating form of truce that seeks to settle accounts by restricting engagement. A designer's authority over the completion of the work or the builder's over its realization does not prevent advantage from being taken uh, from their milieu. More specifically, it seems to me that there's no embarrassment in admitting that buildings are intrinsically rather poor. Not one of them can supply the fresh air or daylight it needs. All must breathe, no less than human or animal bodies. And when they show that they do, to others who are similarly dependent, their respiratory elements and surfaces approximate the expressivity of the human face. Less on the physical than on the social side, what would a museum or a school building be without the visitors or students from city and neighborhood animating its spaces and elements? All of this is to say, Architecture's independence is perforce interdependent. Of course, this conclusion substantially affects one's understanding of the architect's work. Though their bearing on the topic wasn't clear to me when they were written, on weathering and surface architecture, co authored with Mustafavi, Mustafavi, examined topics that limit the ambitions of design. In the first case, the natural world, particularly its temporality, I mean the fact of weathering, challenges ideas of permanence. And in the second, uh, the world of industrialization, as it's transformed building practice from the fabrication of uniquely specified parts into the assembly of factory-made components. Retrospectively, I can see an interest in design's limits was implicit in a still earlier study, uh, Roots of Architectural Invention. Due to the approach I took then, set out in the book's opening pages under the heading, Topical Thinking, 
The concern was with design themes that have persisted through centuries, but at the time and still today, I, I felt needed rethinking. Here's the conclusion. Relevance of any topic requires redefinition. Another methodological question raised by these studies concerns the movement between images expressed by the building and interpreted by you or me and the architectural ideas we might discuss, write, or read about. My working assumption has been that the mutuality between the two images and ideas may in fact be asymmetrical in architecture. That a close reading of a building's silent and nonverbal self-presentation can best serve interpretations of the thought to which it gives rise. I realize this working method, spending a little bit more time on the street than in the library, is subtended by a demanding philosophical problem. In short, how words relate to images. Not only images that the work itself presents, but those that represent it, drawings, photographs, paintings, and so on. On most accounts, the outcome of close reading is the disclosure of content that had been overlooked through haste or inattention. The problem with that understanding is that it neglects the fact that something in the work initially sparked one's interest, some form, shadow, or setting, invited a second look and prompted an unexpected thought. Wanting to take note of architecture's, let's say, secret pull or silent voicing, I've continued to ask how unhurried readings of what presents itself as itself might restore connections between a facade street or detail and the questions, desires, and risk that not only motivated their design and construction, but still puzzle you and me. Again, the basic thought here is that a way of seeing architecture is inseparable from a way of thinking about it. This isn't a new notion. Two millennia ago, when our tradition's oldest surviving text named, quote, architectural ideas, three types of drawing were listed. Might that be true? That in architecture, ideas cannot be disassociated from images? Reformulating the thesis as a mandate, a rather well-known 20th century architect advised as follows, advice I've taken throughout my work. Try to say precisely what it is that you see and then try even harder to actually see what you see. Of course, one can think about thinking, theorize theories, but that's not what I've done in most of my work, nor what I expect to do in the future. Minds alone do not communicate with one another. One or another form of articulation is required, gestures, sounds, words, text, or most eloquently, works of art. And these can not only be differentiated from one another, but discovered to be more or less adequate to any specific subject of expression. Though far too common today, theorizing theories is, I've come to think, a second order practice in architecture, derivative or contingent on a more basic wonder about things in the world among them rooms, buildings, gardens, and streets. Praising the streets of London after the great fire in 1665, John Evelyn invoked an ancient, I think still, at least for me, a contemporary aim for architecture. Uh, he wrote it in Latin, mox lapidis clamaturos. The stones themselves cry out. One's Amor Mundi 
needn't preclude reflection on the world of the work as a theme in itself. Modern thought in and outside architecture recognizes the fact that more than the planet Earth is implied by this word, though the planet Earth is not exactly a small issue these days. Nor is world in the sense I intend it, the same as the globe of globalization, though the latter could include and be enriched by several worlds, or more commonly today, cause them to atrophy or struggle for continued existence. Physical, geographical, and environmental conditions are certainly at play in the worlds of an architectural work, but no less so are those manifestations of human labor and creativity we typically call culture. And not one, but many cultures, distinct of course, but not for that reason, non-conversant with one another, inherited also, though continually remaking themselves and less the outcome of project making than its proper horizon of reference and of judgment. This sense of the word allows us to say phrases like the world of the Renaissance, uh, of Native Americans, the world of Michelangelo, or in this room, the world of Louis Kahn. One of the challenges I've tried to address concerns the difficulty of accepting the typically tacit presence of what I'll now call a worlded work. We tend to assume prominence for the outcome of creative design. For better or worse, I've returned, to the, returned repeatedly to the figure ground structure when thinking through this dimension of architectural reality, wondering how can a building alternately present itself one way and then the other? Uh, the thing perceived always makes its appearance against a background of some kind of depth. At school, home, or in a restaurant, every table is a table in some room, perhaps one with a window onto a street or a garden which also serves to support it. All three obtaining standing in a building, itself funded by a neighborhood. It then in a town or city, and likewise under the sun, the sun or the clouds and still more. Perceptual focus renders the world in this sense, non-explicit, perhaps even marginal despite the fact that one or another of its elements might at any moment obtrude itself into awareness and become a new topic of concern. I opened my book on architectural orientation with a, I think a basic question about the oscillations between figures and grounds, how single works can reward attention when they receive it, but otherwise, can remain content to play their parts unobtrusively. A problem that still interests me arises when one tries to describe the connections between the prosaic and professional sense of settings. For an architect's understanding of the street requires some distance, a voluntary suspension of any person's unconsidered involvements. Reflective distance, I think, takes the form of disengaged participation, contradictory though that term might seem, before which the configurations that had been taken for granted answer one's questions about the desires and ideas that actually brought them into being. I mean, the same windows and walls that silently accommodated everyday living also give designers something to work with and against, and all of us something to think about. My articles and books have sought to reacquaint us with the world we thought we knew, not only by revealing what had been there all along, but by showing how it was reshaped by means proper to the architectural craft. 
though of course not only that. Recent ecological theory, as discussed particularly in modern anthropology from Julian Stewart in the 50s to Philippe Pescola today, provided me with a useful parallel. If the conditions architecture is to sustain and enrich include not only ma matters of the so-called natural world, but also cultural norms embodied in urban situations, architectural orientation could be seen to parallel the ecological directive to think widely and act locally. My book on orientation did not, however, sufficiently elaborate the structures of the uh, urban and natural worlds to which architecture makes its contributions. I hope building time took steps in this direction, differentiating and exemplifying three dimensions of an architectural works temporal structuring. In another recent book, Three Cultural Ecologies, Richard Wesley and I attempted to think through architecture in a time of ecological crisis, as radical a crisis as ever. I mean, of worlds, the globe and, and its climate. 20 years ago, many architects wondered whether they should or would need to respond to the environmental debate. A choice no longer exists. Today, no one thinks of a building as a self-sustaining outcome of professional design, blissfully free from entanglements with conditions that are neither of its own making nor subject to its control. The combined challenges of urbanization and environmental deterioration are unavoidable dimensions of today's context for truly creative architectural work. One has to admit, as Alberto Perez Gomez just said, they're also the sources of more than a little anxiety, quite apart from one's profound disappointment with the almost complete failure of political leadership in most Western countries. Still more recent and current essays and book projects have retested my long-standing premise about participation, that architects must cultivate an awareness of the wider context of the project in order to take responsibility for the design of one of its single parts. A book drafted under the provisional title of Projecting Urbanity, to which six of my former PhD students have contributed chapters, explains how some of the better examples of modern architecture have transcended their local concerns into the potentials and conflictual conditions of our urban and natural environments. On the assumption that in my earlier books, I've, I've pretty much done what I could with the matter of tacit sense and noiseless expression, I've now turned my attention to what I'll characterize as higher levels of articulation uh, in this study, which is to say how buildings, streets and gardens communicate with one another and with wider conditions and do so over the long duration of the project. Something I tried to elaborate in part three uh, of Building Time, where I discussed this magnificent poly house by Pizzo and von Ulrichhausen from whom we heard yesterday. We tend to think that communication, commonality, and more largely urbanity result from the engagements that follow the construction of well-intentioned solutions that have been fully worked out in their particularity and are thereby sovereign over the parts they organize prior to any voluntary associations. What if instead the real project or the reality of the project is the realization of something singular through its internalization of what is not. A work's singularity would then result from the indetermination 
of a basic idea into the powers and purposes of a place, responding to their conflicts and opportunities, one work among others that have also opened themselves into their milieu, collective memory on the cognitive side, natural light or fresh air on the physical side, which none of them I've said can supply on its own, but all want and will variously internalize and modulate you in your office or apartment, me and mine, together with other things, non-human things, living and dying on the same street, in the same park or, or in the cemetery. Urban sense on this account would arise out of an understanding of shared finality. Similarly, streets would publicize interdependence, not only self-interest and attendant violence. A single work wouldn't be realized as something complete in itself, even though it was conceptualized that way, nor would it be something that would run smoothly on its own like a well-oiled machine. What can be shared among communicative projects may not be a thing at all, rather an element or, or elements of the world, variously rarefied or dense, received or through design projected. A term that I've begun to use to describe such a work is whole part. I have in mind buildings that are designed to be internally coherent, but whose makeup anticipates interaction with the external conditions that never ask for and remain indifferent to the project's interest, despite their roles as its necessary counterparts. In a single admittedly contradictory phrase, the proposition I'll work on in the coming while is this. A well-designed architectural work is a whole that's partial. An important consequence of the part counterpart thesis is that single projects through their elegant disclosures and pathetic sufferings can provide others who expose themselves similarly with a basis for unexpected and unexpectedly relevant urban form. Urbanity, which is not something architects can design, is nevertheless what good architecture projects. I should say that this proposal is accompanied by, by doubt that may well have been its origin. Doubt about the under and overreach of today's designs for and in our cities. In the first instance, projects that submit to the expectations of comprehensive urban systems, such as infrastructure planning, landscape urbanism, and citywide policies on energy use, zoning, historic preservation, and so on. And in the second case, market-driven single ventures, no matter what style star architects promote as the one for today or tomorrow, still less the one that designers seek to sell. No less formative for this thesis is a concern about the spatial, environmental, and social injustices that fragment today's cultures and cities. It seems to me inwardly local interest are often those of discriminatory privilege, of wealth, gender, or of race. Urban order that makes collective sense today is much more of a task than an inheritance. It's for this reason that I accent potentialities. Although architecture plays a key role on the stage of city culture, the city building is just one among other performers. In fact, it's precisely the words, the works singularity that requires 
re-articulation. I'll conclude with one last observation. Once, once a work's elements are quickened by ambient qualities, lateral contributions, and most importantly, latent conditions, it shows itself to be in a uh, whole in another external sense. I'd like to see the work as a, a condensation, or maybe it's better to say an epitome of the entire urban landscape as, it, as its forms cycle through time. Individual urban settings radiate the culture and the environment that both surround and infiltrate them. The difficult point is that the individuality they possess assumes a native but incohate involvement with the world they provisionally renounced and then after construction rendered public. Earlier I used the term intrinsic externality to describe this manner of a work's self-definition. Self I mean to say settings settings are exceeded by what they gather together and render legible. Though we tend to think of them as unified, they are equally unifying. In short, architecture must recognize its world building function. But every work of architecture constructs its location within an antecedent urban topography, as is true for individuals making their way in a town, city, state, or, or country. Nor does this priority obviate the fact that the city is largely composed of buildings, likewise of citizens. Again, the work takes its place in the city while at the same time, buildings, yards, gardens, and streets, especially the nameless spaces between them, are precisely where the life of the city takes place. Actual architecture assumes involvement, just as a person's civility assumes a city, or as is often the case today, the memory of one, a recollection fictional though it may be, that my future work will wager has the capacity to prompt projects that articulate the ways we would all like to live. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Maybe maybe we have a minute if, if there are any comments or questions or corrections. Uh, those of you um, I've had the pleasure of teaching will recall me often saying that you get 10 cents for every question. Please, comments if you will or not. Hi, um, thank you for the, the talk. You're Can welcome. you speak about the images that you showed? What were you trying to show us through the images? Indebtedness to their quality and intelligence. Um, these are people who've made presentations in the conference whose works uh, have inspired my, my own thought. Um, you're right, Ali, uh, it's my tendency to look carefully at things and I didn't this time, but I thought you might find more talk tedious 
so I gave you something to look at um, instead. Um, the first image by O'Donnell and Toomey of the Lyric Theater in Belfast is a particular condition where one has entered the building having left an extremely interesting city behind and the algebraic economy, so many unknowns into one fully resolved equation, the stairway up, the sign identifying the building, a seat where you can rest, a view out the window, another view up the street. Suddenly at this point, there's a condensation of an entire spectrum of possibilities. This is actually what I mean by uh, bringing into coherence, I called it an epitome of the wider horizon, uh, concentrating it into a single work. From that point, not only is one oriented in the town and the building, but knowledgeable about their correspondences. Uh, I, um, when, when Toomey and O'Donnell asked me to write about the building, having taken me through it, but not said much, I always felt that one space was, so to speak, on the verge of another. I'm not sure it made much sense, but I, I described the building as uh, an ensemble of verging spaces. And this um, one space on the verge of another is something that strikes me as um, characteristic of legible landscapes that, may I say, project urbanity without making claims on its full definition. So it's one of a number of, so these are either buildings that I've worked on or the last case, Grafton Architects, before that, the work of Ada Carmi, they're people I'll take up in future. So that's what they were. Um, and I, you know, with more time and um, proper focus and more documents, um, one could go through them carefully and, and, and learn a lot. At least I've thought so. Likewise with Weissman Frady and, and each of the cases I've shown, uh, I've learned from Grace Law and James Dahlman. So these are for me, touching stones for thought. That's all. What else? Please, Hillary. Do I have to do anything? <laughs> you, I mean, I appreciate the question and the focus on architecture, mm. the built artifact. But you did mention earlier images, perhaps drawings in reference to Vitruvius. And one of your first works was a book devoted to drawings. Yeah. So we haven't talked very much about drawings and I'm a little tunnel visioned on that. Can you reflect a little bit about the role of drawing maybe today or what it has been and your thoughts on that now? Well, um, it's a big, 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 big issue. Um, and I just created a little parenthesis in my comments for uh, a double horizon for our interpretive labor. <laughs> The work seems to give itself to interpretation. Works are immediately inhabitable, but there's always a little bit more than making use of a building. And that um, second or third order expressivity is important to recognize. Um, and I don't think it's a supplement to functionality. I, I think it might even be, um, the primary ground for the purposefulness. But I don't think that's categorically distinct from representations of representations, drawings, photographs, and paintings. And sometimes those latter expressions focus content because they clear away some of the uh, kind of natural attitude reasons for the project it serves these purposes and performs the way we expect buildings to. Of course they must, but that figures so largely in our thinking that we sometimes suggest that that's adequate to the architectural task. My thinking is that the indirect approach of the second order representation, which is to say of a representation, if the first can be granted as an articulation of our lives in the body of the building, the second order 
insofar as it puts in abeyance those primary tasks of performing, allows us to see other contents. I don't think they're adequate to the building, but they might be adequate to recovering dimensions of content that what I'm calling the natural attitude about the reasons for a building sometimes and perhaps often conceal. This is a place for the drawing that you trying to learn about the building make use of. The drawing has other purposes, envisaging the project or projecting the projection. And that's another kind of inquiry. But those communications between uh, the page and the person producing the image, those I, for the moment, want to just leave aside because mine is a concern for architecture's role in um, reducing some of the some of the problems in our societies <laughs> and 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 that larger task of buildings to provide a sense of commonality of sharing not exploiting the conditions we've inherited these um, tasks which are high on the agenda today have at least allowed me to provisionally bracket the role of drawing in the um, production of projects. I'm not diminishing it. I'm just in my own current thinking, putting that aside. Um, it's a large issue, as everyone knows, given the proliferation of media. Um, it's just not what I'm working on now. But I think there are people in the room, including you, who can clarify a lot about this. Um, it would be such a pleasure to have the people who have been uh, participating remotely to sit around the table and help us think this through. Um, uh, for example, yesterday, um, John Hunt was here and it must, it must be 30 years now we've been quarreling about this issue. And uh, I, I think I know where Alberto Perez Gomez stands on this problem. He mentioned it earlier, um, which is why I took the risk just as a matter of friendship, intellectual friendship with my statement about um, asymmetry and implying that there may be weight to the linguistically unclaimed expressivity of architecture that there is no name for the content, but that doesn't mean there's an absence of sense. So what is an image? And are images three-dimensional? Of course, dance. Are images acoustic? Without a doubt. Are they architectural? Of course. Now, what do we mean by image in that sense? And not to convert it directly to figuration in the pictorial sense. This is a, a problem that we have bracketed because of the excess of imagery in the last three decades, but we cannot do that in architecture. Things do present themselves to us. And as I've learned from my friend, a very close friend and colleague, Richard Wesley, they present themselves rhetorically and are meant to be read. Architecture is legible. And I agree with what Franca said about one's intelligent understanding in, in, in one's gut or in, in one's heart. But I also think buildings give us something to think about. And this higher level of articulation, which I'm calling higher, this different level of articulation um, also needs to be brought into the discussion about images so that it isn't a polarization of what can be verbalized and not but rather how they can be rejoined. So the difference and interdependence of word and image, which is a huge problem. There are several journals with that title, libraries, shelves. Um, I can't handle it 
in uh, in the reply to a, 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 a wonderful question, but it is something I want to take up because I spent a long time delaying that role for architecture because it was over-determining other considerations. And once you got the meaning, everything else that was constitutive of it had been cast in shadow. So I've ruminated around the shadows for a while. And now I'd like to let, as I said, quoting John Evelyn, the stones themselves cry out. Um, this articulation of the work in the world, providing those of us in and among buildings, uh, not only a sense of where we are, but maybe even a thought about it. Uh, I believe that's within architecture's proper remit. Even if we don't have a language today to discuss it without defaulting into articulations from other fields. So this is a task I see requiring a little bit of homework, some careful study and, and attempts at uh, giving ourselves, at least myself, concepts and language uh, for um, reclaiming uh, a domain of, of sense that has been either overdone or overlooked. Does that help at all? What else? Please, Katie. Thank you, David. I'm going to ask a, a, light, a lightweight question. <clears throat> so I don't better worry. get ready. Um, I commented on your, your permanence. Um, and I also told you as an aside about my sort of rising panic about your leaving that the retaining wall that has built and protected the PhD program, it's very, I'm getting teary, which I didn't want to do. It is difficult, uh, but congratulations, <laughs> it's a well-deserved freedom. Um, if this is your uh, redefinition or your commencement or whatever, and, and this is a new thing, here you go. Uh, we know that you will continue to work. It's generous that you've shared the direction of your work. But is there anything, this is the light part, is there anything in this wonderful, well-deserved liberation um, that will allow you, you know, is there a particular uh, place, a thing to do, a building, a street? You, you obviously travel the world continually. But with the additional freedom and time, is there something that will be the gift to yourself that opens a sort of something yeah. entirely new that we may, you may not even want to share with us. Maybe you won't even write well, about Well, I'll tell you it. something I have on my mind, a little bit of a hunch. But, uh, over the years, I've, I don't know if it's laziness or a specific argument, but I've been using fewer and fewer footnotes um, and also um, fewer and fewer famous buildings. I'm interested in the um, spectrum. Uh, so those parts of cities that um, one wouldn't have seen before and could spend time thinking through, uh, those places um, that um, are taken for granted, but when reconsidered, contain within them uh, a depth of content that attests to sophistications of, of culture. I wanna risk reading architecture that I can't read about and put it into dialogue with exemplary works. In other words, it's not a turn toward the vernacular, but rather a broadening of our horizon so that um, Grafton architects are there or Atakarmi, but not only that. And so spending time um, to absorb what doesn't immediately present itself as a work, but has been worked by people who are no less intelligent than those with college degrees, that sense of um, civic articulation interests me right now. And I believe it requires a pace um, and uh, uh, openness that 
maybe previous obligations uh, prevented. So I, I, I'm imagining a slightly different horizon of interest that won't exclude uh, those things from which I've learned and similar uh, great, great architecture, but, but uh, a different set of objects as well. And that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. It's not a particular place, but maybe a place that has no name is, is what I'm interested in as well. Congratulations <laughs> <Thank> again. <laughs> please, please, Halle. To um, piggyback on Katie's question um, about the future, I believe you concluded your talk with saying uh, that you inspire, you're looking forward to your future work to inspire places that all of us would like to inhabit. Yeah. Um, don't you think you already achieved that? I don't know. It's, a, you know, it, Holly, it's also, please let's recognize it's an outrageous thing to say because um, in these days we are so dedicated, so dedicated to difference. I have my world, you yours. How could someone stand in front of a group of people and say, we? Can we say that today? Can architects not say that? So for me, this is actually the problem. Under what conditions does singularity exist such that it obtains its um, animating core from what is shared or non-singular? But this one has to recognize is the problem. We have renounced, we, we no longer see the possibility for commonality. Someone said to me, David, you know, Moisten yesterday, David, why don't you start the book with the public realm? That's the problem. You can't take it for granted. So to reconstruct the possibilities under which we could possibly say an architecture for a constituency, not a, only a, a corporate client, that, that requires quite a bit of thought and honest, there's, there's a kind of realism to my doubt about we, the, the, the places that we would like. To, I can't make that assumption today. And yet it is architecture's task to be a public art. And this is a problem we cannot avoid. We have to face this and, and, it, and and you know, I was talking with my son Ethan that there is a horizon. It's what Anna Bayem explained so beautifully that you know, at a certain point, we all know that this is a world that we're making a mess of. So Werner Marx, he has this book, "Is There a Measure on Earth?" And he said, "The measure is human finitude. We better wake up." So this measure about finitude is on my mind right now. At what point? Have we reached a limit beyond which uh, one is wondering about tomorrow? So I, I don't want to be at all apocalyptic, but I don't want to be naive in making assertions about common sense. I think we have uncommon ground. I think we have as much nonsense as sense. But maybe that's architecture's opening. Maybe that's where architecture belongs in the crisis of sense, not in the affirmation of what has been taken for granted for so long. And the reconceptualization of the possibility for a street, what I called interdependent independence. That, that's what I would like to return to as, as a set of questions. Thank you. Please, Karen, don't ask me about the future. Joseph already answered it, it's what we make it. Brilliant. We're all, we're all his students. So I, I want to speak of the humanity that your work brings into focus, which I think you're also alluding to in some of your responses to the questions that we have, because we are, of course, all struggling. And my only thought is that when you photograph a step, put a foot on it or a handrail, put the hand on it, that these are the ways that people can 
um, project themselves into the spaces that we make. And to understand that humanity has to become as experiential as we search for mm -hmm. in, in the um, various things that we read, we talk about, we struggle with, we think about, but that humanity is, is, is as simple as that foot on the step. And to not have the foot in the step means the photograph is um, absent that engagement. Yeah. So we always do this. And, um, and it may change grandpapa because it's a whole new world. And uh, we can see um, maybe if we photograph things in a certain way, then we might see them in a certain way. Mm. Yeah, that, that I, I hold to firmly. Uh, though, um, again, Karen, I think our tendency today is, um, and it's probably good in some ways, to, to uh, emphasize difference. Ours is a time like none other. Well, not completely, not completely. We can, we can still read old books and look at old paintings and enjoy old parts of Philadelphia. And one doesn't have to uh, have faith in a reactualization of an original intention to make sense of something. So the continuity of sense through times that seem so unpropitious is I, I think an important dimension to um, architectural thought and um, at least it is to my, to my own work. Um, and then secondly, what I tried to explain yesterday in a brief comment about, um, or was it this morning, <laughs> about emptiness. I like architecture that's adequately provisioned, that it, architecture is waiting to be actualized by things the architect didn't specify. And this, um, this Karen, delays claims on experience. I, I, I don't know how to phrase this precisely, but for me at the moment, experience is not the problem. The problem is the conditions under which um, experience can unfold and not that of you or me, but some sense that it, an anonymous you, uh, a, a, an X. And this um, potential citizen who has no citizenship, um, that I believe is our task. So for me presently, the measure of a work's success is not its adequacy to individual experience. I want to bracket that for the moment. It's not that I, I want to deny it, it's required of our work, but I want to put that aside and take the person for the moment out of the project and deal with um, a possible person. And you might say, what are you talking about? Uh, it's just that there's a, a, a domestication of um, our lawless urbanity implied in conversations about experience that I think uh, is presently wrong-headed. And uh, I'm interested in the anonymity of places, the typicality of situations, the generality, if you will, of, of an architectural intuition that um, allows for, but doesn't make claims on experience. Uh, it, it would take me a little bit more care and time to formulate this with greater precision. But um, the hand on the handrail logic of architectural thought is not something I, I'm against. I just feel it's too quick a solution in times like these, when there are uh, other problems than how it resonates, the building resonates with, with my, uh, I'll stop there because I, 
I, I, I would like to have a couple examples to, to be precise on this point, but I don't want the individual perception to be the measure of, of a work. I, I, I want to, I'm interested in something that suggests a possible shared and at least potentially collective sense that I think is our task today. We've got really good private space, if I can put it that way. Yes. I feel so the same is true for the person answering these questions. <laughs> Finalmente. Thank you so much, everyone. Let us So I am going to invite you all to have a little reception to tell you by video meetings so that maybe all your personal views can be Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, David, and many, many years.